Dedication of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Dedication. To Henry Fielding, Esquire. Sir, my design being to speak a word or two in behalf of novel writing, I know not to whom I can address myself with so much propriety as to yourself, who unquestionably stand foremost in this species of composition. To convey instruction in a pleasant manner, and mix entertainment with it, is certainly a commendable undertaking, perhaps more likely to be attended with success than graver precepts, and even where amusement is the chief thing consulted, there is some little merit in making people laugh, when it is done without giving offence to religion, or virtue, or good manners. If the laugh be not raised at the expense of innocence or decency, good humour bids us indulge it, and we cannot well laugh too often. Can one help wondering, therefore, at the contempt with which many people affect to talk of this sort of composition? They seem to think it degrades the dignity of their undertakings, to be found with a novel in their hands, and take great pains to let you know that they never read them. They are people of too great importance, it seems, to misspend their time in so idle a manner, and much too wise to be amused. Now, though many reasons may be given for this ridiculous and affected disdain, I believe a very principal one is the pride and pedantry of learned men, who are willing to monopolize reading to themselves, and therefore fastidiously decry all books that are on a level with common understandings as empty, trifling, and impertinent. Thus the grave metaphysician, for example, who after working night and day, perhaps for several years, sends forth at last a profound treatise, where A and B seem to contain some very deep mysterious meaning, grows indignant to think that every little paltry scribbler, who paints only by the characters of the age, the manners of the times, and the working of the passions, should presume to equal him in glory. The politician, too, who shakes his head in coffee-houses, and produces now and then, from his fund of observations, a grave, sober political pamphlet on the good of the nation, looks down with contempt on all such idle compositions, as lives and romances, which contain no strokes of satire at the ministry, no unmannerly reflections upon Hanover, nor anything concerning the balance of power on the continent. These gentlemen and their readers join all to a man in depreciating works of humor, or if they ever vouchsafe to speak in their praise, the commendation never rises higher than, Yes, tis well enough for such a sort of a thing, after which the grave observer retires to his newspaper, and there, according to the general estimation, employs his time to the best advantage. But besides these, there is another set who never read any modern books at all. They, wise men, are so deep in the learned languages that they can pay no regard to what has been published within these last thousand years. The world is grown old. Men's geniuses are degenerated. The writers of this age are too contemptible for their notice and they have no hopes of any better to succeed them. Yet these gentlemen of profound erudition will contentedly read any trash that is disguised in a learned language, and the worst ribaldry of Aristophanes shall be critiqued and commented on by men who turn up their noses at Gulliver or Joseph Andrews. But if this contempt for books of amusement be carried a little too far, as I suspect it is, even among men of science and learning, what shall be said to some of the greatest triflers of the times who affect to talk the same language? These surely have no right to express any disdain of what is at least equal to their understandings. Scholars and men of learning have a reason to give. Their application to severe studies may have destroyed their relish for works of a lighter cast, and consequently it cannot be expected that they should approve what they do not understand. But as for bows, rakes, petite maitiers, and fine ladies, whose lives are spent in doing the things which novels record, I do not see why they should be indulged in affecting a contempt of them. 
people whose most earnest business is to dress and play at cards are not so importantly employed but that they may find leisure now and then to read a novel. Yet these are as forward as any to despise them. And I once overheard a very fine lady condemning some highly finished conversations in one of your works, sir, for this curious reason. Because, said she, "'Tis such sort of stuff as passes every day between me and my own maid. I do not pretend to apply anything here said in behalf of books of amusement to the following little work, of which I ask your patronage. I am sensible how very imperfect it is in all its parts, and how unworthy to be ranked in that class of writings which I am now defending. But I desire to be understood in general, or more particularly with an eye to your works, which I take to be masterpieces and complete models in their kind. They are, I think, worthy the attention of the greatest and wisest men, and if anybody is ashamed of reading them, or can read them without entertainment and instruction, I heartily pity their understandings. The late editor of Mr. Pope's works, in a very ingenious note, wherein he traces the progress of romance writing, justly observes that this species of composition is now brought to maturity by Mr. de Marivaux in France and Mr. Fielding in England. I have but one objection to make to this remark, which is that the name of Mr. de Marivaux stands foremost of the two, a superiority I can by no means allow him. Mr. Marivaux is indeed a very amiable, elegant, witty, and penetrating writer. The reflections he scatters up and down his Marianne are highly judicious, recherche, and infinitely agreeable. But not to mention that he never finishes his works, which greatly disappoints his readers, I think his characters fall infinitely short of those we find in the performances of his English contemporary. They are neither so original, so ludicrous, so well distinguished, nor so happily contrasted as your own. And as the characters of a novel principally determine its merit, I must be allowed to esteem my countryman the greater author. There is another celebrated novel writer of the same kingdom, now living, who in the choice and diversity of his characters perhaps exceeds his rival Mr. Marivaux, and would deserve greater commendation if the extreme libertinism of his plans and too wanton drawings of nature did not take off from the other merit of his works, though at the same time it must be confessed that his genius and knowledge of mankind are very extensive. But with all due respect for the parts of these two able Frenchmen, I will venture to say that they have their superior, and whoever has read the works of Mr. Fielding cannot be at a loss to determine who that superior is. Few books of this kind have ever been written with a spirit equal to Joseph Andrews, and no story that I know of was ever invented with more happiness or conducted with more art and management than that of Tom Jones. As to the following little piece, sir, it pretends to a very small degree of merit. Tis the first essay of a young author, and perhaps may be the last. A very hasty and unfinished edition of it was published last winter, which meeting with a more favorable reception than its writer had any reason to expect, he has since been tempted to revise and improve it, in hopes of rendering it a little more worthy of his reader's regard. With these alterations, he now begs leave, sir, to desire your acceptance of it. He can hardly hope for your approbation, but whatever be its fate, he is proud in this public manner to declare himself your constant reader and sincere admirer. End of Dedication Book One, Chapter One of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter One. A Panegyric Upon Dogs, Together with Some Observations on Modern Novels and Romances. Various and wonderful, in all ages, have been the actions of dogs and were I to collect, from poets and historians, the many passages that make honorable mention of them, I should compose a work much too large and voluminous 
for the patience of any modern reader. But as the politicians of the age and men of gravity may be apt to censure me for misspending my time in writing the adventures of a lapdog, when there are so many modern heroes whose illustrious actions call loudly for the pen of an historian, it will not be amiss to detain the reader in the entrance of this work with a short panegyric on the canine race to justify my undertaking. And can we, without the basis in gratitude, think ill of an animal that has ever honored mankind with his company and friendship from the beginning of the world to the present moment? While all other creatures are in a state of enmity with us, some flying into woods and wildernesses to escape our tyranny, and others requiring to be restrained with bridles and fences in close confinement, dogs alone enter into voluntary friendship with us, and of their own accord make their residence among us. Nor do they trouble us only with officious fidelity and useless good will, but take care to earn their livelihood by many meritorious services. They guard our houses, supply our tables with provision, amuse our leisure hours, and discover plots to the government. Nay, I have heard of a dog's making a syllogism, which cannot fail to endear him to our two famous universities, where his brother logicians are so honored and distinguished for their skill in that useful science. After these extraordinary instances of sagacity and merit, it may be thought too ludicrous, perhaps, to mention the capacity they have often discovered for playing at cards, fiddling, dancing, and other polite accomplishments. Yet I cannot help relating a little story which formerly happened at the playhouse in Lincoln's Inn Fields. There was, at that time, the same emulation between the two houses as there is at present between the two great republics of Drury Lane and Covent Garden, each of them striving to amuse the town with various feats of activity when they began to grow tired of sense, wit, and action. At length, the managers of the house of Lincoln's Inn Fields, possessed with a happy turn of thought, introduced a dance of dogs, who were dressed in French characters to make the representation more ridiculous, and acquitted themselves for several evenings to the universal delight and improvement of the town. But one unfortunate night, a malicious wag behind the scenes threw down among them the leg of a fowl, which he had brought thither in his pocket for that purpose. Instantly all was in confusion. The Marquis shook off his peruke, Mademoiselle dropped her hoop petticoat, the fiddler threw away his violin, and all fell to scrambling for the prize that was thrown among them. But let us return to graver matter. If we look back into ancient history, we shall find the wisest and most celebrated nations of antiquity, as it were, contending with one another, which should pay the greatest honor to dogs. The old astronomers denominated stars after their name, and the Egyptians in particular, a sapient and venerable people, worshipped a dog among the principal of their divinities. The poets represent Diana as spending great part of her life among a pack of hounds, which I mention for the honor of the country gentlemen of Great Britain. And we know that the illustrious Theseus dedicated much of his time to the same companions. Julius Pollux informs us that the art of dyeing purple and scarlet cloth was first found out by Hercules's dog, who, roving along the sea-coast, and accidentally eating of the fish murex or purpura, his lips became tinged with that color, from whence the hint was first taken of the purple manufacture, and to this lucky event our fine gentlemen of the army are indebted for the scarlet, with which they subdue the hearts of so many fair ladies. But nothing can give us a more exalted idea of these illustrious animals than to consider that formerly in old Greece they founded a sect of philosophy, the members whereof took the name of cynics, and were gloriously ambitious of assimilating themselves to the manners and behavior of that animal from which they derived their title. And that the ladies of Greece had as great a fondness for them as the fair ones of our own isle may be collected from the story which Lucian relates of a certain philosopher, who, in the excess of his complaisance to a woman of fashion, took up her favorite lapdog one day, attempting to caress and kiss it. But the little creature, not being used to the rude grip of philosophic hands, found his loins affected in such a manner 
that he was obliged to water the sage's beard, as he held him to his mouth, which so discomposed that principal, if not only seed of his wisdom, as excited laughter in all the beholders. Such was the reverence paid to them among the nations of antiquity, and if we descend to later times, neither there shall we want examples of great men's devoting themselves to dogs. King Charles the Second of pious and immortal memory, came always to his council board accompanied with a favorite spaniel, who propagated his breed and scattered his image through the land almost as extensively as his royal master. His successor, King James, of pious and immortal memory likewise, was distinguished for the same attachment to these four-footed worthies, and tis reported of him that being once in a dangerous storm at sea and obliged to quit the ship for his life, he roared aloud with a most vehement voice, as his principal concern, to save the dogs and Colonel Churchill. But why need we multiply examples? The greatest heroes and beauties have not been ashamed to erect monuments to them in their gardens, nor the greatest wits and poets to write their epitaphs. Bishops have entrusted them with their secrets, and prime ministers deigned to receive information from them, when conspiracies were hatching against the government. Islands, likewise, as well as stars, have been called after their names, so that I hope no one will dare to think me idly employed in composing the following work, or if any such critic should be found, let him own himself ignorant of ancient and modern history, let him confess himself an enemy to his country, and ungrateful to the benefactors of Great Britain. And as no exception can reasonably be taken against the dignity of my hero, much less can I expect any will arise against the nature of this work, in this life-writing age especially, when no character is thought too inconsiderable to engage the public notice, or too abandoned to be set up as a pattern of imitation. The lowest and most contemptible vagrants, parish girls, chambermaids, pickpockets, and highwaymen, find historians to record their praises, and readers to wonder at their exploits. Stargazers, superannuated strumpets, quarreling lovers, all think themselves authorized to appeal to the public, and to write apologies for their lives. Even the prisons and stews are ransacked to find materials for novels and romances. Thus we have seen the memoirs of a lady of pleasure, and the memoirs of a lady of quality, both written with the same public-spirited aim of initiating the unexperienced part of the female sex into the hidden mysteries of love, only that the former work was rather a greater air of chastity, if possible, than the latter. And I am told that illustrious mimic Mr. F-T, when all other expedients fail him, designs, as the last effort of his wit, to oblige the world with an accurate history of his own life, and which view one may suppose he takes care to checker it with so many extraordinary occurrences, and select such adventures as will best serve hereafter to amaze and astonish his readers. This, then, being the case, I hope the very superiority of the character here treated of, above the heroes of common romances, will procure it a favorable reception, although perhaps I may fall short of my great contemporaries in the elegance of style and graces of language. For when such multitudes of lives are daily offered to the public, written by the saddest dogs, or of the saddest dogs of the times, it may be considered as some little merit to have chosen a subject worthy the dignity of history, in which single view I may be allowed to paragon myself with the incomparable writer of the life of Cicero, in that I have deserted the beaten track of biographers, and ventured to snatch a laurel, unde prius nulli velerunt tempora musso. Having detained the reader with this little necessary introduction, I now proceed to open the birth and parentage of my hero. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Two. 
The Birth, Parentage, Education, and Travels of a Lapdog. Pompey, the son of Julio and Phyllis, was born A.D. 1735 at Bologna in Italy, a place famous for lapdogs and sausages. Both his parents were of the most illustrious families, descended from a long train of ancestors who had figured in many parts of Europe and lived in intimacy with the greatest men of the times. They had frequented the chambers of the proudest beauties and had access to the closets of the greatest princes. Cardinals, kings, popes, emperors were all happy in their acquaintance, and I am told the elder branch of the family now lives with his present holiness in the papal palace at Rome. But Giulio, the father of my hero, being a younger brother of a numerous family, fell into the share of an Italian nobleman at Bologna, who was about this time engaged in an intrigue with a celebrated courtesan of the place and little Giulio often attending him when he made his visits to her, as it is the nature of all servants to imitate the vices of their masters, he also commenced an affair of gallantry with a favorite little bitch named Phyllis, at that time the darling of this fille de joie. For a long while she rejected his courtship with disdain, and received him with that coyness which beauties of her sex know very well how to counterfeit but at length in a little closet devoted to Venus, the happy lover accomplished his desires, and Phyllis soon gave signs of pregnancy. I have not been able to learn whether my hero was introduced into the world with any prodigies preceding his birth, and though the practice of most historians might authorize me to invent them, I think it most ingenuous to confess, as well as most probable to conclude, that nature did not put herself to any miraculous expense on this occasion. Miracles are unquestionably ceased in this country, whatever they might be in some former ones. There needs no Dr. Middleton to convince us of this, and I scarce think Dr. Chapman himself would have the hardiness to support me if I should venture to relate one in the present age. Be it sufficient, then, to say that on the 25th of May, N.S. 1735, Pompey made his first appearance in the world at Bologna, on which day, as far as I can learn, the sun shone just as usual, and nature wore exactly the same aspect as upon any other day of the year. About this time an English gentleman, who was making the tour of Europe to enrich himself in foreign manners and foreign clothes, happened to be residing at Bologna and as one great end of modern travelling is the pleasure of intriguing with women of all nations and languages, he was introduced to visit the lady above mentioned, who was at that time the fashionable and foremost courtesan of the place. Little Pompey, having now opened his eyes and learnt the use of his legs, was admitted to frolic about the room, as his mistress sat at her toilet or presided at her tea-table. On these occasions her gallants never failed to play with him, and many pretty dialogues often arose concerning him, which perhaps might make a figure in a modern comedy. Every one had something to say to the little favorite, who seemed proud to be taken notice of, and by many significant gestures would often make believe he understood the compliments that were paid to him. But nobody distinguished himself more on this subject than our English Hilario, who had now made a considerable progress in the affections of his mistress for partly the recommendation of his person, but chiefly the profusion of his expenses, made her think him a very desirable lover, and as she saw that his ruling passion was vanity, she was too good a dissembler, and too much a mistress of her trade, not to flatter this weakness for her own ends. This so elated the spirits of Hilario, that he surveyed himself every day with increase of pleasure at his glass, and took a pride on all occasions to show how much he was distinguished, as he thought, above any of her ancient admirers. Resolving, therefore, to outdo them all as much in magnificence, as he imagined he did in the success of his love, he was continually making her the most costly presents, and, among other things, presented Master Pompey with a collar studded with diamonds. This so tickled the little animal's vanity, being the first ornament he had ever worn, that he would eat biscuit from Hilario's hands with twice the pleasure with which he received it from any other persons, 
while hilario made him the occasion of conveying indirect compliments to his mistress sometimes he would swear he believed it was in her power to impart beauty to her very dogs and when she smiled at the staleness of the conceit he imagining her charmed with his wit would grow transported with gaiety and practice all the fashionable airs that custom prescribes to an intrigue but the time came at length that this gay gentleman was to quit the scene of his pleasures and go in quest of adventures in some other part of italy nothing delayed him but the fear of breaking his mistress's heart which his own great love of himself joined with the seeming love she expressed for him made him think a very likely consequence the point therefore was to reveal his intentions to her in the most tender manner and reconcile her to this terrible event as well as he could they had been dining together one day in her apartments and hilario after dinner first inspiriting himself with a glass of toque began to curse his stars for obliging him to leave bologna where he had been so divinely happy but he said he had received news of his father's death and was obliged to go settle cursed accounts with his mother and sisters who were in a hurry for their confounded fortunes and after many other flourishes concluded his rhapsody with requesting to take little pompey with him as a memorial of their love the lady received this news with all the artificial astonishment and counterfeited sorrow that ladies of her profession can assume whenever they please in short she played the farce of passions so well that hilario thought her very life depended on his presence she wept entreated threatened swore but all to no purpose at length she was obliged to submit on condition that hilario should give her a gold watch in exchange for her favorite dog which he consented to without any hesitation the day was now fixed for his departure and having ordered his post-chaise to wait at her door he went in the morning to take his last farewell he found her at her tea-table ready to receive him and little pompey sitting innocently on the settee by his mistress's side not once suspecting what was about to happen to him and far from thinking himself on the point of so long a journey for neither dogs nor men can look into futurity or penetrate the designs of fate nay i have been told that he ate his breakfast that morning with more than usual tranquillity and though his mistress continued to caress him and lament his departure he neither understood the meaning of her kisses nor greatly returned her affection at length the accomplished hilario taking out his watch and cursing time for intruding on his pleasures signified he must be gone that moment ravishing therefore an hundred kisses from his mistress and taking up little pompey in his arms he went off humming an italian tune and with an air of affected concern threw himself carelessly into his chaise from whence looking up with a melancholy shrug to her window and showing the little favourite to his forsaken mistress he was interrupted by the voice of the postillion desiring to be informed of the route he was to take which little particular this well-bred gentleman had in his hurry forgot as thinking it perhaps of no great consequence but now cursing the fellow for not knowing his mind without putting him to the trouble of explaining it damn you cries he drive to the devil if you will for i shall never be happy again as long as i breathe recollecting himself however upon second thoughts and thinking it as well to defer that journey to some future opportunity he gave his orders for blank and then looking up again at the window and bowing the post-chaise hurried away while his charmer stood laughing and mimicking his gestures as her affection for him was wholly built on interest of course it ended the very moment she lost sight of his chaise and we may conclude his for her had not a much longer continuance for notwithstanding the protestations he made of keeping her dog for ever in remembrance of her little pompey had liked to have been left behind in the very first day's stage hilario after dinner had reposed himself to sleep on a couch in the inn from whence being waked with information that his chaise was ready and waited his pleasure at the door he started up discharged his bill and was proceeding on his journey without once bestowing a thought on the neglected favourite his servant however being more considerate brought him and delivered him at the chaise door to his master 
who cried indolently, Begad, that's well thought on, called him a little devil for giving so much trouble, and then drove away with the most unconcernedness. This I mention to show how very short-lived are the affections of protesting lovers. End of Book 1, Chapter 2「Book One, Chapter Three of The History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Starr. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog. By Francis Coventry, Book One, Chapter Three. Our hero arrives in England. A conversation between two ladies concerning his master. But as it is not my design to follow this gentleman through his tour, we must be contented to pass over a great part of the puppyhood of little Pompey till the time of his arrival at London. Only it may be of importance to remember that in his passage from Calais to Dover he was extremely seasick, and twice given over by a physician on board. But some additional applications, together with a week's confinement in his chamber after he came to town, restored him to his perfect health. Hilario was no sooner landed than he dispatched his French valet to London with orders to provide him handsome lodgings in Paul Mall, or some other great street near the court, and himself set forwards the next day with his whole retinue. Let us therefore imagine him arrived and settled in his new apartments. Uh, let us suppose the news-writers to have performed their duty, and all the important world of dress busy, as usual, in reporting from one to another that Hilario was returned from his travels. As soon as his chests and baggage were arrived in town, his servants were all employed in setting forth to view, in his antechamber, the several valuable curiosities he had collected, that his visitors might be detained, as they passed through it, in making observations on the elegance of his taste. For though dress and gallantry were his principal ambition, he had condescended, in compliance with the humour of the times, to consult the Cicerone at Rome, and other places, as to what was proper to be purchased in order to establish a reputation for vertu. And they had furnished him accordingly, at a proportional expense, with all the necessary ingredients of modern taste that is to say, with fingers and toes of ancient statues, medals bearing the name of Roman emperors on their inscriptions, and copied original pictures of all the great masters and schools of Italy. They had likewise taught him a set of phrases and observations proper to be made whenever the conversation should turn upon such subjects which, by the help of a good memory, he used with tolerable propriety. He could descant, in terms of art, on rusts and varnishes, and describe the air, the manner, the characteristic of different painters, in language almost as learned as the ingenious writer of a late essay. Here, he would observe, the drawing is incorrect. There the attitude ungraceful, the costume ill-preserved, the contours harsh, and the ordinance irregular, the light too strong, the shade too deep, with many other affected remarks, which may be found in a very grave, sententious book of morality. But dress, as we before observed, was his darling vanity. 
and, consequently, his rooms were more plentifully scattered with clothes than any other curiosity. There all the pride of Paris was exhibited to view. Suits of velvet and embroidery, sword-hilts, red-heeled shoes and snuff-boxes lay about in negligent confusion. Nor did he appear with less éclat without doors, for he had now shewn his gilt chariot and bay horses in all the streets of gay resort, and was allowed to have the most splendid, brilliant equipage in London. The club at White soon voted him a member of their fraternity, and there began a kind of rivalry among the ladies of fashion, who should first engage him to their assemblies. At all toilettes and parties in the morning, who but Hilario? At all drums and diversions in the evening, who but Hilario? Nobody came into the side-box at a playhouse with so graceful a negligence, and it was on all hands confessed that he had the most accomplished way of talking nonsense of any man of quality in London. As the fashionable part of the world are glad of any fresh topic of conversation that will not much fatigue their understandings, and the arrival of a new fop, the sight of a new chariot, or the appearance of a new fashion, are all articles of the highest importance to them, it could not be otherwise but that the shoe and figure which Hilario made must supply all the polite circles with matter for commendation or censure. As a little specimen of this kind of conversations may perhaps not be disagreeable, I will beg the reader's patience a moment to relate what passed on this subject between Cleanthe and Cleora, two ladies of eminence and distinction in the commonwealth of vanity. The former was a young lady of about fifty, who had outlived many generations of beauties, yet still preserved the airs and behaviour of fifteen. The latter, a celebrated toast, now in the meridian of her charms, and giddy with the admiration she excited. These two ladies had been for some time past engaged in a strict female friendship, and were now sitting down to supper at twelve o'clock at night to talk over the important follies of the day. They had played at cards that evening at four different assemblies, left their names each of them at nearly twenty doors, and taken half a turn round Ranley, where the youngest had been engaged in a very smart exchange of bows, smiles, and compliments with Hilario. This had been observed by Cleanthe, who was at the same place, and envied her the many civilities she received from a gentleman so splendidly dressed, whose embroidery gave a peculiar poignancy to his wit. Wherefore, at supper, she began to vent her spite against him, telling Cleora she wondered how she could listen to the impertinence of such a coxcomb. Surely, said she, you cannot admire him. For my part, I am amazed at people for calling him handsome. Do you really think him, my dear, so agreeable as the town generally makes him? Cleora, hesitating a moment, replied, she did not well know what beauty was in a man. To be sure added she, if one examines his features one by one, one sees nothing very extraordinary in him, but altogether he has an air and a manner and a notion of things, my dear. He is lively and airy and engaging and all that, and then his dresses are quite charming. Yes, said Cleanthe, that may be a very good recommendation of his tailor. And if one decides to marry a suit of velvet, why nobody better than Hilario? 
How should you like him for a husband, Cleora? Faith, said Cleora, smiling, I never once thought seriously upon the subject in my life. But surely, my dear, there is such a thing as fancy and taste in dress. In my opinion, a man shews his parts in nothing more than in the choice of his clothes and equipage. Why, to be sure, said Cleanth, the man has something of a notion at dress, I confess it, yet methinks I could make an alteration for the better in his liveries. Then began a very curious conversation on shoulder knots and they ran over all the liveries in town, commending one and disliking another, with great nicety of judgment. From shoulder knots they proceeded to the colour of coach-horses, and Cleanth, resolving to dislike Hilario's equipage, asked her if she did not prefer greys to bays. Cleora answered in the negative, and the clock struck one before they had decided this momentous question, which was contested with so much earnestness that both of them were beginning to grow angry, and to say ill-natured things, had not a new topic arisen to divert their discourse. His chariot came next under consideration, and then they returned to speculation on his dress and when they had fully exhausted all the external accomplishments of a husband, they vouchsafed, at last, to come to the qualities of the mind. Cleora preferred a man who had travelled, because, said she, he has seen the world, and must be ten thousand times more agreeable and entertaining than a dull, home-bred fellow who has never improved himself by seeing things. But Cleanth was of a different opinion, alleging that this would only give him a greater conceit of himself, and make him less manageable by a wife. Then they fell to abusing matrimony, numbered over the many unhappy couples of their acquaintance, and both of them, for a moment, resolved to live single. But those resolutions were soon exploded. "'For though,' said Cleanth, "'I should prefer a friendship with an agreeable man far beyond marrying him, Yet you know, my dear, we girls are under so many restraints that one must wish for a husband if it be only for the privilege of going into public places without the protection of a married woman along with one to give one countenance. Cleora rallied the expression of we girls, which again had like to have bred a quarrel between them, and soon afterwards happening to say she should like to dance with Hilario at the next redotta, Cleanth, notwithstanding the indifference she had hitherto expressed towards him, could not help declaring that she should be pleased also to have him for a partner. This stirred up a warmer altercation than any that had yet arisen, and they contended with such vehemence for this distant imaginary happiness, which perhaps might happen to neither of them, that they grew quite unappeasable, and, in the end, departed to bed with as much malice and enmity as if the one had made an attempt on the other's life. End of Book One, Chapter Three. Recording by John Starr. www.ourmanstar.com. Book One, Chapter Four, of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Starr The History of Pompey the Little 
or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog by Francis Coventry, Book One, Chapter Four. Another conversation between Hilario and two ladies of quality. Our hero was now perfectly recovered from the indisposition hinted at in the beginning of the preceding chapter, and pretty well reconciled to the air of England, but as yet had made few acquaintances either with gentlemen of his own or of a different species, being seldom permitted to expatiate beyond Hilario's lodgings where his chief amusement was to stand with his forepaws up in the window and contemplate the coaches that passed through the street. But Fortune, who had destined him to a great variety of adventures, no sooner observed that he was settled and began to grow established in his new apartments than she determined, according to her usual inconstancy, to beat up his quarters and provide him a new habitation. Hilario and his little dog were making a visit one morning to a lady of quality at her toilette, where they had not been long before another lady of the same rank entered the room and joined the conversation. It turned, as I have been told, on the Italian opera, which they all declared to be the most sublime entertainment in life, when on a sudden little Pompey leapt up into his master's lap. Lady Tempest, that was the name of the lady last arrived, no sooner saw him than addressing herself to his master with the ease and familiarity of modern breeding. Hilario, said she, where the devil did you get that pretty dog? This dog, madam, cries Hilario. Oh, l'amour, thereby hangs a tale. This dog, madam, once belonged to a woman of the first fashion in Italy, the finest creature, I think, that ever my eyes beheld, such a shape and such an air. Then ran he into the most extravagant encomiums on her beauty, and after dropping many hints of an intrigue to awaken the ladies' curiosity and make them inquire into the particulars of the story, concluded with desiring them to excuse him from proceeding any farther, for he thought it the highest injury to betray a lady's secrets. Nay, said Lady Tempest, it can do her reputation no hurt to tell tales of her in England. And besides, Lario, if you acquitted yourself with spirit and gallantry in the affair, who knows but we shall like you the better after we have heard your story. Well, said he, on that condition, my dear Countess, I will confess the truth. I had an affair with this lady, and I think none of my amours ever afforded me greater transport, but the eyes of a husband will officiously be pried into things that do not concern them. Her jealous-pated booby surprised us one evening in a little familiar dalliance, and Pox take him, sent me a challenge the next morning. Bless us, said Lady Tempest, and what became of it? Why, cries Hilario, I would willingly have washed my hand of the fellow if I could, for I thought it but a silly business to hazard one's life with so ridiculous an animal. But curse the blockhead, he could not understand ridicule. You must know, madam, I sent him for answer with the greatest ease imaginable, quite composed, as I am at this moment, that I had so prodigious a cold it would be imprudent to fight abroad in the open air. 
but if he would have a fire in his best apartment, and a bottle of burgundy ready for me on the table after I'd gone through the fatigue of killing him, I was at his service as soon as he pleased. Meaning, you see, to have turned the affair off with a joke, if the fellow had been capable of tasting ridicule. But that stratagem, replied Lady Tempest, I am afraid did not succeed. The man, I doubt, was too dull to apprehend your raillery. Dull as a beetle, madam, said Hilario. The monster continued obstinate, and repeated his challenge. When, therefore, I found nothing else would do, I resolved to meet him, according to his appointment, and there, in short, oh, I shall never forget how he looked, in short, not to trouble your ladyships with a long, tedious description, I ran him through the body. Both the ladies burst out laughing at this story, which they most justly concluded to be a lie and after entertaining themselves with many pleasant remarks upon it, one of them said with a smile, "'But what is this to the dog, Hilario?' "'The dog, madam,' answered he. "'Oh, pardon me, I am coming to the dog immediately. Come hither, Pompey, and listen to your own story.' This dog, madam, this very little dog, had, at that time, the honour of waiting on the dear woman I have been describing, and, as the noise of my duel obliged me to quit Bologna, I sent her private notice of my intentions, and begged her, by any means, to favour me with an interview before my departure. The monster, her husband, who then lay on his deathbed, immured her so closely that you may imagine it was very difficult to gratify my desires. But love, immortal love, gave her courage. She sent me a private key to get admission into her garden, and appointed me an assignation in an orange grove at nine in the evening. I flew to the dear creature's arms, and spent an hour with her in the greatest rapture, till it grew dangerous and impossible to stay any longer. Oh, mon coeur! Then we knelt down, both of us on the cold ground, and saluted one another for the last time on our knees. Damned malicious fate tore me at length from her arms, and she gave me this dog, this individual little dog, to carry with me as a memorial of her love. The poor dear tender woman died, I hear, within three weeks after my departure. But this dog, this divine little dog, will I keep everlasting for her sake. When the ladies had heard him to an end, Well, said Lady Tempest, you have really told a very pretty story, Hilario. But, as to your resolutions of keeping the dog, I swear you shall break them, for I had the misfortune t'other day to lose my favourite black spaniel of the mange, and I intend you shall give me this little dog to supply his place. Not for the universe, madam, replied Hilario. I should expect to see his dear injured mistress's ghost haunting me in my sleep to-night, if I could be guilty of such an act of infidelity to her. Pew, said the lady, don't tell me of such ridiculous superstitious trumpery. 
you no more came by the dog in this manner, Hilario, than you will fly to the moon to-night. But, looky, make no preambles, for I positively must and will take him home with me. Madam, said Hilario, this little dog is sacred to love. He was born to be the herald of love, and there is but one consideration in nature that can possibly induce me to part with it. And what is that? said the lady. That, madam, cries Hilario, bowing, is the honour of visiting him at all hours in his new apartments. He must be the herald of love wherever he goes, and on these conditions, if you will now and then admit me to your retirements, little Pompey waits your acceptance as soon as you please. Well, said the lady, smiling, you know that I am not inexorable, Hilario, and if you have a mind to visit your little friend at my rule, you will find him ready to receive you. Though, faith, upon second thoughts, I know not whether I dare admit you or not. You are such a killer of husbands, Hilario, that is quite terrible to think on and if mine was not conveniently removed out of the way, I should have the poor man sacrificed for his jealousy. Raillery, raillery, returned Hilario. But, as you say, my dear Countess, your monster is commodiously out of the way, and therefore we need be under no apprehensions from that quarter, for I hardly believe he will rise out of his grave to interrupt our amours. Amours? cried the lady, lifting up her voice. Pray, what have I said that encourages you to talk of amours? From this time the conversation began to grow much too loose to be reported in this work. They congratulated each other on the felicity of living in an age that allows such indulgence to women, and gives them leave to break loose from their husbands whenever they grow morose and disagreeable, or attempt to interrupt their pleasures. From hence they relapsed again into a discourse on the Italian opera, and thence made a quick transition to Lady's painting. This was no sooner started than Hilario begged leave to present the lady of the house with a box of rouge which he had brought with him from France, assuring her that the ladies were arrived at such excellency of using it at Paris as to confound all distinction of age and beauty. I protest, your ladyship, continued he, it is impossible at any distance to distinguish a woman of sixty from a girl of sixteen, and I have seen an old dowager in the opposite box at the playhouse make as good a figure and look as blooming as the youngest beauty in the place. Nothing in nature is there required to make a woman handsome but eyes. If a woman has but eyes, she may be a beauty whenever she pleases, at the expense of a couple of guineas. Teeth and hair and eyebrows and complexions are all as cheap as fans and gloves and ribbons. While this ingenious orator was pursuing his eloquent harangue on beauty, Lady Tempest, looking at her watch, declared it was time to be going, for she had seven or eight visits more to make that morning, and it was then almost three in the afternoon. 
little Pompey, who had absented himself during great part of the preceding conversation, as thinking it perhaps above the reach of his understanding, was now ordered to be produced, and the moment he made his appearance, Lady Tempest, catching him up in her arms, was conducted by Hilario into her chair, which stood at the door waiting her commands. Thus our hero, with three footmen forerunning his equipage, set out in triumph for his new apartments. End of Book One, Chapter Four Recording by John Starr www.ourmanstar.com Book One, Chapter Five of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Starr. The History of Pompey the Little or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry, Book One, Chapter Five. The character of Lady Tempest, with some particulars of her servants and family. The sudden appearance of this lady, with whom our hero is now about to take up his residence, may perhaps excite the reader's curiosity to know who she is, and therefore, before we proceed any farther in our history, we shall spend a page or two in bringing him acquainted with her character. But hmm, let me admonish thee, my gentle friend, whosoever thou art, that shalt vouchsafe to peruse this little treatise not to be too forward in making applications, or to construe satire into libel. For we declare here once and for all that no character drawn in this work is intended for any particular person, but meant to comprehend a great variety. And, therefore, if thy sagacity discovers likenesses that were never meant, be so good as to impute it to thy own ill nature, and accuse not the humble author of these sheets. Taking this caution along with thee, candid reader, we may venture to trust thee with a character which, otherwise, we should be afraid to draw. Lady Tempest, then, was originally daughter to a private gentleman of moderate fortune, which she was to share in common with a brother and two other sisters. But her wit and beauty soon distinguished her among her acquaintance, and recompensed the deficiencies of fortune. She was a free-hearted, sprightly, jovial girl, very cheerful in her conversation, and open in her behaviour, ready to promote any party of pleasure, and not displeased now and then to be assistant in a little mischief. This made her company courted by men of all sorts, among whom her affability and spirit, as well as her beauty, procured her many admirers. At length she was solicited in marriage by a young lord, famous for nothing but his great estate, and far her inferior in understanding. But the advantageousness of the match soon prevailed with her parents to give their consent, and the thoughts of a title so dazzled her own eyes that she had no leisure to ask herself whether she liked the man or no that wore it. His lordship married for the sake of begetting an heir to his estate and married her in particular, because he had heard her toasted as a beauty by most of his acquaintance. 
She, on the contrary, married because she wanted a husband, and married him because he could give her a title, and a coach and six. But, alas, there is this little misfortune attending matrimony, that people cannot live together any time without discovering each other's tempers. Familiarity soon draws aside the mask, and all that artificial complacence and smiling good humour which makes so agreeable a part of courtship go off like April blossoms upon a longer acquaintance. The year was scarce ended before her young ladyship was surprised to find she had married a fool, which little circumstance her vanity had concealed from her before marriage, and the hurry and transport she felt in a new equipage did not suffer her to attend to for the first half-year afterwards. But now she began to doubt whether she had not made an unhappy bargain for life, and consulting with some of her female intimates about it, several of whom were married, she received such documents from them as, I am afraid, did not a little contribute to prepare her for the steps she afterwards took. Her husband, too, though not very quick of discernment, had by this time found out that his wife's spirit and romantic disposition were inconsistent with his own gloom, which gave new clouds to his temper, and he often cursed himself in secret for having married her. They soon grew to reveal these thoughts to one another both in words and actions. They sat down to meals with indifference, and the one was always sure to dislike what the other at any time seemed to approve. Her ladyship had recourse to the common expedient in these cases. I mean the getting a female companion into the house with her, as well to relieve her from the tediousness of sitting down to meals alone with her husband, as chiefly to hear her complaints, and spirit her up against her fool and tyrant, the names by which she usually spoke of her lord and master, when no such female companions, or more properly toad-eaters, happened to be present, she chose rather to divert herself with a little favourite dog than to murder any of her precious time in conversing with her husband. This his lordship observed, and besides many severe reflections and cross speeches, at length he'd wreaked his vengeance o'er the little favourite, and in a passion put him to death. This was an affair so heinous in the lady's own esteem, and pronounced to be so barbarous, so shocking, so inhuman by all her acquaintance, that she resolved no longer to keep any terms with him, and from this moment grew desperate in all her actions. First, then, she resolved to supply the place of one favourite with a great number, and immediately procured as many dogs into the family as it could well hold. His lordship, in return, would order his servant to hang two or three of them every week, and never failed kicking them downstairs by dozens whenever they came in his way. When this, and many other stratagems, had been tried, some with good and some with bad success, she came at last to play the great game of female resentment, and by many intimations gave him to mistrust that a stranger had invaded his bed. Whether this was real, or only an artifice of spite, his lordship could never discover, and therefore we shall not indulge the reader's curiosity by letting him into the secret, 
but the bare apprehension of it so inflamed his choler that her company now became intolerable to him and indeed their meetings were dreadful to themselves and terrible to all beholders their servants used to stand at the door to listen to their quarrels and then charitably disperse the subjects of them throughout the town so that all companies now range of lord and lady tempest but this could not continue long for indifference may sometimes be born in a married state but indignation and hatred i believe never can and tis impossible to say what their quarrels might have produced had not his lordship very seasonably died and left his disconsolate widow to bear about the mocker of woe to all public places for a year she now began the world anew on her own foundation and set sail down the stream of pleasure without the fears of virginity to check her or the influence of a husband to control her now she'd recovered that sprightliness of conversation and gaiety of behaviour which had been clouded during the latter part of her cohabitation with her husband and was soon cried up for the greatest female wit in London. Men of gallantry and all the world of pleasure had easy access to her, and malicious fame reports that she was not over hard-hearted to the solicitations of love. But far be it from us to report any such improbable scandal what gives her a place in this history is her fondness for dogs which from her childhood she loved exceedingly and was seldom without a little favourite to carry about in her arms but from the moment that her angry husband sacrificed one of them to his resentment she grew more passionately fond of them than ever and now constantly kept six or eight of various kinds in her house. About this time one of her great favourites had the misfortune to die of the mange, as was above commemorated, and when she saw little Pompey she resolved immediately to bestow the vacancy upon him, which that well-bred gentleman consented to, on certain conditions, as the reader has seen in the foregoing chapter. She returned home from her visit just as the clock was striking four, and, after surveying herself a moment in the glass, and a little adjusting her hair, went directly to introduce Master Pompey to his companions. These were an Italian greyhound, a Dutch pug, two black spaniels of King Charles's breed, a harlequin greyhound, a spotted dame, and a mouse-coloured English bulldog. They heard their mistresses rap at the door, and were assembled in the dining-room ready to receive her. But on the appearance of Master Pompey, they set up a general bark, perhaps out of envy, and some of them treated the little stranger with rather more rudeness than was consistent with dogs of their education. However, the lady soon interposed her authority, and commanded silence among them by ringing a little bell which she kept by her for that purpose. They all obeyed the signal instantly, and were still in a moment, upon which she carried little Pompey round and obliged them all to salute their new acquaintance, at the same time commanding some of them to ask pardon for their unpolite behaviour, which, whether they understood or not, must be left to the reader's determination. She then summoned a servant and ordered a chicken to be roasted for him, 
but hearing that dinner was just ready to be served up, she was pleased to say he must be contented with what was provided for herself that day, but gave orders to the cook to get ready chicken to his own share against night. Her ladyship now sat down to table, and Pompey was placed at her elbow where he received many dainty bits from her fair hands, and was caressed by her all dinner-time, with more than usual fondness. The servants winked at one another while they were waiting, and conveyed many sneers across the table with their looks, all which had the good luck to escape her ladyship's observation. But the moment they were retired from waiting, they gave vent to their thoughts with all the scurrilous wit and ill-mannered raillery which distinguishes the conversation of those party-coloured gentlemen. And first the butler, out of livery, served up his remarks to the housekeeper's table, which consisted of himself, an elderly fat woman, the housekeeper, and my lady's maid, a saucy, forward, affected girl of about twenty. Addressing himself to these second-hand gentlewomen, as soon as they were pleased to sit down to dinner, he informed them that their family was increased, and that his lady had brought home a new companion. Their curiosity soon led them to desire an explanation, and then, telling them that this new companion was a new dog, he related minutely and circumstantially all her ladyship's behaviour to him during the time of his attendance at the sideboard, not forgetting to mention the orders of a roasted chicken for the gentleman's supper. The housekeeper launched out largely on the sin and wickedness of feeding such creatures with Christian victuals declared it was flying in the face of heaven, and wondered how her lady could admit them into her apartment, for, she said, they had already spoiled all the crimson damask chairs in the dining-room. But my lady's maid had a great deal more to say on this subject, and, as it was her particular office to wait on these four-footed worthies, she complained of the hardship done her, with great volubility of tongue. Then, says she, there's a new play come home, is there? Has he got the mange too, I suppose, and I shall have him to wash and comb to-morrow morning. I am sure I am all over fleas with tending such nasty, poisonous vermin, and tis a shame to put a Christian to such offices. I was in hopes, when that mangy little devil died t'other day, we should have had no more of them, but deuce fetch me if I won't run the comb into the little devil's back the first time he comes under my hands. I can't endure to see my lady. Let them kiss her and lick her face all over as she does. I am sure I'd see all the dogs in England at Jericho before I'd suffer such poor cat vermin to lick my face, for oh, tis enough to make one sick to see it. And I am sure, if I was a man, I'd scorn to kiss a face that had been licked by a dog. This was part of a speech made by this delicate mincing comb-brusher, and the rest we shall omit, to wait upon the inferior servants, who were now assembled at dinner in their common hall of gluttony, and exercising their talents likewise on the same subject. John, the footman, here reported what Mr. William, the butler, had done before in his department, 
that their lady had brought home a new dog. "'Damn it!' cries the coachman with a surly, brutal voice. "'What signifies a new dog? Has she brought home ever a new man?' <laughs> which was seconded with a loud laugh from all the company. Another swore he never knew a kennel of dogs kept in a bedchamber before, which likewise was applauded with a loud and boisterous laugh. But as such kind of wit is too low for the dignity of this history, though much affected by many of my contemporaries, I fancy I shall easily have the reader's excuse if I forbear to relate any more of it. To say the truth, the lower sort of men-servants are the most insolent, brutal, ungenerous rascals on the face of the earth. They are bred up in idleness, drunkenness, and debauchery, and, instead of concealing any faults they observe at home, find a pleasure in vilifying and mangling the reputations of their masters in all alehouses, nine-pin alleys, gin-shops, cellars, and every other place of dirty rendezvous. End of Book One, Chapter Five of the History of Pompey the Little. Recording by John Starr. www.ourmanstar.com Book One, Chapter Six of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Six. Our Hero Becomes a Dog of the Town and shines in high life. Pompey was now grown up to maturity and dog's estate, when he came to live with Lady Tempest, who soon ushered him into all the joys and vanities of the town. As he attended his mistress to all routs, drums, hurricanes, hurly-burlies, and earthquakes, he soon established an acquaintance and friendship with the most noted dogs of quality, and, of course, affected a most hearty contempt for all of inferior station, whom he would never vouchsafe to play with or pay them the least regard. He seemed to know at first sight whether a dog had received a good education by his manner of coming into a room, and was extremely ambitious to show his collar at court, in which again he resembled certain other dogs, who are equally vain of their finery and happy to be distinguished in their respective orders. If he could have spoken, I am persuaded, he would have used the phrases so much in fashion. Nobody one knows. Wretches dropped out of the moon. Creatures sprung from a dunghill, by which are signified all those who are not born to a title, or have not impudence and dishonesty enough, to run in debt with their tailors for laced clothes. Again, had he been able to write a letter from Bath or Tunbridge, he would have told his correspondent there was not a soul in the place, though at the same time he knew there were above two thousand, because perhaps none of the men wore stars and garters, and none of the women were bold enough to impoverish their families by playing at the noble and illustrious game of brag. As he was now become a dog of the town, and perfectly well-bred, of course, he gave himself up to intrigue, and had seldom less than two or three amours at a time with bitches of the highest fashion, in which circumstances he again lamented the want of speech, being by that means debarred from the pleasure of boasting of the favors he received. But his gallantries were soon divulged 
by the consequences of them, and as several very pretty puppies had been the offspring of his loves, it was usual for all the acquaintances of Lady Tempest to solicit and cultivate his breed. And here I shall beg leave to insert two little billets of a very extraordinary nature, as a specimen of what it is that engages the attention of ladies of quality in this refined and accomplished age. Lady Tempest was sitting at her toilet one morning, when her maid brought her the following little scroll from another lady, whose name will be seen at the bottom of her letter. Dear Tempest, My favorite little Venny is at present troubled with certain amorous infirmities of nature, and would not be displeased with the addresses of a lover. Be so good, therefore, to send little Pompey by my servant who brings this note, for I fancy it will make a very pretty breed, and, when the lovers have transacted their affairs, he shall be sent home incontinently. Believe me, dear Tempest, yours affectionately, Racket. Lady Tempest, as soon as she had read this curious epistle, called for pen and ink, and immediately wrote the following answer, which likewise we beg leave to insert. Dear Racket, Infirmities of nature we are all subject to, and therefore I have sent Master Pompey to wait upon Miss Venny, begging the favor of you to return him as soon as his gallantries are over. Consider, my dear, no modern love can, in the nature of things, last above three days, and therefore I hope to see my little friend again very soon. Your affectionate friend, Tempest. In consequence of these letters, our hero was conducted to Miss Rackett's house, where he was received with the civility due to his station in life, and treated on the footing of a gentleman who came according in the family. Mrs. Rackett had two daughters, who had greatly improved their natural relish for pleasure in the warm climate of a town education, and were extremely solicitous to inform themselves of all the mysteries of love. These young ladies no sooner heard of Pompey's arrival then they went downstairs into the parlor, and undertook themselves to introduce him to Miss Venny. For love so much engrossed their thoughts that they could not suffer a lapdog in the house to have an amour without their privity. Here, while they were solacing themselves with innocent speculation, a young gentleman, who visited on familiar footing in the family, was introduced somewhat abruptly to them. They no sooner found themselves surprised then they ran tittering to a corner of the parlor, and hid their faces behind their fans. While their visitor, not happening to observe the hymeneal rites that were celebrating, begged to know the cause of their mirth. This redoubled their diversion, and they burst out afresh in such immoderate fits of laughter that the poor man began to look exceedingly foolish, imagining himself to be the object of their ridicule. In vain, he renewed his entreaties to be let into the secret of their laughter. The ladies had not the power of utterance, and he would still have continued ignorant had he not accidentally cast his eye aside, and there beheld Master Pompey, with the most prevailing solicitation, making love to his four-footed mistress. This at once satisfied his curiosity, and he was no longer at a loss to know the reason of that uncommon joy and rapture which the ladies had expressed. Thus our hero was permitted to riot in all the luxuries of life, and treated everywhere, both at home and abroad, with the greatest indulgence. He fed every day upon chicken, partridges, ragouts, fricassees, and all the rarities in season, which so pampered him up with luxurious notions, as made some future scenes of life the more grievous to him, when fortune obliged him to undergo the hardships that will hereafter be recorded. End of Book One, Chapter Six Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Book One, Chapter Seven of the History of Pompey the Little This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer 
The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry, Book One, Chapter Seven. Relating a curious dispute on the immortality of the soul, in which the name of our hero will but once be mentioned. Nothing is more common on the stage than to suspend the curiosity of the audience in the most interesting scenes of a play and relieve them, as it is called, with a dance of ghosts or devils or furies or other outlandish beings. In imitation of this laudable custom, before the reader proceeds any farther in Pompey's history, he is desired to relieve himself with a curious dispute on the immortality of the soul, which passed one day in our hero's presence. Lady Tempest, about this time, being indisposed with some trifling disorder, kept her chamber, and was attended by two physicians. These gentlemen were now making their morning visit, and had just gone through the examination, which custom immemorial prescribes as, "'How did your ladyship sleep last night?' Do you find any drouth, madam? Pray, let me look at your ladyship's tongue, and many other questions, which I have not leisure now to record, when, on a sudden, a violent rap at the door, and shortly afterwards the appearance of a visitor interrupted their proceedings. The lady, who now arrived, came directly up to Lady Tempest, and made her compliments. Then, being desired to sit down, she fell into some common chit-chat on the news of the town, in the midst of which, without anything preparatory to such a subject, addressing herself on a sudden to one of the physicians, with a face of infinite significance and erudition, she asked him if he believed in the immortality of the soul. But before we answer this extraordinary question, or relate the conversation that ensued upon it, it will be for the reader's ease to receive a short sketch of her character. In many respects, this lady was in similar circumstances with Lady Tempest, only with this difference, that the one had been separated from her husband by his death, the other divorced from hers by act of Parliament. The one was famous for wit, and the other affected the character of wisdom. Lady Sophister, for that was her name, as soon as she was released from the matrimonial fetters, set out to visit foreign parts, and had displayed her charms in most of the courts in Europe. There, in many parts of her tour, she had cultivated an acquaintance with the literati, and particularly in France, where the ladies affect a reputation of science, and are able to discourse on the profoundest questions of theology and philosophy. The labyrinths of a female brain are so varied and intricate that it is difficult to say what first suggested the opinion to her, whether caprice or vanity of being singular, but all of a sudden her ladyship took a fancy into her head to disbelieve the immortality of the soul, and never came into the company of learned men without displaying her talents on this wonderful subject. This extraordinary principle to show that she did not take up her notions lightly and wantonly, she was able to demonstrate, and could appeal to the greatest authorities in defense of it. She had read Hobbes, Malbranche, Locke, Shaftesbury, Wollaston, and many more, all of whom she obliged to give testimony to her paradox, and perverted passages out of their works, with a facility very easy to be imagined. But Mr. Locke had the misfortune to be her principal favorite, and consequently it rested chiefly upon him to furnish her with quotations, whenever her ladyship pleased to engage in controversy. Such was the character of Lady Sophister, who now arrived and asked the surprising question above mentioned concerning the immortality of the soul. Dr. Kildarby, to whom she addressed herself, astonished at the novelty of the question, sat staring with horror and amazement on his companion, which Lady Tempest, observing, and guessing that her female friend was going to be very absurd, resolved to promote the conversation for her own amusement. 
Turning herself, therefore, to the doctor, she said with a smile, "'Don't you understand the meaning of her ladyship's question, sir? "'She asks you if you believe in the immortality of the soul. "'Believe in the immortality of the soul, madam?' said the doctor, staring. "'Bless me, your ladyships, astonish me beyond measure. "'Believe in the immortality of the soul? "'Yes, undoubtedly, and I hope all mankind does the same.' "'Be not sure of that, sir,' said Lady Sophister. "'Pray, have you ever read Mr. Locke's controversy "'with the Bishop of Worcester?' "'Mr. Locke's controversy, madam,' replied the doctor. "'I protest. I am not sure. "'Mr. Locke's controversy with the Bishop of Worcester. "'Let me see. I vow I can't recollect. "'My reading has been very multifarious and extensive. "'Yes, madam?' I think I have read it, though I protest I can't be sure whether I have read it or no. Have you ever read it, Dr. Rhubarb? said she, addressing herself to the other physician. Oh, yes, madam, very often, replied he. Tis that fine piece of his where... Yes, yes, I have read it very often. I remember it perfectly well. But pray, madam, is there any passage? I beg your ladyship's pardon, if I am mistaken... "'But is there any passage, I say, in that piece, "'which tends to confirm your ladyship's notion "'concerning the immortality of the soul?' "'Why, pray, sir,' said the lady, with a smile of triumph, "'what do you esteem the soul to be? "'Is it air, or fire, or ether, "'or some kind of quintessence, as Aristotle observed? "'And composition of all the element? "'Dr. Rhubarb, quite dumbfounded with so much learning, "'desired first to hear her ladyship's opinion of the matter. "'My opinion,' returned she, "'is exactly the same with Mr. Locke's. "'You know Mr. Locke observes "'there are various kinds of matter. "'Well, but first we should define matter, "'which you know the logicians tell us "'is an extended solid substance. "'Well, out of this matter, "'some you know is made into roses and peach trees.' Then the next step which matter takes is animal life. From whence you know we have lions and elephants, and all the race of brutes. Then the last step, as Mr. Locke observes, is thought and reason and volition. From whence are created men. And therefore you very plainly see, tis impossible for the soul to be immortal. Pardon me, madam, said Rhubarb. Roses and peach trees, and elephants and lions... I protest, I remember nothing of this nature in Mr. Locke. Nay, sir, said she, can you deny me this? If the soul is fire, it must be extinguished. If it is air, it must be dispersed. If it be only a modification of matter, why then, of course, it ceases. You know, when matter is no longer modified, if it be anything else, it is exactly the same thing. And therefore you must confess... Indeed, doctor, you must confess that tis impossible for the soul to be immortal. Dr. Kildarby, who had sat silent for some time to collect his thoughts, finding what a learned antagonist he had to cope with, began now to harangue in the following manner. Madam, said he, as to the nature of the soul, to be sure there have been such opinions as your ladyship mentions about it, many various and unaccountable opinions. Some called it Divinium Coleste, others Quinta Essentia, as your ladyship observes, and others Inflammata Anemia, that is, madam, inflamed air. Aristoxenus, an old musician, as I remember, imagined the soul to be a musical tune, and a mathematician that I have heard of supposed it to be like an equilateral triangle. Descartes, I think, makes its residence to be the pineal gland of the brain, where all the nerves terminate. And Bory, I remember, the Milanese physician, in a letter to Bartholin, de orto cerebi and uso medico, asserts that in the brain is found a certain very subtle, fragrant juice, which I conceive may be the same as the nervous juice or animal spirits, and this he takes to be the residence or seat of the soul. The subtility or finesse of which he supposes to depend, madam, 
on the temperature of this liquor. But really, all these opinions may very probably be false. We do but grope in the dark, madam. We do but grope in the dark, and it would be better to let the subject entirely alone. The concurrent opinions of all mankind have ever agreed in believing the immortality of the soul, and this, I confess, is to me an unanswerable argument of its truth. You see, madam, I purposely waive the topic of revelation. Oh, sir, as to that matter, cries the lady, interrupting him, as to revelation, sir, and here she ran into much commonplace raillery at the expense only of Christianity and the gospel, till Lady Tempest cut her short, and desired her to be silent on that head. For this good lady believed all the doctrines of religion, and was contented, like many others, with the trifling privilege only of disobeying all its precepts. Lady Sophister, however, resolved not to quit the field of battle, but rallied her forces, and once more fell on her adversaries with an air of triumph. "'You say, I think, sir,' resumed she, "'that a multitude of opinions will establish a truth. Now, you know, all the Indians believe that their dogs will go to heaven along with them, and, if a great many opinions can prove anything to be true, what say you to that, sir? India, you know, doctor, is a prodigious large wide track of continent, where the gymnosophists lived, and all that. Pray, Lady Tempest, let us look at your globes. My globes, madam, said Lady Tempest. What globes of mine does your ladyship desire to see? What globes, replied the disputant. Why, your celestial and terrestrial globes, to be sure. I want to look out India in the map, and show the doctor what a prodigious wide tract of continent it is in comparison of our Europe. However, come, I believe we can do without them. As I was saying, therefore, sir, the Indians, you know, believe their dogs will bear them company to heaven. And if a great many opinions can establish the truth of an hypothesis, you understand me, I hope, because I would fain speak to be understood. I say, if a great many opinions can prove anything to be true, what say you to that, sir? For instance, now, there's Lady Tempest's little lapdog. My dear little creature, said Lady Tempest, catching him up in her arms, will you go to heaven along with me? I shall be vastly glad of your company, Pompey, if you will. From this hint, both their ladyships had many bright sallies. To Lady Sophister flushed with the hopes of this argument, recalled her adversary to the question, and desired to hear his reply. "'Come, sir,' said she, "'you have not yet responded to my argument. You have not answered my last syllogism. I think I have graveled you now. I think I have done for you. I think I have demolished you, doctor.' "'Not at all, madam,' said Kildarby. "'Really, as to that matter, that is neither here nor there. "'Opinions, madam, vague, irregular opinions, "'will spring up and float in people's brains. "'But we are talking of the dictates of sense and reason. "'Savages, madam, will be savage. "'But Indians have nothing to do with Europeans. "'The reply to what your ladyship has advanced "'would be easy and obvious.' but really I must beg to be excused. My profession does not oblige me to a knowledge of such subjects. I came here to prescribe as a physician, and not to discuss topics of theology. Come, brother, I believe we only interrupt their ladyships, and I am obliged to call upon my lord, and Sir William, and Lady Betty, and many other people of quality this morning. Dr. Rhubarb declared that he likewise had as many visits to make that morning, whereupon taking their leave and their fees, the two gentlemen retired with great precipitation, leaving her ladyship in possession of the field of battle, who immediately reported all over the town that she had outreasoned two physicians, and obliged them, by dint of argument, to confess that the soul is not immortal. And now begging the reader's pardon for this digression, let us return to our hero, who, I am afraid, is going to suffer a great revolution in his life. End of Book One, 
Chapter Seven. Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. Book One, Chapter Eight, of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Eight. Various and Sundry Matters. Lady Tempest had been walking one morning in St. James Park, with her little favorite, as usual, attending her, for she never went abroad without taking him in her arms. Here she sat him down on his legs, to play with some other dogs of quality, that were taking the air that morning in the mall, giving him strict orders, however, not to presume to stray out of her sight. Yet, in spite of this injunction, Something or other tempted his curiosity beyond the limits of the mall, and there, while he was rolling and indulging himself on the green grass, a pleasure by novelty rendered more agreeable to him, it was his misfortune to spring a bird, which he pursued with such eagerness and alacrity that he was quite out of sight before he thought proper to give over to chase. His mistress, in the meanwhile, was engaged in so warm and interesting a dispute on the price of silk that she never missed her favorite. Nay, what is still more extraordinary, she got into her coach and drove home without once bestowing a thought upon him. But the moment she arrived in her dining-room and cast her eyes on the rest of her four-footed friends, her guilt immediately flew in her face, and she cried out with a scream, as I am alive, I have left little Pompey behind me. Then, summoning up two of her servants, she commanded them to go directly and search every corner of the park with the greatest diligence, protesting she should never have any peace of mind till her favorite was restored to her arms. Many times she rang her bell to know if her servants were returned before it was possible for them to have got thither but at length the fatal message arrived, that Pompey was nowhere to be found. And indeed, it would have been next to a miracle if he had, for these faithful ambassadors had never once stirred from the kitchen fire, where, together with the rest of the servants, they had been laughing at the folly of their mistress. And the reason why they denied their return sooner was because they imagined a sufficient time had not then elapsed to give a probability to that lie which they were determined to tell. Yet this did not satisfy their lady. She sent them a second time to repeat their search, and a second time they returned with the same answer. At this again the reader is desired not to wonder, for though her ladyship saw them out of the house herself, and ordered them to bring back her favorite under pain of dismission, the farthest of their travels was only to an alehouse at the corner of the street, where they had been entertaining a large circle of their party-colored brethren, with much ribaldry at the expense of their mistress. Tenderness to this lady's character makes me pass over much of the sorrow she vented on this occasion, but I cannot help relating that she immediately dispatched cards to all her acquaintance to put off a drum which was to have been held at her house that evening giving as a reason that she had lost her darling lapdog and could not see company. She continued to advertise him in all the newspapers for a month together, with increase of the reward as the case grew more desperate. Yet nearly all the inquiries she made, nor all the rewards she offered, ever restored little Pompey to her arms. We must leave her, therefore, to receive the consolations of her friends on this afflicting loss, and returned to examine after our hero. He had been pursuing a bird, as was before described, and, when his diversion was over, galloped back to the mall, not in the least doubting to find his lady there at his return. But, alas, how great was his disappointment! 
He ran up and down, smelling to every petticoat he met, and staring up in every female face. Yet neither his eyes nor his nose gave him the information he desired. Seven times he coursed from Buckingham House to the horse guard, and back again, but all in vain. At length, tired, disconsolate, and full of despair, he sat himself down under a tree, and there, turning his head aside in a thoughtful attitude, abandoned himself to much mournful meditation. In this evil plight, while he was ruminating on his fate, and, like many other people in the park, unable to divine where he should get a dinner, he was spied by a little girl about seven years old, who was walking by her mother's side in the mall. She no sooner perceived him than she cried out, La mamma, there's a pretty dog, and then applied herself with much tenderness to solicit him to her. The wretched are always glad to find a friend, and our little unfortunate no sooner saw one courting him to her than, immediately breaking off his meditations, he ran hastily up, and, saluting her eagerly with his forepaws, gave so many dumb expressions of joy that speech itself could hardly have been more eloquent. The young lady, on her side, charmed with his ready compliance, snatched him up in her arms and kissed him with great delight, then turning again to her mother and asking her if she did not think him a lovely creature, I wonder, says she, whose dog it is, Mamma. I have a good mind to take him home with me. Shall I, Mamma? Shall I take him home with me, Mamma? To this also her mother consented, and when they had taken two or three more turns, they retired to their coach, and Pompey was conducted to his new lodgings. As soon as they alighted at home, little Miss ran hastily upstairs to show her brother and sisters the prize she had found, and he was handed about from one to the other with great delight and admiration of his beauty. Then he was introduced to all their favorites, which were a dormouse, two kittens, a squirrel, a parrot, and a magpie. To these he was presented with many childish ceremonies and a thousand little follies which make up the happiness of this happiest age. The parrot was to make a speech to him, the squirrel to treat him with some nuts, the kittens to dance for his diversion, the magpie to tell his fortune, and all were enjoined to contribute something to the entertainment of the little stranger in his new apartments. And tis inconceivable how busy they were in the execution of these trifles, with all their spirits in a hurry and their whole souls laid out upon them. One would have imagined, after the extraordinary tenderness with which our hero had been treated by Lady Tempest, he must have felt great regret and concern at the loss of her. But, I am sorry to say, he had no sooner dined and felt himself snug in a new apartment that he entirely forgot his former mistress. Here I know not how to excuse his behavior. Had he been a man, one should not have wondered to find him guilty of ingratitude, a vice deeply rooted in the nature of that wicked animal but that a dog, a creature famous for fidelity, should so soon forget his former friend and benefactress is, I confess, quite unaccountable, and I would willingly draw a veil over this part of his conduct if the veracity of a historian did not oblige me to relate it. End of Book One, Chapter Eight Recording by Richard Kilmer Rio Medina, Texas Book One, Chapter Nine of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Nine. What the reader will know if he reads it. The father of this little brood, who are now in possession of our hero, was Captain Vincent of the Guards, 
a gentleman whose character will cost us no long description. Captain Vincent of the Guards was an exceedingly handsome man, about thirty years old, tall and well-proportioned in his limbs, but so entirely devoted to the contemplation of his own pretty person that he never detached his thoughts one moment from the consideration of it. Conscious of being a favorite of the ladies, among whom he was received always with eyes of affection, he thought the charms of his figure irresistible wherever he came, and seemed to show himself in all public places as an object of public admiration. You saw forever in his looks a smile of assurance, complacency, and self-applause. He appeared always to be wondering at his own accomplishments, and especially when he made a survey now and then of his dress and limbs. "'Twas as much to say to his company, "'Gentlemen and ladies, look on me if you can, without admiration. The reputation of two or three affairs, which same had given him with women of fashion, still contributed to increase his vanity, and authorized him, as he thought, to bestow more time and pains on the beautifying and adoring so successful a figure. In short, after many real or pretended amours, which made him insufferably vain, he married at last a celebrated town beauty, a woman of quality, who was in all respects equal to and worthy of such a husband. Lady Betty Vincent, the wife of this gentleman, was one of those haughty nymphs of quality who presume so much on the merit of a title that they never trouble themselves to acquire any other. She was proud, expensive, insolent, and unmannerly to her inferiors, vain of her rank, and still vainer of her person, full of extravagant airs, and though exceedingly silly, conceited of an imaginary wit and smartness. As she set out in life with a full persuasion that her prodigious beauty, merit, and accomplishments must soon procure her the title of her grace, she rejected several advantageous matches that offered, because they did not in all points come up to the height of her ambition. At length, finding her charms begin to decay, in a fit of lust, disappointed pride, and opposition to her mother, with whom she had then a quarrel, she patched up a marriage with Captain Vincent of the Guards, contrary to the advice and remonstrances of all her friends and relations. As the captain had no revenue besides the income of his commission, and her ladyship's fortune did not exceed seven thousand pounds, it may be concluded, when the honeymoon of love was over, this agreeable couple did not find the matrimonial fetters sit perfectly easy upon them. To retrench in any article, they found it impossible. To retire into the country, still more impossible. That was horrors, death, and despair. Her ladyship could not hear of such a thing with patience. She was ready to swoon at the mention of it. And indeed the captain, who was equally attached to London, never made the proposal in earnest. What then could they do in these embarrassing circumstances? Why, they took a little house in Hedge Lane, near the bottom of the Haymarket, which, being in the center of public diversions, served to keep them a little in countenance, and there they supported their spirits as well as they could, with reflecting that they still lived in the world, though their apartments were not so commodious as they could wish. Fettered pride is sure to turn into peevishness, and spleen is the daughter of mortified vanity. Finding themselves cramped with want, they grew uneasy, discontented, jealous of each other's extravagance, and were scarce ever alone without reproaching one another on the article of expense. The lady pouted at the captain for going to White's, and the captain recriminated on his wife for playing at brag and then followed a long contention, which of them spent the most money. To complete their misfortunes, her ladyship took to breeding, which introduced a thousand new expenses, and they must absolutely have starved in the midst of pride and vanity, had they not been seasonably relieved now and then by some handsome presents from Lady Betty's mother, my old lady Harridan, 
who was still alive and in the possession of a considerable jointure. The devotion which the captain paid to his beautiful figure has already been described, nor was her ladyship one jot behind him in idolizing and adoring her own charms. She prided herself in a more particular manner on the lovely bloom and charming delicacy of her complexion, which had procured her the envy of one sex and the admiration of the other, though perhaps if her enviers and admirers had known the following little story, both these passions would have considerably abated in them. It was our hero's custom, whenever he came into a new family, to gratify his curiosity as soon as possible with a general survey of the house. On his arrival here, his little owners were so fond of him the first day that they lugged him about in their arms and never permitted him to stray one moment out of their sights. But being left more at his own liberty the next morning, he thought it was then a convenient time for making his tour. After examining all the rooms above ground, he descended intrepidly into the kitchen and began to look about sharp for breakfast. For to say the truth, he had hitherto met with very thin commons in his new apartments. At last a blue and white dish, which stood on the dresser, presented itself to his eye. This immediately he determined to be lawful prey, and perceiving nobody present to interrupt him, he boldly made a spring at it. But happening unluckily to leap against the dish, down it came, and its contents ran about the kitchen. Scarce had this happened when my lady's maid appeared below stairs, and began to scream out in a very shrill accent, "'Why, who has done this now? I'll be whipped if this audacious little dog has not been, and thrown down my lady's backside's breakfast, after which she fell very severely on the cook, who now entered the kitchen, and began to reprimand her in a very authoritative tone for not taking more care of her dressers. But let the apothecary, added she, come and mix up his nastiness himself, and he will, for deuce fetch me if I'll wait on her ladyship's backside in this manner. If she will have her clisters, let the clister-pipe doctor come and minister them himself, and not put me to her filthy offices. Oh, Lord bless us! Well, rather than be at all this pains for a complexion, I'd be as brown as a berry all my lifetime. The finest flowers, I have heard say, are raised from dung, and perhaps it may be so. I am sure tis so at our house, for my lady takes physic twice a week, and treats her backside with a clister once a fortnight, and all this to preserve a complexion. While the waiting gentlewoman was haranguing thus at the expense of her mistress, the captain's valet also came into the kitchen, and hearing his fellow-servant very loud and vociferous, inquired what was the matter. Matter, cries she, matter enough of conscience. Don't you see there that plaguy little devil of a dog has been and flung down my lady's backside's breakfast? Bless us, a prodigious disaster indeed, replied the valet. Why, what shall we do now, Mrs. Minkin? I'm afraid your lady's complexion will want its bloom today. Hang her complexion, said Abigail. I wish her complexion was at the bottom of her own closed stool. She need be so generous to her backside indeed. I am sure she is not so over and above generous to her servants and her trades folks. True, cries the valet. If she would treat us with a breakfast now and then, as well as her backside, methinks it would not be amiss, for deuce take me, if I ever saw such housekeeping in any family that ever I lived in in my days. They dress plaguy fine, both of them, and cut a figure abroad, while their servants are starving at home. Yes, yes, said Mrs. Minikin. Tis all show and no substance at our house. There's your pretty master, the captain, has been smugging up his pretty face and cleaning his teeth for this hour before the looking-glass this morning. I wonder he does not clister for a complexion, too. Though, thank heaven, he's coxcomb enough already, and wants no addition to his pride. He seems to think that no woman can look him in the face without falling in love with him, with his black solitaire, and his white teeth, and his frizzled hair, and his fopperies. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us. Well, every one to their liking. 
but hang me if I would not marry a monkey as soon as such a powdered scaramouche, were I a woman of quality. Get out, you little nasty devil of a dog. Hang me if I won't brain you, and let the little vixens, your mistresses, say what they please. Having said this, she set out full of rage in pursuit of poor Pompey, who took to his feet with great precipitation and fled for his life. But not being nimble enough, he was overtaken and smarted severely for the trespass he had committed. To say the truth, he soon began to find himself very unhappily situated in this family. For wretched are all those animals that become the favorites of children. At first, indeed, he suffered only the barbarity of their kindness, and was persecuted with no other cruelties than what arose from their extravagant love of him. But when the date of his favor began to expire, and it did not continue long, he was then taught to feel how much severer their hate could be than their fondness. He had indeed, from the first, two or three dreadful presages of what might happen to him, for he had seen with his own eyes the two kittens, his playfellows, drown for some misdemeanor that they had been guilty of, and the magpie's head chopped off with the greatest passion for daring to peck a piece of plum cake that lay in the window without permission which instances of cruelty were sufficient to warn him, if he had had any foresight, of what might afterwards happen to him. But he was not let long to entertain himself with conjectures before he felt in person and in reality the mischievous disposition of these little tyrants. Sometimes they took it into their heads that he was full of fleas, and then he was soused in a tub of water till he was almost dead, in order to kill the vermin that inhabited the hair of his body. At other times he was set on his hinder legs with a book before his eyes, and ordered to read his lesson, which, not being able to perform, they whipped him till he howled, and then chastised him the more for daring to be sensible of pain. Much of this treatment did he undergo, often wishing himself restored to the arms of Lady Tempest, when fortune, taking pity of his calamities, once more resolved to change his lodgings and deliver him from this house of inquisition. End of Book One, Chapter Nine Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Book One, Chapter Ten of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lap Dog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Ten A Matrimonial Dispute. Lady Betty Vincent had a mother still living, as we are hinted in the preceding chapter, who, having worn out her life in vanity, cards, and all sorts of luxury, was now turned Methodist at seventy, and thought, by presenting heaven with the dregs of her age, to atone for all the riot and lasciviousness of her youth. For this purpose she had renounced all public diversions, put herself under the tuition of the two great field-preaching apostles, and was become one of the warmest votaries of that prevailing sect. But besides the self-mortification she was pleased to undergo, her ladyship had likewise an additional stratagem to procure her pardon above, which she thought impossible to fail her. And this was to take her eldest granddaughter out of the temptations of a wicked seducing age into her own family, and breed her up a Methodist the merit of which laudable action she hoped would compensate all her own miscarriages and effectually restore her to the divine favor. Having thus laid the scheme of compounding matters with heaven and making the virtues of the granddaughter balance, as it were, and set off the sins of the grandmother, she now thought only of putting it in execution. In the first place she communicated her design to the two apostles, and the moment she was assured of their approbation, she dispatched a message to her daughter, desiring an hour's conversation with her the first time she was at leisure. Lady Betty, who had great dependence on her mother, did not fail to answer the summons, and was with her very early the next morning. 
so very early, that the clock had but just struck one, which she said was an instance of her uncommon filial obedience. It may be imagined the two ladies soon came to agreement, Lady Betty being as glad to get rid of a charge as Lady Harridan to acquire a companion, which she represented as the motive that induced her to take her granddaughter into her family. Matters being thus settled, Lady Betty returned home to dinner, where she observed a sullen silence till the cloth was removed and the servants were carrying away the last things. Then it was that she pleased to open her mouth and bade one of the footmen, "'Tell Menekin to get Sally's clothes and linen packed up against the evening.' There happened at this time to be a miff subsisting between her ladyship and the captain, and they had gloated at one another for several days without exchanging a word. She did not therefore vouchsafe to ask her husband's consent in the step she was taking, nor even to inform him of it in direct terms, but left him to extract it as well as he could from this oblique message which she sent to her maid. The captain, who saw plainly that some mystery was contained under these orders, had at first a mind to be revenged by affecting not to hear them, but curiosity prevailing over his resentment, he submitted at length to ask whither his daughter was going. "'Why, if you will spend all your life at White's, and lose all your money in play,' replied the lady, with an air of disdain, "'I must dispose of my children as well as I can, I think.' "'But what connection is there in the name of God?' said the captain, "'between my playing at White's, and you're packing up your daughter's clothes. Unless perhaps you are going to send your daughter to the foundling hospital. Yes, perhaps I am, cries she with a toss of her head. If one can't maintain one's children at home, they must e'en come upon the parish, and there's an end of it. Still the captain remained unenlightened. Not a ray of information transpired through these dark speeches, and indeed there seemed to be no likelihood of eclaircissement for in this manner they continued to play at cross-purposes with one another for several minutes. At last, his patience being utterly exhausted, he insisted very earnestly, and somewhat angrily, to know what was going to be done with his daughter. "'Why, Mamma has a mind to take the girl to live with her, if you must know,' replied her ladyship, "'and that is going to be done with your daughter. If you will get children without being able to maintain them, you may be thankful, methinks, to find there is somebody in the world that will take them off your hands. "'Oh, madam,' cries the captain, "'as to the article of begetting children, I apprehend your ladyship to be full as guilty as I am, and therefore that is out of the question. But as to your mamma's taking them off our hands, devil take me if I am not exceedingly obliged to her for it. Your mamma is welcome to take them all if she pleases.' I only wanted to know what was going to be done with the girl, and now I am most perfectly satisfied, which he uttered with the most taunting pronunciation in the world. There is nothing so exceedingly provoking as a sneer to people enraged and inflamed with pride. The captain perceived the effect it had, and resolving to pursue his triumph, My dear, added he, to be sure the prudent care you are taking to provide for your children is highly commendable but I am afraid your mamma will debauch the girl with religion. She'll teach her perhaps to whine and cant, and say her prayers under the godly Mr. Whitefield. Lady Betty had never in her life shown the least regard for her mother. She had married in direct opposition to her will, and partly out of revenge because she happened at the time to have a quarrel with her, and knew her disinclination to the match. But now so much was she galled with the captain's raillery, that she gladly seized on any thing which offered as a handle of reproach. With rage therefore sparkling in her eyes and indignation glowing all over her face, she cried out, How dare you ridicule my mamma? If mamma has a mind to be an old doting idiot and change her religion, does it become you of all people to reproach her with it? You have the greatest obligations to her, sir, and you may be ashamed to give yourself such airs. You ridicule my mamma? you of all people in the world. T'would have been well for me, I am sure, if I had taken Mamma's advice and never had you, for you know you brought nothing but your little beggarly commission, and what is the income of a little beggarly commission? Tis not sufficient to furnish one's pincushion with pins. And who, pray, was you when I had you? You know you was no blood or family, and yet you pretend to ridicule my Mamma. You of all people!' 
You! If it was not for Mamma now, you would starve. You and all your brats would starve with want. When a dispute is grown to the highest, especially if it be a matrimonial one, all sober argument and cool reply are nothing better than words spoken against the wind. The judicious captain, therefore, instead of answering this invective of his spouse, very wisely, in my opinion, fell a-singing, which so exasperated the fair lady, and so utterly overset her patience, that she started from her chair, swept down two or three bottles and glasses with her hoop petticoat, flounced out of the room, and rushed upstairs ready to burst with spite and indignation. All the while this dispute was passing the parlour, our hero was the subject of as fierce a one among his little owners, or rather tormentors, in another room. For as the eldest girl was going into a different family, it was necessary they should make a separation of their playthings, and our hero, being incapable of division, unless they had carved him out into shares, a warm debate arose concerning him, both sides obstinately refusing to waive their pretensions. This perhaps may seem a little wonderful to the reader, who has been informed that they were all long ago grown tired of him, but let him consider the tempers of this little family, begotten in spleen, peevishness, and pride, and I believe he will not think it unnatural, after the recent example he has seen of their parents, that a spirit of opposition should make them contend with the greatest vehemence for a matter of the most absolute indifference to them. This was in reality the cause of their contention, and they would soon have gone together by the ears had not their mamma appeared to decide the question in favor of her eldest girl, whose claim, she said, was indisputable, from the circumstance of her finding him in the park. Lady Betty was hardly yet recovered from her passions, but being now told that Lady Harridan's coach was waiting for her at the door, she composed her face as well as she could, and mounted into it, attended by her daughter and the hero of this history. End of chapter 10 Recording by Patty Cunningham Book 1, Chapter 11 of The History of Pompey the Little This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham The History of Pompey the Little or the life and adventures of a lapdog by francis coventry book one chapter eleven a stroke at the methodists they arrived at lady harridan's about seven o'clock in the evening and were immediately conducted upstairs to her lady's dining-room where they found a large company of women assembled on the first sight of so many ladies i believe our hero concluded he was got into some rout or drum such as he had often seen at lady tempest's Yet on the other hand, he knew not well how to reconcile many appearances with such a supposition. He saw no cards, he heard no laughing. The solemn faces of the servants who now and then appeared, the sober looks of the company, everything seemed to inform him that pleasure never could be the cause of this assembly. It was indeed a sisterhood of the godly, met together to bewail the vanities of human life and congratulate one another on their common good luck in breaking away from the enchantments of a sinful world. The causes which had converted them to Methodism were almost as various as the several characters of the converts. Some the ill success of their charms had driven to despair, others a consciousness of too great success had touched with repentance, and both these terminated in superstitious melancholy. Disappointed love and criminal amour, though opposite in nature, here wrought the same effects, thunder and lightning, ill-omened dreams, earthquakes, vapors, smallpox, all had their converts in this religious collection, but far the most part of them, like the noble president, were women fatigued and worn out in the vanities of life, the battered and superannuated jades of pleasure, who being grown sick of themselves and weary of the world, were now fled to Methodism merely as the newest sort of folly that had lately been invented species non omnibus una nec diversa tamen qualem desit esse sororum the appearance of lady betty in such a company as this was like a wasp's invading a nest of drones she was too spirited too much dressed too worldly to be agreeable to them and they in return gave as little pleasure to her in short she very soon found herself out of her element 
and after sitting a few minutes only, rose up and began to make her departing curtsies. "'Why, sure you are not going, Lady Betty,' cried the mother. "'I presumed upon your staying the evening with us.' "'No, thank you,' replied the daughter. "'Another time, if you please, mamma. "'But you seem to be all too religious abundantly for me at present. "'I can't afford to say my prayers above once a week, mamma, "'and tis not Sunday to-day, according to my calculation. "'For shame, for shame, my dear. "'Don't indulge such levity of discourse.' said Lady Harridan. Let me prevail on you to stay, Lady Betty, and I am sure we shall make a convert of you. There is that tranquillity, my dear, that composure, that serenity of mind attending Methodism, that I am sure no person who judges fairly can refuse to embrace it. Pleasure, my dear, is all vanity and folly, an unquiet, empty, transient delusion. Believe me, child, I have experienced it. I have proved the vanity of it. And depend upon it, sooner or later you will come to the same way of thinking. Very likely I may, replied Lady Betty. But you'll give me leave to grow a little wickeder first, won't you, Mamma? I have not sins enough at present. I am not quite wicked enough as yet to turn Methodist. Fie, fie, don't encourage that licentiousness of conversation, cries the old lady. You shock me, my dear, beyond measure. You make my blood run cold again to hear you. But let me beseech you to stay, and you'll have the pleasure of hearing the dear Whitefield talk on this subject. We expect him every minute. Do you? says Lady Betty. Then upon my honour I'll hie me away this moment, for I'll promise you, Mamma, I have not the least desire or curiosity to hear the dear Whitefield. And so, your servant, ladies, your servant. Having said this, she brushed downstairs and left the company astonished at her profaneness. As Lady Betty went out, the dear Whitefield and his brother Apostle entered, who were the only people wanting to complete this religious collection. On their appearance the mysteries began, and they all fell to lamenting the wickedness of their former lives, the great guilt of loving cards, the exceeding sinfulness of having been fond of dancing in their youthful days, were enumerated as sins of the most atrocious quality, whilst other crimes, of a nature perhaps not inferior to these, were very prudently kept out of sight. Then Mr. Whitefield began to preach the history of his life, and related the many combats and desperate encounter he has had with the devil, how Satan confined him to his chamber once at college, and permitted him not to eat for several days together, with ten thousand other malicious pranks played by the Prince of Darkness on the body of that unfortunate adventurer, if we may believe his own journals. He proceeded in the next place to describe the many miracles which heaven has wrought in his favor, how it ceased to rain once, and the sun broke out on a sudden, just as he was beginning to preach on the Kennington Common, with a million more equally stupendous prodigies, which show how great an interest heaven takes in all the actions of that religious mountebank. When the company had enjoyed enough of the scriptural and suspicious conversation, they proceeded in the last place to singing of psalms and this concluded the superstition of the evening. All the former part of the time, our hero sat very composed and quietly before the fire. But when they began to chant their hymns, surprised and astonished with the novelty of this proceeding, he fell to howling with the most sonorous accent, and in a key much higher than any of the screaming sisters. Nor was this all, for presently afterwards, Mr. Whitefield, attempting to stroke him, he snarled and bit his finger, which being the self-same indignity that Lucian formerly offered to the hand of a similar impostor, we thought it not beneath the dignity of this history to relate it. To say the truth, I believe he had taken some disgust to that exceeding pious gentleman, for besides these two instances of ill behavior, he was guilty of a much greater rudeness the next day to his works. Lady Harridan, as soon as she arose the next morning, sent for her little granddaughter immediately into her close, and made her repeat some long methodistical prayers, after which she heard her read several pages out of the Apostle's journal, and then they went to breakfast, but by mistake left poor Pompey shut up in the closet. The little prisoner scratched very impatiently to be released, and made various attempts to open the door, but not having the good fortune to succeed, he leapt upon the table and wantonly did his occasions upon the field preacher's memoirs, which lay open upon it. Whether this was done to express his contempt of the book, 
or merely from an incapacity of suppressing his needs, is hardly possible for us to determine. Though we are sensible how much it would exalt him in the reader's esteem to ascribe it to the former motive, and indeed it must be confessed that his choosing to drop his superfluities on so particular a spot may very well countenance such a suspicion. But unless we had the talents of Aesop to interpret the sentiments of brutes, it will forever be impossible to come at the truth of this important affair. However that be, Lady Harridan unfortunately returned to her close soon afterwards, and saw the crime he had been guilty of. Rage and indignation sparkled in her eyes. She rang her bell instantly with the greatest fury, and on the appearance of a footman, ordered him immediately to be hanged. His young mistress, whose love for him had long since cooled, and who besides feared her great-grandmama's resentment, did not think proper to oppose the sentence. He was had away, therefore, that moment to execution, which I dare say, courteous reader, thou art extremely glad to hear, as it would put a period to his history, and prevent thee from misspending any more of thy precious time. But, alas, thy hopes are in vain. Thy labors are not yet at an end. The footman, who happened to have some few grains of compassion in his nature, instead of obeying his lady's orders, sold him that day for a pint of porter to an alehouse keeper's daughter in Tyburn Road. Here then, gentle friend, if thou art tired, let me advise thee to desist and fall asleep, or if perchance thy spirits are fresh, and thou dost not yet begin to yawn, proceed on courageously, and thou wilt in good time arrive at the end of thy journey. End of chapter 11 Recording by Patty Cunningham Book 1, Chapter 12 of The History of Pompey the Little This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book 1, Chapter 12 The History of a Modish Marriage the description of a coffee-house, and a very grave political debate on the good of the nation. Pompey was sold, as we have just observed, to an alehouse keeper's daughter for the valuable consideration of a pint of porter. This amiable young lady was then on the point of marriage with a hackney coachman, and soon afterwards the nuptials were consummated to the great joy of the two ancient families, who were by this means sure of not being extinct. As soon as the ceremony was over at the fleet, the new married couple set out to celebrate their wedding at the old blue boar in the Tyburn Road, and the bride was conducted home at night, dead drunk, to her new apartments in a garret in Smithfield. This fashionable pair had scarce been married three days before they began to quarrel on a very fashionable subject. For the civil, well-bred husband, coming home one night from his station and expecting the cow-heels to have been ready for his supper, found his lodgings empty and his darling spouse abroad. At about eleven o'clock she came flouncing into the room, and telling him, with great gaiete de cour, that she had been at the play, began to describe the several scenes of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Judge if this was not provocation too great for a hackney coachman's temper. He fell to exercising his whip in a most outrageous manner, and she, applying herself no less readily to more desperate weapons, a most bloody fray ensued between them, in which the coachman had liked to have been stabbed with a penknife, and his fair spouse was obliged to keep her bed near a month with the bruises she received in this horrid recounter. Pompey now most sensibly felt the ill effects of his former luxury, which served only to aggravate the miseries of his present condition. The coarse fare he met with in roofless garrets or cellars underground were but indelicate morsels to one who had formerly lived on ragouts and fricassees, and he found it very difficult to sleep on hard and naked floors, who had been used to have his limbs cushioned up on sofas and couches. But luckily for him, his favor with his mistress procured him the hatred of his master, who sold him a second time to a nymph of Billingsgate for a pennyworth of oysters. His situation, indeed, was not mended for the present by this means, 
but it put him in a way to be released the sooner from a course of life so ill-suited to his constitution or his temper. For this delicate fisherwoman, as she went her rounds, carried him one evening to a certain coffee-house near the temple, where the lady behind the bar was immediately struck with his beauty, and with no great difficulty prevailed on the gentle water-nymph to surrender him for a dram of brandy. His fortunes now began to wear a little better aspect, and he spent his time here agreeably enough, in listening to the conversations and disputes that arose in the coffee-room among people of all denominations. For here assembled wits, critics, templars, politicians, poets, country squires, grave tradesmen, and sapient physicians. The little consistories of wit claimed his first attention, being a dog of a natural turn for humor, and he took a pleasure to hear young templars criticize the works of Shakespeare, call Mr. Garrick to account every evening for his action, extol the beauty of actresses, and the reputation of whores. When he was tired of the clubs of humor, he would betake himself to another table, and listen to a junto of politicians, who used to assemble here in an evening, with the most public-spirited views, namely, to settle the affairs of the nation, and point out the errors of the ministry. Here he has heard the government arraigned in the most abusive manner, for what the government never performed or thought of, and the lowest ribaldry of a dirty newspaper, cried up as the highest touches of Attic irony. He has heard sea-fights condemned by people who never saw the sea even through a telescope, and the general of an army called to account for his disposition of a battle by men whose knowledge of war never reached beyond a cock-match. A curious conversation of this kind passed one day in his hearing, which I shall beg leave to relate as a little specimen of coffee-house oratory. It happened at the end of the late rebellion and the chief orator of the club began as usual with asserting that the rebellion was promoted by the ministry for some private ends of their own. "'What was the reason,' said he, "'of its being disbelieved so long? Why was our army absent at such a critical juncture? I should be glad to hear any man answer me these questions. They may think, perhaps, they are acting all this while in secret, and applaud themselves for their cunning.' but I believe I know more than they would wish me to know. Thank God I can see a little, if I please to open my eyes. Zunes, old Walpole, is behind the curtain still, notwithstanding his resignation, and the old game is playing over again, whatever they may pretend. There was a correspondence between Walpole and Fleury, to my knowledge, and they projected between them all the evils that have since happened to the nation." The company all seemed to agree with this eloquent gentleman's sentiments, and one of them ventured to say he believed the army was sent into Flanders on purpose to be out of the way at the time of the insurrection. Zounds, said the orator, I believe you are in the right, and the wind blew them over against their inclinations. Pox! What made what do you call em's army disperse as it did? Let anybody answer me that if they are able. Don't you think they had orders from above to run away? "'By God, I do if you don't, and I believe I could prove it, too, if I was to set about it. Besides, if they have any desire of preventing future invasions from France, why don't they send out and burn all their shipping? Why don't they send out Verne with a strong fleet, and let him burn all their shipping? I warrant him, if he had a proper commission in his pocket, he would not leave a harbor or a ship in France. But they know they don't dare do it for fear of discoveries.' They are in league with the French ministry. Or else, dam, can anything be so easy as to take and burn all of the shipping in France? A gentleman who had hitherto sat silent at the table replied with a sneer on his countenance, No, sir, nothing in the world could be so easy except talking about it. This drew the eyes of the company upon him, and every one began to wink at his neighbor when the orator resumed the discourse in the following manner. Talk, sir? No faith we are come to that pass that we don't dare talk nowadays. Things are come to such a pass that we don't dare open our mouths. Sir, said the gentleman, I think you have been talking already with great licentiousness. And let me add, too, with great indecency on a very serious subject. Zounds, sir, said the orator, 
May not I have the liberty of speaking my mind freely upon any subject that I please? Why, we don't live in France, sir. You forget, surely. This is England. This is honest old England, sir. Not a Mahometan empire. Though God knows how long we shall continue so in the way we are going on. And yet, forsooth, we must not talk. Our mouths are to be sewed up as well as our purses taken from us. Here we are paying four shillings in the pound, and yet we must not speak our minds freely. Sir, said the gentleman, undoubtedly you may speak your mind freely, for the laws of your country oblige you not to speak treason, and the laws of good manners should dispose you to speak with decency and respect of your governors. You say, sir, we are come to that pass that we dare not talk. I protest that is very extraordinary. And if I was called upon to answer this declaration, I would rather say we are come to that pass nowadays, that we talk with more virulence and ill language than ever. We talk upon subjects which it is impossible we should understand, and advance assertions which we know to be false. Bold affirmations against the government are believed merely from a dint of assurance in which they are spoken, and the idlest jargon often passes for the soundest reasoning. Give me leave to say, you, sir, are a living example of the lenity of that government which you are abusing for want of lenity, and your own practice, in the strongest manner, confutes your assertions. But I beg we may call another subject. Here the orator, having nothing more to reply, was resolved to retire from a place where he could no longer make a figure. Wherefore, flinging down his reckoning and putting on his hat with great vehemence, he walked away muttering surly to himself, Things are come to a fine pass, truly, if people may not have the liberty of talking. The rest of the company separated soon afterwards, all of them harboring no very favorable opinion of the gentleman who had taken the courage to stand up in defense of the government. Some imagined he was a spy. Others concluded he was a writer of the gazettes, and the most part were contented with only thinking him a fool. This angry orator was no sooner got home to his family and seated in his elbow-chair at supper than he began to give vent to the indignation he had been collecting. Sounds, said he, I have been called to account for my words to-night. I have been told by a jack and apes at the coffee-house that I must not say what I please against the government. Talk with decency, indeed! A fart of decency! Let them act with decency if they have a mind to stop people's mouths. Talk with decency, damn em all. I'll talk what I please, and no king or minister on earth shall control me. Let em behead me if they have a mind, as they did Balmoreno and the other fellow, that died like a coward. Must I be catechized by a little sycophant that kisses the aunt of a minister? What is an Englishman that dares not utter his sentiments freely? talk with decency. I wish I had kicked the rascal out of the coffee-house, and I will if I ever meet him again, don't. Pox! We are come to a fine pass if every little pratting, pragmatical jackanapes is to contradict a true-born Englishman. While his wife and daughters sat trembling at the vehemence of his speeches, yet not daring to speak for fear of drawing his rage on themselves, he began to curse them for their silence and addressing himself to his wife, "'Why dost not speak?' cries he. "'What? I suppose I shall have you telling me by and by, too, that I must talk with decency.' "'My dear,' said the wife, with great humility, "'I know nothing at all of the matter.' "'No,' cries he, "'I believe not. But you might know to dress a supper, though, and be damned to you. Here's nothing I can eat, according to custom.' Pox, a man may starve with such a wife at the head of his family. When the cloth was removed and he was preparing to fill his pipe, unfortunately he could not find his tobacco stopper, which again set his collar at work. Go upstairs, Moll, he said to one of his daughters, and feel in my old breeches pocket. Damn, I believe that scoundrel at the coffee-house has robbed me with his decency. Why dost not stir, girl? What? hast got the cramp in thy toes? Why, papa, said the girl flippantly, I'm going as fast as I can. Upon which, immediately he threw a bottle at her head, and proceeding from invectives to blows, 
he beat his wife, kicked his daughters, swore at his servants, and after all this went reeling up to bed with curses in his mouth against the tyranny of government. Nothing can be more common than examples in this way of people who preside over their families with the most arbitrary brutal severity, and yet are ready on all occasions to abuse the government for the smallest exertion of its power. To say the truth, I scarce know a man who is not a tyrant in miniature over the circle of his own dependents, and I have observed those in particular to exercise the greatest lordship over their inferiors who are most forward to complain of oppression from their superiors. Happy is it for the world that this coffee-house statesman was not born a king, for one may very justly apply to him the line of Marshall. Hi me! Si fueras tu leo, cualis eres? End of chapter 12 Recording by Patty Cunningham Book One, Chapter Thirteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One. Chapter Thirteen. A description of Councillor Tanturian. But among the many people who frequented this coffee house, Pompey was delighted with nobody more than with the person of Councillor Tanturian, who used to crawl out once a week to read all the public papers from Monday to Monday at the moderate price of a penny. His dress and character were both so extraordinary as will excuse a short digression upon them. He set out originally with a very humble fortune at the temple, not without hopes, however, of arriving, some time or other, at the chancellor's seat, but, having tried his abilities once or twice at the bar, to little purpose, nature soon whispered in his ear that he was never designed for an orator. He attended the judges, indeed, after this, through two or three circuits, but finding his gains by no means equivalent to his expenses, he thought it most prudent to decline the noisy forum and content himself with giving advice to clients in a chamber either his talents here also were deficient or same had not sufficiently divulged his merit but his chamber was seldom disturbed with visitors and he had few occasions to envy the tranquillity of a country life according to the lawyer in horace agriculam laudat juris lugumque peritus sub galli cantum consolatur ubi ostia pulsat his temper grew soured and unsocial by miscarriages and the narrowness of his fortune obliging him to a strict frugality he soon degenerated into avarice the rust of money is very apt to infect the soul and people whose circumstances condemn them to economy in time grow misers from very habit this was the case with councillor tanturian who, having quite discarded the relish of pleasure, and finding his little pittance, by that means, more than adequate to his expenses, resolved to apply the overplus to the laudable purposes of usury. This noble occupation he had followed a long time, and by it accumulated a sum of ten thousand pounds, which his heart would not suffer him to enjoy, though he had neither relation or friend to leave it to at his death. He lived almost constantly alone, in a dirty chamber, denying himself every comfort of life, and half-starved for want of sustenance. Neither love, nor ambition, nor joy disturbed his repose. His passions all centered in money, and he was a kind of savage within doors. The furniture of his person was not less curious than his character. At home, indeed, he wore nothing but a greasy flannel cap about his head and a dingy nightgown about his body. But when he went abroad, he arrayed himself in a suit of black, a full twenty years standing, and very like in color to what is worn by undertakers at a funeral. His peruke, which had once adorned the head of a judge in the reign of Queen Anne, spread copiously over his back and down his shoulders. 
by his side hung an aged sword long rusted in its scabbard and his black silk stockings had been so often darned with a different material that like sir john cutler's they were not metamorphosed into black worsted stockings such was councillor tantorian who once a week came to read the newspapers at the coffee-house where pompey lived a dog of any talents for humour could not help being diverted with his appearance and our hero found great pleasure in playing him tricks in which he was secretly encouraged by every body in the coffee-room at first indeed he never saw him without barking at him as at a monster just dropped out of the moon but when time had a little reconciled him to his figure he entertained the company every time he came with some new prank at the councillor's expense once he ran away with his spectacles at another time he laid violent teeth on his shirt which hung out of his breeches and shook it to the great diversion of all beholders but what occasioned more laughter than anything was a trick that follows tantorian had been tempted one day by two old acquaintances to indulge his genius at a tavern where he complained highly of the expensiveness of the dinner though it consisted only of a beefsteak and two fowls that nothing might be lost he took an opportunity unobserved by the company to slip the leg of a pullet into his pocket intending to carry it home for his supper at night in his way he called at the coffee-house where little pompey playing about him as usual unfortunately happened to scent the provision in the councillor's pocket tantorian meanwhile was so deeply engaged with his newspaper that he never attended to the motions of the dog who getting slyly behind him thrust his head into the pocket and boldly seizing the spoils displayed them in triumph to the sight of the whole room the poor councillor could not stand the laugh but retired home in a melancholy mood vexed at the discovery and more vexed at the loss of his supper but these diversions were soon interrupted by a most unlucky accident and our hero unfortunate as he has hitherto been is now going to suffer a turn of fate more grievous than any he yet has known following the maid one evening into the streets he unluckily missed her at the turning of an alley and happening to take a wrong way prowled out of his knowledge before he was aware he wandered about the streets for many hours in vain endeavouring to explore his way home in which distress his memory brought back the cruel chance that had separated him from his best mistress lady tempest and this reflection aggravated his misery beyond description at last a watchman picked him up and carried him to the watch-house where he spent his night in all the agonies of horror and despair for a watch-house as i dare say many of my readers can testify from experience is not the most agreeable place of repose either for dogs or men end of book one chapter thirteen book one chapter fourteen of the history of pompey the little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eugene smith the history of pompey the little or the life and adventures of a lapdog by francis coventry book one chapter fourteen a short chapter containing all the wit and all the spirit and all the pleasure of modern young gentlemen as he was here abandoning himself to lamentation and despair some other watchmen brought in two fresh prisoners to bear him company in his confinement who i am sorry to say it were two young lords they were extremely disordered both in their dress and understanding for champagne was not the only enemy they had encountered that evening one of them had lost his coat and waistcoat the other his bag and peruke all but a little circular lock of hair which grew to his forehead and now hanging over his eyes added not a little to the drollery of his figure the generous god of the grape had cast such a mist over their understandings 
that they were insensible at first of the place of honour they were promoted to. But at length one of them, a little recovering his wits, cried out, What the devil place is this? A bloody house or a Presbyterian meeting house? Neither, sir, answered a watchman, but the round house. Oh, pox, said his lordship. I thought you'd been a dissenting parson, old Greybeard, and was going to preach against whoring, for you must know, old fellow, I'm confounded in for it. But what privilege have you, sir, to carry a man of honor to the roundhouse? I said the other, what right has such an old fornicator as thou art to interrupt the pleasures of men of quality? May not a nobleman get drunk without being disturbed by a pack of rascals in the streets? Gentlemen, answered the watch, we are no rascals, but servants of His Majesty King George, and His Majesty requires us to take up all people that commit disorderly riots in His Majesty's streets. You lie, you scoundrels, said one of their lordships. Tis the prerogative of men of fashion to do what they please, and I'll prosecute you for a breach of privilege. Damn you, my lord, I'll hold you fifty pound. That old prig there in the great coat is a cuckold, and he shall be judge himself. How many eyes has your wife got, old fellow? One or two? Well, well, said the watchman, your honors may abuse us as much as you please, but we know we are doing our duty, and we will perform it in the king's name. Your duty, you rascal, cried one of these men of honor, is immediately to fetch us a girl and a dozen of champagne. If you'll perform that, I'll say you're as honest an old son of a whore as ever lay with an oyster woman. My dear Fanny, if I had but you here and a dozen of Ryan's claret, I should esteem this roundhouse a palace. Curse me if I don't love to sleep in a roundhouse sometimes. It gives a variety to life and relieves one of the insipidness of a soft bed. Well said, my hero, answered his companion. And these old scoundrels shall carry us before my lord mayor to-morrow for the humor of the thing. Pox take him. I buy all my tallow candles of his lordship, and therefore I'm sure he'll use me like a man of honor. In such a kind of rhodomontade did these illustrious persons consume their night, and principally in laying wagers, which at present is the highest article of modern pleasure every particular of human life being reduced by the great calculators of chances to the condition of a bet. But nothing is esteemed a more laudable topic of wagering than the lives of eminent men, which, in the elegant language of Newmarket, is called running lives. That is to say, a bishop against an alderman, a judge against a keeper of a tavern, a member of parliament against a famous boxer, and in this manner all people's lives are wagered out with proper allowances for their ages, infirmities, and distempers. Happy the nation that can produce such ingenious accomplished spirits. These two honorable peers had been spending their evening at a tavern with many others, and when the rational particle was thoroughly drowned in claret, one of the company leaping from his chair cried out, Who will do anything? upon which a resolution was immediately taken to make a sally into the streets and drink champagne upon the horse at Charing Cross. This was no sooner projected than executed, and they performed a great number of heroical exploits too long to be mentioned in this work, but we hope some future historian will arise to immortalize them for the sake of posterity. After this was over, they resolved to scour the streets and perceiving a light in a cellar underground, our two heroes magnanimously descended into that subterranean cave in quest of adventures. There they found some hackney coachmen enjoying themselves with porter and tobacco, whom they immediately attacked, and offered to box the two sturdiest champions of the company. The challenge was accepted in a moment, and whilst our heroes were engaged, the rest of the coachmen chose to make off with their clothes, which they thought no inconsiderable booty. In short, these gentlemen of pleasure and high life were heartily drubbed and obliged to retreat with shame from the cellar of battle 
leaving their clothes behind them as spoils at the mercy of the company soon afterwards they were taken by the watch being too feeble to make resistance and conducted to the roundhouse where they spent their night in the manner already described the next morning they returned home in chairs new dressed themselves and then took their seats in parliament to enact laws for the good of their country end of book one chapter fourteen Book One, Chapter Fifteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sudeshna. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Fifteen. Chapter Fifteen. Our hero falls into great misfortunes. When the watchman had discharged himself in the morning of these honourable prisoners, he next bethought himself of poor Pompey, who had fallen into his hands in a more inoffensive manner. Him he presented that day to a blind beggar of his acquaintance, who had lately lost his dog and wanted a new guide to conduct him about the streets. Here our hero fell into the most desponding meditations. And was this misery, thought he, reserved in store to complete the series of my misfortunes? Am I destined to lead about the dark footsteps of a blind, decrepit, unworthy beggar? Must I go daggle through the streets with a rope about my neck linking me to a wretch that is the scorn of human nature? Oh, that a rope were fixed about my neck, indeed, for a nobler purpose, and that were here to end a dreadful, tormenting existence! Can I bear to hear the sound of— Pray, remember the poor blind beggar? I, who have conversed with lords and ladies, who have slept in the arms of the fairest beauties— and lived on the choicest dainties that London could afford. Cruel, cruel fortune, when will thy persecution cease? Yet, to say the truth, his condition was not so deplorable upon trial, as it appeared in the prospect, for though he was condemned to travel through dirty streets all day long in quest of charity, at night both he and his master fared sumptuously enough on their gains, and many a lean projector or starving poet might envy the suppers of this blind beggar. He seldom failed to collect four or five shillings in a day, and used to sit down to his hot meals with as much stateliness as a peer could to a regular entertainment and dessert. I have heard a story of a cripple, who used constantly to apply for alms at Hyde Park Corner, where a gentleman, then just recovered from a dangerous fit of sickness, never failed to give him sixpence every morning, as he passed by in his chariot for the air. A servant of this gentleman's going by chance one day into an alehouse discovered the self-same beggar sitting down to a breast of veal, with some more of the fraternity, and heard him raving at the landlord, because the burr was gone and there was no lemon ready to squeeze over it, all of them threatening to leave the house if their dinners were not served up with more regularity and respect. The footman informed his master of this extraordinary circumstance, and next morning, when the pampered hypocrite applied for arms as usual, the gentleman put his head out of the chariot and told him with great indignation, No, sir, I can eat wheel without lemon. After our hero had lived in this condition some months in London, his blind master set out for Bath, whither it seems he always resorted in the public seasons, not for the sake of playing at Eo, it may be imagined, nor yet for the pleasure of being taken out by the accomplished Mr. Nash to dance a minuit at a ball but with the hopes of a plentiful harvest among infirm people whom ill-health disposes to charity. The science of begging is reduced to certain principles of art, as well as other professions, and as sickness is apt to influence people with compassion, the objects of charity flock thither in great numbers, for wherever the carrion is there will be the crows be also. The many adventures that befell them on their journey, how terribly our hero was fatigued with travelling through miry highways, who had been used to ride in coaches and six, and how often he wished his blind tyrant would drop dead with an apoplexy, shall be left to the reader's imagination. Suffice it to say, that in about three weeks or a month's time, they arrived at the end of their journey, and the beggar readily groped out his way to a certain alehouse, which he always favoured with his company, where the landlord received him with great respect, professing much satisfaction to find his honour so well in health. By this the reader will perceive that he was a beggar of some distinction. If our hero made any reflection, he could not help being surprised at such civility. 
paid to such person in such a place but how much greater reason had he for astonishment when on the evening of their arrival he saw a well-dressed woman enter the room and accost his master in the following terms papa how do you do you are welcome to bath the beggar no sooner heard her voice than he started from his chair and gave her a paternal kiss which the fair lady received with an air of scorn and indifference telling him he had poisoned her with his bushy beard when this ceremony was over she threw herself into an armchair and began to harangue in the following manner well papa so you are coming to bath at last i thought we should not have seen you this season and i have immediate necessity for a sum of money sure no mortal ever had such luck at cards as i have had you must let me have five or ten pound directly five or ten pound cries the beggar in amaze how in the devil's name should i come by five or ten pound come come no words cried the daughter for i absolutely must and will have it in spite of your teeth i know you are worth above a hundred pounds and what can you do with your money better than give it to me to make a figure in life with do you stick the men they are grown so plaguy modest or so plaguy stingy that really it is hardly worth coming to bath now in the seasons hang me if i've had a cull this twelve month but do you know old dad that brother jack's at the bath oh cries the beggar there is another of my plagues i shall have him dunning me for money too very soon i suppose for the devil can't answer the extravagancies of that fellow well he'll certainly come to be hanged at last that's my comfort and i think the sooner he swings the better it will be for his poor father and the whole kingdom hanged replied the lady no no jack is in no danger of hanging at present i assure you he is now the most accomplished modish admired young fellow at the bath the peculiar favourite of all the ladies and in a fair way of running off with a young heiress of considerable fortune let me see all that if you'll be speak a private room and have a little elegant supper ready at eleven o'clock to-morrow night for jack won't be able to get away from the room sooner than eleven i'll bring him to sup with you and you shall hear his history from his own mouth to this the old hypocrite her father readily consented and promised to provide something decent for them after which starting from a chair well papa said she you must excuse me at present for i expect company at my lodgings and so can't afford to waste any more time with you in this miserable dog hole of an alehouse having made this polite apology she flew to her chair which waited at the door and was conducted home with as much importance as if she had been a princess of the blood the next day the blind impostor attended by a hero went out on his pilgrimage and continued whining for charity and profaning the name of god till night after which he returned to his alehouse put on a better coat and got himself in readiness for the reception of his son and daughter at the hour appointed these illustrious personages entered the room and the conversation was opened by the son in the following easy strain old oh boy cries he seizing his father by the hand i am glad to see thee with all my heart well old fellow how does your crutch and blind eyes do what you continue still in the old canting hypocritical way i perceive pox take you i saw you hobbling through the streets to-day old miserable but you know i'm ashamed to take notice of you in public though i think i've thrown you down many a tester at the corner of a street without your knowing whom you was obliged to for such a piece of generosity sir i honour your generosity replied the beggar but pray thee jack they tell me you are going to be married to an heiress of great fortune is there any truth in the story here the beau sharper took a french snuff-box out of his pocket and having entertained his nose with a pinch of rapé replied as follows yes sir my unaccountable somewhat has had the good luck to make conquest of a little amorous tit with an easy moderate fortune of about fifteen thousand pounds <laughs> who does me the honour to dote on this person of mine to distraction but pray thee old bluebeard how didst thou come by this piece of intelligence from that fine lady your sister sir replied the beggar oh pox i thought so cries the beau bess can never keep anything in her but her teeth nor them either can you bess you understand me but as i was saying concerning this match yes sir i have the honour at present to be principal favourite of all the women at bath they are all dying with love of me and i may do what i please with any of them but i sir neglecting the rest have singled out a little amorous wanton with a trifling fortune of fifteen or twenty thousand pounds only whom i shall very soon whip into a chariot i believe and drive away to a parson lord cries the father if she did know what a thief she is going to marry why what then you old curmudgeon she would be the more extravagantly fond of me on that account 
"'Tis very fashionable, sir, for ladies to fall in love with highway men nowadays. They think it discovers a soul, a genius, a spirit in them, about the little prejudices of education. And I believe I could not do better than let her know that I have returned from transportation. But pray thee, old dame, what hast got for supper to-night? Nothing, I am afraid, that a gentleman of your fashion can condescend to eat, replied the beggar, for I have only ordered a dish of veal cutlets and a couple of roasted falls. Come, come, pray thee, don't pretend to droll, old blinker cries the son. But produce your musty supper as fast as you can, and then I'll treat you with a bottle of French claret. Come, let us be merry and set in for jovial evening. Pox! I have some little kind of sneaking regard for thee, for begetting me, notwithstanding your crutch and blind eyes. And I think I'm not altogether sorry to see thee. Here, drawer, landlord, bring up supper directly, you dog, or I'll set fire to your house. This extraordinary summons had the desired effect, and the supper being placed on the table, the three worthy guests sat down to it with great importance. The lady took upon her to manage the ceremonies, and asked her papa in the first place if she could help him to some veal cutlets, to which the answer was, if you please, madam, when she had served her father. She then performed the same office to herself, after which, twirling the dish round with a familiar air, I leave you, said she, to take care of yourself, Jack. Much mirth and pleasantry reigned at this peculiar meal, to the utter astonishment of the master of the house, who had never seen the like before. When supper was over, and they began to feel the inspiration of the clary, Jack, says the father, I think I know nothing of your history. Since you returned from transportation, suppose you should begin and entertain us with an account of your exploits? With all my heart, cries the son, I believe I shall publish my life one of these days, if ever I am driven to necessity. For I fancy it will make a very pretty neat duodecimo, and tis the fashion, you know, nowadays for all whores and rogues to entertain the world with their memoirs. Come, let us take another glass round to the health of my dear little charmer, and then I'll begin my adventures. Having so said, he filled out three bumpers, drank his toast to his knees, and then commenced his narration in the following manner. End of Book 1, Chapter 15 Recording by Sudeshna Book One, Chapter Sixteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sudeshna. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lap Dog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Sixteen. The History of a Highwayman. I think you have often told me, old father hypocrite, that you begat me under a hedge near Newbury in Berkshire. This, I confess, is not the most honourable way of coming into the world, but no man is answerable for his birth, and therefore what signifies prevarication? Alexander, I have heard, was the son of a flying dragon, and Romulus was suckled by a plaguy confounded wolf, as I have read in Hook's Roman history. And yet in time he grew to be a very pretty young fellow, and a king. But you are ignorant of these matters, both of you, and therefore I only play the fool to talk about them in such company. Well, sir, as soon as I was born, my mother, I suppose, wrapped me up in the dirty rags of an old rotten petticoat, and lugged me about behind her shoulders as an object to move compassion. In this agreeable situation, nuzzling behind the back of a lousy drab, excuse me, old fellow, for making so free with your concert, in this situation, I suppose, I visited all the towns in England. And it's amazing, I was not rippled with having my feet and limbs bundled up in such close confinement. But I kicked hard for liberty, and at length came out that easy, dégagé, jaunty young fellow of fashion, which you now behold me. My genius very early began to show itself, and before I was twelve years old, you know, I had acquired a great reputation for sleight of hand, which being reported to a great master of that science, he immediately took me under his care, and promised to initiate me into all the mysteries of the art. Thus I bade adieu to the dirty employment of pecking, left father and mother, and struck into a higher sphere of life. At first, indeed, I meddled only with petty larceny, and was sent out to try my hand on execution days at Tyburn, where, having acquitted myself with honour, I was quickly promoted to better business, and by that time I was fifteen began to make a great figure in the passages about the theatres. Many a gentleman's fob have I eased of the trouble of carrying a watch, and though it may look like vanity to say so, I believe I furnished more broker shops and peddlers' boxes than half the pickpockets in London besides. 
none of them all had so great a levy of travelling Jews to travel for buckles, seals, watches, tweezer cases, and the like as I had. But my chief dexterity was in robbing the ladies. There is a peculiar delicacy required in whipping one's hand up a lady's petticoats and carrying off her pockets, which few of them ever attained to with any success. That now was my glory, and that was my delight. I performed it to admiration, and outdid them all in this branch of the craft. I remember once a chambermaid of my acquaintance, a flame of mine, gave me notice that her young lady would be at play such a night with a pair of diamond buckles in her shoes. You may be sure I washed her into her coach, marked her into her box, and waited for her coming out, with some of the fraternity to assist me. At last, as soon as the play was over, out she came, tittering and laughing with her companions, who by good luck happened to be all of her own sex. This now was my time. I had her up in my arms in a moment, while one of my comrades whipped off her shoes with prodigious expedition. But my reason for telling the story is this. While I had her in my arms, let me die if I could help giving her a kiss, which hanged me if the little trembler did not seem to return, with her heart panting and breast heaving. Deuce take me! If I was not almost sorry afterwards to see her walking to her coach without any shoes upon her feet. Well, sir, this was my course of life for a few years. But ambition, you know, is a thing never to be satisfied, and having gained all the glory I could in this way, my next step of promotion was to the gaming tables. Here I played with great success a long while, and shared in the fleecing of many raw young quillies who had more money than wit. But one unfortunate night the devil, or my evil genius, carried me to a masquerade, and there, in the ill-omened habit of a friar, being fool enough to play upon an honourable footing, I lost all I had to a few shillings. This was a confounded stroke. This was a stunning blow to me. I lay abed all the next day, raving at my ill fortune, and beating my brains to think I could be such an ass as to play upon the squire. At last, in a fit of despair, I started out of bed about nine or ten o'clock at night, borrowed a friend's horse, bought a second-hand pair of poppers, with the little silver th that was left me, and away I rode full gallop, night and rainy as it was, for Hounslow Heath. There I wandered about half dead with cold and fear till morning and to say the truth, began to grow devilish sick of my business. When day broke, the first object that presented itself to my eyes, I remember, was a gallows within a hundred yards of me. This seemed plaguy ominous, and I was very near riding back to London, without striking a stroke. At last, while I was wavering in this state of uncertainty, behold, a stage-coach comes gently, softly, ambling over the heath. Courage, my heart cries. There can be no fear of resistance here. A stage-coach is the most lucky thing in the world for a young adventurer. And so saying, I clapped on my mask, the same I had worn the night before at the haymarket, set spurs to my horse, and presented my pistol at the coach-window. How the passengers behaved, I know not. For my own part, I was more than half blind with fear, and taking what they gave me without any expostulation, away I rode, exceedingly well satisfied to have escaped without resistance. Taking courage, however, at this success, I attacked another stage-coach, with greater bravery, and afterwards a third, with so much magnanimity that I even ventured to search some of the passengers, who I thought defrauded me of my due. Here now I should have left off, and all have been well. But that devil avarice prompting me to get a little more, I attacked a single horseman, and plundered him of a watch and about thirty guineas. The scoundrel seemed to pursue his journey quietly enough, but meeting afterwards with some of his friends on the road, and relating his case to them, they all agreed to pursue me. Meanwhile, sir, I was jogging on contentedly at my ease, when turning around on a sudden, I saw this tremendous grazier, and two or three more bloody-minded fellows that seemed such as big as a giant, in full pursuit of me. Away I dashed through thick and thin as if the devil drove, but being wretchedly mounted, I was surrounded, apprehended, carried before that infernal Sir Thomas Devey, and he committed me. Now I was in a sweet condition. This was a charming revolution in my life. Newgate and the prospects of a gallows furnish a man with very agreeable reflections. Oh, that cursed old Bailey! I shall never forget the sentence which the humdrum son of a war of a judge passed upon me. You shall hang till you are dead, dead, dead. Faith, I was more than half dead with hearing it, and in that plight I was dragged back to my prison. Excellent lodging in the condemned hole. Pretty music the death warrant rings in a man's ears. 
but as good luck would have it, while I was expecting every hour to be tucked up, His Majesty, God bless him, took pity on me the very day before execution, and sent me a reprieve for transportation. To describe the transport I felt at this moment would be impossible. I was half mad with joy, and instead of reflecting that I was going to slavery, fancied myself going to heaven. The being shipped off for Jamaica was so much better a voyage, I thought, than ferrying over that same river stikes with old Gaffar Sharon, that I never once troubled myself about what I was to suffer when I got thither. Not to be tedious, for I hate a long story. To Jamaica I went, with the full resolution of making my escape by the first opportunity, which I very soon accomplished. After leading the life of a dog for about a year and a half, I got on board a ship which was coming for England, and arrived safe and sound on the coast of Cornwall. My dear native country, how it revived my heart to see thee again! Oh, London, London, no woman of quality, after suffering the vapours for a whole summer in the country, ever sighed after thee with greater desire than I did. But as I landed without a farthing of money in my pocket, I was obliged to beg my way up to town, in the habit of a sailor, telling all the way the confoundest lies, how I had been taken by pirates and fought with the Moors, who were going to eat me alive, and twenty other unaccountable stories to chow silly women of a few halfpence. Well, at last I entered the dear old metropolis, and went immediately in a quest of a gang of sharpers which I formerly frequented. These jovial blades were just then setting out for new market races, and very generously took me into their party. They supplied me with cloth, lent me a little money to begin with, and in short set me up again in the world. There is nothing like courage. Tis the life, the soul of business. Accordingly, on the very first day's sport, having marked out the horse that I saw was the favourite of the knowing ones, I offered great odds, made as many bets as I could, and trusted myself to fortune. Resolving to scamper off the course as hard as I could drive, if I saw her likely to declare against me. But as it happened to make amends for her former ill usage, the jade now decided in my favour. Twas quite a hollow thing, Goliath won the day, and I pocketed up about three score guineas. Of this I made excellent use at the gaming tables, and in short, when the week was over, carried away from Newmarket a cool three hundred. Now, my dear Bess, I was a man again. I returned immediately to London, equipped myself with lace clothes, rattled down to Bath in a post-chaise, gave myself out for the eldest son of Sir Jeremy Gruskin of the Kingdom of Ireland, and struck at once into all the joys of high life. This is a little epitome of my history. Having been a pickpocket, a sharper, a slave, and a highwayman, I am now the peculiar favourite of all the ladies at Bath. Here the beau finished his story, and sat expecting the applauses of his company, which he very soon received on the part of his sister. But as to that worthy gentleman, his father, he had been fast asleep for several minutes, and did not hear the conclusion of this wonderful history. Being now waked by silence and the cessation of his son's voice, as he had been before lulled to sleep by his talking, he cried out from the midst of a dose, So, she's a very fine girl, is she, Jack? A very fine girl. Who is a very fine girl? cries the sharper, slapping him over the shoulder. Why sounds thou art asleep, old miserable, and dost not know a syllable of what has been said? Yes, sir, I do know what has been said, returned the father, and therefore you need not beat one so, Jack. You was telling about going to be married and uh, going to Jamaica. Going to Jamaica. Pox take thee. Thou wantest to be going to bed. Why was there ever such a wretched old dotard? I have not seen thee these seven or eight years, and perhaps may never see thee again. For thou wilt be rotten in a year or two more, and yet canst not put a little life into thyself for one evening? Come, Bess, added he. Let us take another bumper, and then bid old drowsy good night. Silliness will snore, do what can one, to prevent him. Here, my girl, here's prosperity to love, and may all sleepers go to the devil. Nay, nay, cries the father, consider, Jack, this past my bedtime many hours ago. You fine gentlemen of the world are able to bear these fashionable hours, but I have been used to live by the light of the sun. Besides, if you had been drudging about after charity as I have all day long, I fancy you would not be in a much better condition than your poor father. But really, you sharpers, don't consider the toil and trouble of earning one's bread in an honest way. Why now, I have not gathered above six or seven shillings this whole day, and that won't half pay for our supper tonight. 
Here the beau bestowed several curses on him for his stinginess, and contemptuously bidding him hoard up his miserable pelf, generously undertook to pay the whole. The bill was then called for, the reckoning discharged, and the company separated, having first, however, made an agreement to meet there the succeeding evening. And thus ended this illustrious computation. End of Book 1, Chapter 16 Recording by Sudeshna Book 1, Chapter 17 of the History of Pompey the Little This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Seventeen Adventures at the Bath. Next morning, the blind beggar, conducted by our hero, went out as usual and presented himself before the Beaumonde on the parade. Some few people, afflicted with very ill health, were generous enough to throw him down a few sixpences. Others only commended the beauty of his pretty dog and far the greater number walked on without casting their eyes upon him. As he was here howling forth the miseries of his condition in a most lamentable tone of voice, who should happen to pass by but his own accomplished son, in company with two ladies of figure, to whom he was talking with the greatest familiarity and ease. The gaiety of his laugh, the vivacity of his conversation, made him universally observed, and all the women on the parade seemed to envy the happiness of the two ladies with whom he was engaged. As the party came very near the place where the old hypocrite was stationed, he could not escape their notice, and the youngest of the ladies, being struck with compassion at the sight of him, "'Bless me,' says she, "'I am sure that poor old man is an object of charity.' Do stay a moment, Lady Marmazat. I am resolved to give him something. Shaw, my dear, come along, child, cries her ladyship. How can you be so ridiculous, Miss Newcombe? Who gives any money to charity nowadays? True, madam. Your ladyship is perfectly in the right, replied the beau, who now discovered his own father. Nothing can be more idle, I think, than throwing one's money away upon a set of thievish tatterdemillion wretches, who are the burthen of the nation, and ought to be exterminated from the face of the earth. Well, well, you may say what you please, both of you, says Miss Newcombe, but I am resolved to be generous this morning, and therefore it does not signify laughing at me. Here, Master Gaffer, here's sixpence for you. All this while Mr. Grishkin was in extreme pain, for though he had no reason to fear any discovery, Yet the consciousness that this deplorable object was his own father hurt the gentleman's pride in the presence of his mistress, and greatly checked his vivacity. He endeavored, therefore, all he could to hurry the young lady away from so unpleasant a scene, in which he was seconded by Lady Marmoset, who kept crying out, "'How can you be so monstrously preposterous, Miss Newcombe? Come along, girl.' As I hope to be saved, I am ashamed of you. We shall have all the eyes of the company upon us in a few minutes. I don't care a farthing for the company, replied the young lady. I am resolved to ask the old man some questions, and therefore hold your tongue. What, are you quite blind, Gaffer? By this time Squire Griskin was recovered from his first surprise, and perceiving no bad consequences likely to happen, thought he might venture to shine a little upon the occasion. Sirrah, cries he, you miserable old dog, what do you mean by shocking people of quality here with a sight of your detestable physiognomy? Whence do you come? What do you do out of your own parish? I'll have you whipped from constable to constable back to your own settlement. No, please your noble honor, cries the beggar. I hope your noble honor won't be so cruel to a poor blind man. 
a poor blind man struck blind with lightning. Heaven preserve your honor from such calamities. I have very good friends down in Cumberland. Please, your royal worship, and I am traveling homeward as fast as I can. But it pleased heaven to strike me blind with a flash of lightning a long way from my relations, and I am reduced to beg for a little sustenance. Mercy upon me, cries Miss Newcomb. Why, what a vast way the miserable wretch has to travel, Mr. Griskin. How will he ever be able to get home? Oh, curse him. All a confounded lie from the beginning to the end. Depend upon it, madam. The dog has no relations or friends in the world. I'll answer for him, cries the beau. Then, turning to his father, Here, you old rascal, added he, here's a shilling for you. And do you hear me? Take yourself off this moment. If I ever see you upon the parade again, I'll have you laid by the heels and sent to the house of correction. The blind wretch then hobbled away, pouring forth a thousand benedictions upon them, while Lady Marmozet and the sharper rallied Miss Newcomb for her unfashionable generosity. Leaving the reader to make his own remarks on this extraordinary occurrence, I shall pass over the intermediate space of time in which nothing happened material to this history, and rejoin the three illustrious guests at their alehouse in the evening. The lady was the first that came, to whom her father related the adventure of the morning, which greatly delighted her. While she was laughing at this story, that sprightly knight, her brother, also came singing into the room, and throwing himself negligently into a chair, picked his teeth for a moment or two in silence. Then, addressing himself to his father, "'Old fellow,' cries he, "'I was obliged to use you a little roughly this morning, "'but you'll excuse me. "'There was a necessity, you know, "'of treating you like a scoundrel and an impostor, "'to prevent any suspicion of our relationship.' "'Well, well, Jack,' replied the father, "'I forgive you. "'I forgive you with all my heart.' for I suppose one of the ladies was your sweetheart. And, to be sure, t'was well not to let her know you was my son, for fear of the worst that might happen. Those you tell me women are so fond of marrying highwaymen nowadays. Ah, to Jack, I wished for my eyes again, just to have one little peep at her. What, is she a deadly fine girl? A divine creature, replied the beau, young, melting, amorous, and beautiful innocent as an angel, and yet wanton as the month of May. And then she dotes on me to distraction. Did you mind how tenderly the little fool interested herself about your blind eyes and pitied you for the confounded lies you told her? Why, yes, there was something very pretty, I must confess, said the father. Very pretty indeed in her manner of talking. How the deuce do you get acquainted with these great ladies? "'Oh, let me alone for that,' returned Mr. Griskin. "'I am made for women, sir. "'I have the two jours gay, which is so dear to them. "'I am blessed with that agreeable impudence, "'that easy, familiar way of talking nonsense, "'the happy insensibility of shame, "'which they all adore in men. "'And then consider my figure, my shape, my air, my legs. "'Altogether I find I am irresistible.' How in the name of wonder, old fellow, could you and your troll strike out such a lucky hit under a country hedge? Here the fair lady was in rapture at her brother's wit, and asked her father if he did not think him a most delightful, charming young fellow, to which the beggar replied with a groan, Oh, Jack, Jack, thou wilt certainly come to be hanged in the end. I see it as plain as can be. So much wit and impudence will certainly bring thee to the gallows at last. Much more of this sort of rivalry and licentious conversation passed between them, and, as the father was more wakeful this night than he had been the preceding one, they protracted their cups till very late. They roared, they sung, they danced, and practiced all sorts of unruly, drunken mirth. At last, however, they separated once more, to their several beds, and fate had destined that they should never meet again in joy and friendship at this or any other alehouse, 
the cause whereof will be seen in the following chapter. End of Book One, Chapter Seventeen. Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. Book One, Chapter Eighteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book One, Chapter Eighteen. More Adventures at Bath. The father of young Jeremy Griskin was so pleased with the advantageous match his son was concluding that in the joy of his heart he could not help talking of it to the alehouse keeper where he lodged, though he had imprecated a thousand curses on his head if ever he revealed. The alehouse keeper, likewise, had bound himself by an equal number of oaths never to discover what he heard from the beggar, and perhaps at the time he made these vows, he meant to observe them. But, being once in the possession of a secret, he found it impossible to be long easy with so troublesome a guest in his bosom. With a very mysterious face, therefore, he whispered to several coachmen and footmen, who frequented his house, that a very fine gentleman and lady came privately every night to visit an old blind beggar who lodged with him that these fine folks, by what he could learn, were the beggar's son and daughter, and that the fine gentleman lived amongst the quality, and was going to run away with a great fortune. The story, having made this progress, could not fail of proceeding farther, for being once communicated to the servants of several families, it was quickly served up to the tables of the great. The valets informed their masters and the waiting gentlewomen their mistresses, as a new topic of conversation while they were dressing them. From hence the rumor became public, and dispersed itself all over the bath, so that the very next morning, after the last rendezvous at the alehouse, when Squire Griskin appeared with Lady Marmoset and Miss Newcomb as usual in the pump-room, they found themselves stared on, with more than common attention, by all the company. Several gentlemen laughed aloud as they passed by them. The young ladies all affected to titter under their fans, and the elder dames tossed up their noses with the most insolent air of disdain. All of this could not be done without a meaning. The two ladies, his companions, were greatly astonished, and even the beau himself, fortified as he was in impudence, could not stifle some unpleasant apprehensions. He affected, however, to turn it off with an air of raillery, imputed it to the damned censoriousness of the bath, and expressed his wonder that people could not be allowed to be free and intimate, without drawing on themselves the scandalous observations of a whole public place. While Mr. Griskin was supposed to be a gentleman, the whole tribe of coquettes and beauties looked on Miss Newcomb with eyes of jealousy and indignation, all of them envying her happiness of engaging so accomplished a lover. But no sooner were they let into the secret of his parentage than they began to triumph in their turns, and showed their malice another way. Envy now changed into contempt. A malicious sneer was seen on all their faces, and they huddled together in little parties to feast on so agreeable a discovery. For spite is never so spiteful as among young ladies who are rivals in love and beauty. Really, madam, said one of them, one must be obliged to take care of one's pockets, because, you know, if sharpers are allowed to come into public places and appear like gentlemen, one can never be safe for a moment. To which another replied, Indeed, I shall leave my watch at home when I go to the ball tonight, for I don't think it's safe to carry anything valuable about one while Miss Newcomb's admirer continues among us. Many such speeches were flirted about, for, though the story hitherto was only a flying suspicion, 
They were all fully persuaded of its truth, and resolutely bent to believe it, without waiting for any confirmation, and indeed without once troubling themselves to inquire on what authority it was founded. The gay sharper manifestly perceived from all this that some discovery had been made to his disadvantage, but not being willing to resign his hopes till affairs appeared a little more desperate, he very courageously presented himself that evening in the ballroom. He was indeed prudent enough to abstain from minuets, not choosing to encounter the eyes of people in so conspicuous an attitude. But as soon as the company stood up to country dances, with a face of infinite assurance, he led Miss Newcomb towards the top of the room, and took his station as usual among the foremost files. A buzz immediately ran through the company, and when they came to dance, most of the ladies refused him their hands. This was a terrible blow to him. He knew not how to revenge the affront, nor yet how to behave under such an interdiction. Lady Marmazout, who saw with what scorn he was treated, very resolutely advanced and reprimanded several of her female acquaintances with much warmth for their behavior, pretending it was an affront to Miss Newcomb, who came to Bath under her protection, and whose cause she was obliged to espouse. In reality, I believe there was another reason which quickened her ladyship's resentment, and made her behold with concern the indignities offered to a man who had found the way of being agreeable to her ladyship, as well as to the young lady her companion. But however that be, to certain her interfering did him little service, and, after a thousand taunts and fleers, the unfortunate couple was obliged to sit down in a corner of the room. They stood up again some time afterwards to make a fresh attempt, proved as unsuccessful as the former. In short, after repeated disgraces, they were obliged to give over all thought of dancing for the remaining part of the night, the poor girl trembling and wondering what could be the reason for all this behavior, and even the beau himself looking foolish under the consciousness of his own condition. As it was pretty plain, however, that his father must have betrayed his secret, the ball no sooner broke up than he flew with the greatest rage to the alehouse, rushed eagerly into the room, where the miserable wretch was then dozing, and fell upon him with all the bitterness of passion. "'Where is this old rascal?' cries he. "'What is it you mean by this, you detestable miscreant? I have a great mind to murder you, and give your carcass to the hounds.' "'Bless us! What's the matter now, Jack?' said the beggar. "'Matter?' returned he. "'You have been pratting and tattling and chattering. "'You have ruined me, you old villain. "'You have blown me up forever. "'Speak, confess that you have discovered my secrets.' "'Here the beggar stammered and endeavored to excuse himself, "'but was obliged at last to acknowledge "'that he believed he might have mentioned something of the matter "'to the man of the house.' "'How durst you mention anything of the matter?' cries the son, seizing his father by the throat. "'How durst you open your lips upon the subject? "'I have a great inclination to pluck your tongue out and burn it before your face. "'You have told him, I suppose, that I am your son. "'Tis a lie. You stole me. You kidnapped me. "'Tis impossible I could be the offspring of such an eyeless, shirtless, toothless ragamuffin as thou art.' Here I have been insulted by everybody tonight. I have run the cantaloupe through the whole ballroom. All my hopes, all my stratagems are destroyed, and all is owing to your infamous pratting. But mark what I say to you. Set out directly tonight or tomorrow morning before sunrise, and budge it off as fast as your legs can carry you. If I find you here tomorrow at seven o'clock, by hell I'll cut your throat. You have done mischief enough already." you shall do me no more, and therefore pack up your wallet and away with you, or prepare to feed the crows. Having uttered this terrible denunciation of vengeance, he rushed out of the room with as much impetuosity as he came into it, and left the poor offender staring and trembling with amazement. The first thing he did after his son had quitted him was to heave up a prodigious groan, which he accompanied with a moral reflection on the hard fate of all fathers, who are cursed with rebellious, unnatural children. As such usage, he thought, was sufficient 
to cancel all parental affection, he felt in himself a strong desire at first to be revenged by impeaching and bringing the villain to justice. But then, considering on the other hand that he could not well do this without discovering his own hypocrisy and impostures at the same time, he prudently suppressed those thoughts and resolved to quit the place. "'Twas hard,' he said to himself, to obey the orders of such an abandoned profligate, but he comforted himself with the agreeable and indeed very probable hopes that he should soon see his son come to the gallows without his being accessory to such an event. Very early then, the next morning, he set out with his unfortunate little guide and made forced marches for London. Being willing to escape beyond the reach of his son's resentment as soon as possible, he traveled so very fast that, in a little more than a week's time, he arrived at Reading, from whence, after a day's resting, he again renewed his journey. But sorrow and fatigue so entirely overcame him that he fell sick on the road, and it was with the greatest difficulty that he crawled up to the gate of a celebrated inn, not used to entertaining such guests, where he fainted and dropped down in a fit. Two or three ostlers, who were the first that saw him, conveyed him to an apartment in the stable, where he lay for several days in the most miserable condition. His disorder soon rendered him speechless, and, being able to ask for nothing, he was supplied with nothing. For though the good landlady of the house would gladly have done anything in the world to relieve him, had she known his condition, her servants, happening not to have the same spirit of humanity in them, never once informed her that such an object of charity lay sick in her stable. Finding himself thus neglected and destitute of all comfort, he very prudently gave up the ghost, leaving our hero once more at the disposal of chance. What future scenes of good or evil are next to open upon him? Fate does not yet choose to divulge, and therefore begging the reader to suspend his curiosity till we have received a proper commission for gratifying it, we here put an end to this first book of our wonderful history. End of Book One, Chapter Eighteen Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Book Two, Chapter One of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter One. Fortune Grows Favorable to Our Hero, and Restores Him to High Life. The blind beggar, to whose tyranny fortune had committed our hero, groaned out his soul, as the reader has already seen, in a stable at a public inn. Pompey, standing by, had the pleasure of seeing the tyrant fall as he deserved, and exulted over him, like Cicero in the senate-house over the dying Caesar. This misfortune was first discovered by an ostler, who, coming accidentally into the stable, and perceiving the miserable creature stretched out on the straw, began at first to holler in his ear, imagining him to be asleep. But, finding him insensible to three or four hearty kicks, which he bestowed upon him. "'Odd rabbiton!' cried he. "'Why, sure I can't be dead, can I? By gar he is! Pilgarlic is certainly dead!' He then called together two or three of his brethren, to divert themselves with this agreeable spectacle, and many stable jokes passed upon the occasion. When their diversion was over, one of them ran indoors to inform their mistress, but the good woman was not immediately at leisure to hear his intelligence being taken up in her civilities to a coach and six, just then arrived, and very busy in conducting the ladies to their apartments. However, when dinner was over, she bethought herself of what had happened, and went into the stable, attended by two of her chambermaids, to survey the corpse and give orders for its burial. There little Pompey for the first time presented himself to her view, but sorrow and ill-usage had so impaired his beauty and his coat too was in such a déshabillé of dirt and mire, that he bespake no favourable opinion in his beholders. We must not, therefore, think Mrs. Windmill of a cruel nature,
because she ordered him to be hanged, for in reality she is a very humane and friendly woman, but perceiving no beauty in the dog to incline her to compassion, and concluding him to be a thief from the company he was found with, it was natural for her to show him no mercy. A consultation, therefore, was held in the yard, and sentence of death pronounced upon him, which had been executed as soon as commanded, for the ostler was instantly preparing a rope with great delight, had not one of the chambermaids interposed, saying, she believed he was a sweet pretty creature if he was washed, and desired her mistress to save him. A word of this kind was enough for Mrs. Windmill, who immediately granted him a reprieve, and ordered him into the kitchen for a turnspit. But when he had gone through the ceremony of lustration, and was thoroughly cleaned, everybody was struck with his beauty, and the good landlady in particular, who now changed her resolutions, and, instead of condemning him to the drudgery of a turnspit, made him her companion, and taught him to follow her about the house. He soon grew to be a favourite with the whole family, as indeed he always was wherever he came, and the chambermaids used to take him to their beds at night. He likewise got acquainted with Captain, the great house-dog, who, like Cerberus, terrified the regions round about with his barking. Yet would he often condescend to be pleased with the frolics of little Pompey, and vouchsafe now and then to unbend his majesty with a game of play. After he had lived here near a fortnight, a post-chaise stopped one day at the door, out of which alighted two ladies just arrived from the bath. They ran directly to the fire, declaring they were almost frozen to death with cold, whereupon Mrs. Windmill began to thunder for wood, and assisted in making up an excellent fire, after which she begged the favour to know what their ladyships would please to have for dinner. "'If you please, madam,' said the eldest, "'I'll look into your larder.' "'With all my heart, madam,' answered the good landlady, "'I have fish and fowls of all kinds, and rabbits and hares, and variety of butcher's meat. But your ladyship says you will be so good as to accommodate yourself on the spot. I am ready to attend your ladyship, whatever your ladyship pleases." While the eldest was gone to examine the larder, the youngest of these ladies, having seized little Pompey, who followed his mistress into the room, was infinitely charmed with its beauty, and caressed him during the whole time of her sister's absence. Pompey, in return, seemed pleased to be taken notice of by so fair a lady for though he had been long disused to the company of people of fashion, he had not yet forgot how to behave himself with complacence and good manners. He felt a kind of pride returning, which all his misfortunes had not been able to extinguish, and began to hope the time was come which should restore him to the beau monde. With these hopes he continued in the room all the time the ladies were at dinner, paying great court to them both, and receiving what they were pleased to bestow upon him with much fawning and officious civility. As soon as the ladies had dined, Mrs. Windmill came in to make her compliments, as usual, hoping the dinner was dressed to their ladyship's minds, and that the journey had not destroyed their appetites. She received very courteous answers to all she said, and after some other conversation on indifferent topics, little Pompey came at last upon the carpet. "'Pray, madam,' said the youngest of the ladies, "'how long have you had this very pretty dog?' Mrs. Windmill, who never was deficient, when she had an opportunity of talking, having started so fair a subject, began to display her eloquence in the following manner. "'Madam,' says she, "'the little creature fell into my hands by the strangest accident in life, and it is God's mercy he was not hanged. An old blind beggar, ladies, died in my stable about a fortnight ago, and it seems this little animal used to lead him about the country.' "'Tis amazing how they come by the instinct they have in them, and such a little creature, too. But, as I was telling you, ladies, the old blind beggar was just returned from Bath, as your ladyships may be now, and the poor miserable wretch perished in my stable. There he left this little dog, and, will you believe it, ladies, as I am alive, I ordered him to be hanged, not once dreaming he was such a beauty, for indeed he was quite covered over with mire and nastiness as to be sure he could not be otherwise, after leading the old blind man so long a journey. But a maid-servant of mine took a fancy to the little wretch, and begged his life. And, would you think it, ladies, I am now grown as fond of the little fool as if he was my own child." The two sisters, diverted with Mrs. Windmill's oration, could not help smiling on one another, 
but disguising their laughter as well as they could. "'I do not wonder,' said the youngest, "'at your fondness for him, madam. He is so remarkably handsome. And that being the case, I can't find it in my heart to rob you of him. Otherwise I was just going to ask if you should be willing to part with him.' "'Bless me, madam,' said the obliging hostess. "'I am sure there is nothing I would not do to oblige your ladyship, and if your ladyship has such an affection for the little wretch, not part with him indeed.' "'Nay, madam,' said the lady, interrupting her, "'I would willingly make you any amends, and if you will please to name your price, I'll purchase him of you.' "'Alack a day, madam,' replied the landlady, "'I am sorry your ladyship suspects me to be of such a mercenary disposition. Purchase him, indeed. He is extremely at your ladyship's service, if you please to accept of him.' With these words she took him up, and delivered him into the lady's arms who received him with many acknowledgments of the favour done her, all which the good landlady repaid with abundant interest. Word was now brought that the chase was ready, and waited at the door, whereupon the two ladies were obliged to break off their conversation, and Mrs. Windmill to restrain her eloquence. She attended them, with a million of civil speeches, to their equipage, and handing little Pompey to them when they were seated in it, took her leave with a great profusion of smiles and curtsies. The postillion blew his horn, the ladies bowed, and our hero's heart exulted with transport to think of the amendment of his fate. End of Book Two Chapter One Recording by Corrie Samuel Book Two Chapter Two of The History of Pompey the Little this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Two. A Long Chapter of Characters. The post-chaise stopped in a genteel street in London, and Pompey was introduced into decent lodgings, where every thing had an air of politeness, yet nothing was expensive. The rooms were hung with Indian paper, the beds were Chinese, and the whole furniture seemed to show how elegant simplicity can be, under direction of taste. Tea was immediately ordered, and the two ladies sat down to refresh themselves after the fatigue of their journey, and began to talk over the adventures they had met with at the bath. They remembered many agreeable incidents, which had happened in that great rendezvous of pleasure, and ventured to laugh at some follies of their acquaintance, without severity or ill-nature. These two ladies were born of a good family, and had received a genteel education. Their father, indeed, left them no more than six thousand pounds each, but, as they united their fortunes, and managed their affairs with frugality, they made a creditable figure in the world and lived in intimacy with people of the greatest fashion. It will be necessary, for the sake of distinction, to give them names, and the reader, if he pleases, may call them Theodosia and Aurora. Theodosia, the eldest, was advancing towards forty, an age when personal charms begin to fade, and women grow indifferent, at least, who have nothing better to supply the place of them. But Theodosia was large possessed of all those good qualities which render women agreeable without beauty. She was affable and easy in her behaviour, well-bred without falsehood, cheerful without levity, polite and obliging to her friends, civil and generous to her domestics. Nature had given her a good temper, and education had made it an agreeable one. She had lived much in the world, without growing vain or insolent, improved her understanding by books, without any affectation of wit or science and loved public places, without being a slave to pleasure. Her conversation was always engaging and often entertaining. Her long commerce with the world had supplied her with a fund of diverting remarks on life, and her good sense enabled her to deliver them with grace and propriety. Aurora, the youngest sister, was in her four-and-twentieth year, and imagination cannot possibly form a finer figure than she was, in every respect. Her beauty, now in its highest lustre, gave that full satisfaction to the eye which younger charms rarely inspire. She was tall and full-formed, but with the utmost elegance and symmetry in all her limbs, and a certain majesty, 
which resulted from her shape, was accompanied with a most peculiar sweetness of face. For though she had all the charms, she had none of the insolence of beauty. As if these uncommon perfections of nature were not sufficient to procure her admirers enough, she had added to them the most winning accomplishments of art. She danced and sung, and played like an angel. Her voice naturally clear, full, and melodious, had been improved under the best Italian masters, and she was ready to oblige people with her music, on the slightest intimation that it would be agreeable, without any airs of shyness and unseasonable modesty. Indeed, affectation never entered into any one of her gestures, and whatsoever she did was with that generous freedom of manner which denotes a good understanding, as well as an honest heart. Her temper was cheerful in the highest degree, and she had a most uncommon flow of spirits and good humour, which seldom deserted her in any place or any company. At a ball she was extremely joyous and spirited, and the pleasure she gave to her beholders could only be exceeded by that unbounded happiness with which she inspired her partner. Yet though her genius led her to be lively, and a little romantic, whoever conversed with her in private admitted her good sense, and heard reflections from her, which plainly showed she had often exercised her understanding on the most serious subjects. A woman so beautiful in her person, and excellent in her accomplishments, could not fail of attracting lovers in great abundance, and as the characters of some of her admirers may perhaps not be unentertaining, we will give the reader a little sketch of two of them, from among a great variety. And first, let us pay our compliments to Count Tag, who had merited a title by his exploits, which perhaps is not the most usual step to honour, but always most respectable whenever it happens. Tis true he had no patent to show for his nobility, which depended entirely on the arbitrium popularis ori, the fickleness of popular applause. But the same arts which had procured him his title he trusted to for the preservation of it. He had indeed taken great pains to be a coxcomb of distinguished reputation, and by the help of uncommon talents this way was now arrived at the full extent of his wishes. Having established a large acquaintance among people of fashion, who admitted him for the sake of laughing at him, he really fancied himself one of their number, and had long ago thought proper to forget his family and primeval meanness. But that the reader may know by what steps he rose to the conspicuous station of ridicule he now possessed, let us trace him in his progress to it. Count Tag was the son of a brewer in a great market-town, who, having grown rich in trade, was seized with the unfortunate ambition of breeding up his son a gentleman, for which purpose he sent him first to a public school, and afterwards to the University of Oxford. Being here on a level with people much his superiors, the young gentleman learned to grow fond of great company, and very early began to calculate the degree of his happiness by the number of his fashionable acquaintance. At last his father died, and left him a fortune of about eight thousand pounds. Upon the news whereof, he immediately transported himself from Oxford to London, resolving to make a bold push, as it is called, to introduce himself into life. He had a strong ambition of becoming a fine gentleman, and cultivating an acquaintance with people of fashion, which he esteemed the most consummate character attainable by man, and to that he resolved to dedicate his days. As his first essay, therefore, he presented himself every evening in a side-box at one of the playhouses, where he was ready to enter into conversation with anybody that would afford him an audience, but was particularly assiduous in applying himself to young noblemen and men of fortune, whom he had formerly known at school or at the university. By degrees he got footing in two or three families of quality, where he was sometimes invited to dinner, and having learnt the fashionable topics of discourse, he studied to make himself agreeable, by entertaining them with the current news of the town. He had the first intelligence of a marriage, or an intrigue, knew to a moment when the breath went out of a nobleman's body, and published the scandal of a masquerade, or a redotta, sooner by half an hour at least, than any other public talker in London. He had a conspicuous fluency of language, which made him embellish every subject he undertook, and a certain art of talking as minutely and circumstantially on the most trivial subjects as on those of the highest importance. He would describe a straw or a pimple on a lady's face, with all the figures of rhetoric, 
by which he persuaded many people to believe him a man of great parts, and surely no man's impertinence ever turned to better account. As he constantly attended Bath and Tunbridge, and all the public places, he got easier access to the tables of the great, and by degrees insinuated himself into all the parties of the ladies, among whom he began to be received as a considerable genius, and quickly became necessary in all their drums and assemblies. Finding his schemes thus succeed almost beyond his hopes, he now assumed a higher behaviour, and began to fancy himself a man of quality from the company he kept. With this view, he thought proper to forget all his old acquaintance, whose low geniuses left them grovelling in obscurity, while his superior talents had raised him to a familiarity with lords and ladies. If, therefore, any old friend, presuming on their former intimacy, ventured to accost him in the park, he made a formal bow, and begged pardon for leaving him, but really, Lady Betty or Lady Mary was just entering them all. In short, he always proportioned his respect to the rank and fortunes of his company. He would desert a commoner for a lord, a lord for an earl, an earl for a marquis, and a marquis for a duke. Having thus enrolled himself in his own imagination among the nobility, it was not without reason that people gave him the style and title of Count Tag thinking it a pity that such a genius should be called by the ordinary name of his family. To say that this gentleman was in love would be too great an abuse of language, for he was in reality incapable of loving anybody but himself. But vanity and the mode often made him affect attachments to women of celebrated beauty, from whose acquaintances he thought he could derive a credit to himself. This was his motive for appearing one of the admirers of Aurora whose charms were conspicuous enough to excite his pride, and that was the only passion which the Count ever thought of gratifying. He knew how to counterfeit raptures which he never felt, and had all the language of love, without any of its sentiment. The other admirer of Aurora, whose character we likewise promised to draw, was one in all respects the reverse of Count Tag, and may very well serve as his contrast. He was a young nobleman about her own age, blessed with every personal accomplishment that could render him agreeable, and every good quality that could make him beloved. If an excellent understanding, improved by competent reading, if the most uncommon integrity of mind, joined with the greatest candour and sensibility of heart, if a soul passionately devoted to the love of truth, which abhorred falsehood and detested affectation, if all these perfections can render any one the object of esteem, they all united in forming the character of this amiable young nobleman. But to esteem him only was paying him but half his due. There was something so very open and sincere in his looks, so winning in his conversation, and striking in all his actions, that nobody ever departed from him without a thorough love and admiration of him. He had the most agreeable manner of address, improved but not corrupted by the civilities of the world a uniform, unaffected, natural gentility, which put mere politeness out of countenance, and left artificial complacence at a distance. In a word, he had the most cordial warmth of heart, the greatest generosity of sentiment, and the truest equanimity of temper, upon all occasions in life. Being inspired with a passion for an agreeable woman, he was neither ashamed to own it, nor yet did he use the ridiculous elogiums, with which coxcombs talk of their mistresses, when their imaginations are heated with wine. He did not compare her to the Venus of Medicis, or run into any of those artificial raptures which are almost always counterfeited, but whenever he mentioned her name he spoke the language of his heart, and spoke of her always with a manliness that testified the reality and sincerity of his passion. It was impossible for a woman not to return the affections of so deserving a lover. Aurora was happy to be the object of his addresses, and met them with becoming zeal. End of Book Two, Chapter Two. Book Two, Chapter Three of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, 
by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Two. The characters of the foregoing chapter exemplified. An irreparable misfortune befalls our hero. The two sisters had lain longer abed than usual the morning after their arrival in town, which was owing to the fatigue of their journey. They had but finished their breakfast by twelve o'clock. Aurora was then sitting down to her harpsichord, and Theodosia reading the playbills for the evening, when the door opened, and Count Tag was ushered by a servant into the room. When the first ceremonies were a little over, and the Count had expressed the prodigious satisfaction he felt in feeling them returned to town, he began to inquire what kind of season they had had at Bath. "'Why, really,' said Theodosia, "'a very good one upon the whole. There were many agreeable people there, and all of them easy and sociable, which made our time pass away cheerfully and pleasantly enough.' "'You amaze me,' cries the Count. "'Impossible, madam. How can it be, ladies? I had letters from Lord Marmoset and Lady Betty Scornful, assuring me that, except you and themselves, there were not three human creatures in the place. Let me see. I have Lady Betty's letter in my pocket, I believe, at this moment. Oh, no! Upon recollection I put it this morning into my cabinet, where I preserve all my letters of quality." Aurora, smothering a laugh as well as she could, said she was extremely obliged to Lord Marmoset and Lady Betty for vouchsafing to rank her and her sister in the catalogue of human beings. But surely, added she, they must have been asleep, both of them, when they wrote their letters, for the bath was extremely full. Full! cries the Count, interrupting her. Oh, madam, that is very possible, and yet there might be no company, that is, none of us, nobody that one knows. For as to all the Tremontaines that come by the cross-post, we never reckon them as anything but monsters in human shape, that serve to fill up the stage of life, like ciphers in a play. For instance, you often see an awkward girl, who has sewed a tail to a gown, and pinned two lappets to a nightcap, run headlong into the rooms with a wild, frosty face, as if she was just come from feeding poultry in her father's chicken-yard, or you see a booby squire, with a head resembling a stone ball over a gate-post. Now it would be the most ridiculous thing in life to call such people company. It is the want of titles, and not the want of faces, that make a place empty, for if there is nobody one knows, if there are none of us in a place, we esteem all the rest as mob and rabble." Here it was impossible for the two ladies any longer to contain their laughter. "'Hold, hold, for heaven's sake,' said Theodosia, interrupting him. "'Have a little mercy, Count, on us poor mortals who are born without titles, and don't banish us quite from all public places. Consider, sir, though you have been so happy as to acquire a title, all of us have not had the same good fortune. Must we then be reckoned among the mob and rabble of life?" "'Oh, by no means!' cries the Count. "'You misunderstand me entirely. You are in the polite circle, ladies. We reckon you among the quality. Whoever belongs to the polite circle is of the quality. I was only talking of the wretched figures, who know nobody and are known of nobody. They are the mob and rabble I was speaking of. You, indeed! No, pardon me. But pray, ladies, who is this Miss Newcombe, this great beauty, that made such a figure among you at Bath? Was she ever in any of our drums or assemblies?" "'No, sir,' replied Theodosia. It was the first time of her appearing, I believe, in any public place. She came under the protection of Lady Marmoset. She is a very agreeable girl, and really exceedingly pretty. I often conversed with her, and indeed she promises to make a very fine woman if she does not play to fool, and throw herself away upon that odious, detestable Griskin." "'Aye, that Griskin, too!' cries the Count. "'Who is that detestable Griskin? I think I am acquainted with all the families of any note in England, and yet in my days I never heard of Sir Jeremy Griskin." "'No, sir,' said Aurora, with a smile. "'It is impossible you should know any such English family, for he gave out that he came from Ireland, and even there, I fancy, one should be pretty much puzzled to find it, for I am very apt to suspect that Mr. Griskin is nothing better than a notorious sharper. We had a report at Bath that he was the son of a blind beggar. The truth of this, indeed, never came perfectly to light, but sure Lady Marmoset, if she has any friendship for the girl, must be mad to encourage such a match." "'Absolutely distracted!' cries the Count. I cannot imagine what she means by it and indeed when she comes to town I shall rally her ladyship, for having such a beauty in petto, 
without letting me know anything of the matter. While the Count was thus displaying his own merit and acquaintance with the Grand Monde, the door opened on a sudden, and the young lord appeared, whose character concluded the preceding chapter. He approached the ladies with a respectful bow, and inquired tenderly concerning their health, but addressed himself rather in a more particular manner to Aurora. Her face immediately changed on his entering the room, and a certain air of affectionate languor took possession of her features, which before were a little expressive of scorn and ridicule. In short, she received him with something more than complacence, and a tone of voice only calculated to convey the sentiments of love. But as the delicacy of her passion chose to reveal itself as little as possible before witnesses, she soon recovered the gaiety of her features, and addressing herself with a smile to her beloved peer, "'My lord,' said she, "'you are come in excellent time. The Count is entertaining us here with a very ingenious lecture on what it is we are to call the world.' Count Tag was no stranger to his lordship, who perfectly knew and heartily despised him for his foppery and affectation. Yet he was obliged now and then to submit to a visit from him, for, being in possession of a title, the Count, who haunted all people of quality, would obtrude himself on his acquaintance contrary to his inclination, and good manners, as well as the natural candour of his temper, restrained him from expressing his detestation in too explicit terms. He had, however, no great desire at present to hear him upon a topic where his impertinence would have so great a scope and therefore endeavoured to turn the conversation to some other subject. But the Count, whose eyes sparkled, as they always did, on the appearance of a man of quality, no sooner saw him seated in his chair, than he fastened immediately upon him, and began to appeal to his lordship for a confirmation of his sentiments. "'My lord,' said he, "'I was endeavouring to convince the ladies, that if there is nobody one knows, none of us in a public place, all the rest are to be considered in the light of porters and oyster-women. I dare say your lordship is of the same opinion." "'Indeed, sir, but I am not,' replied his lordship, and therefore I must desire you would not draw me into a participation of any such sentiments. The language of people one knows, and people one does not know, is what I very often hear in the world, but it seems to me the most contemptible jargon that ever was invented. Indeed, for my own part, I don't understand it and therefore I confess I am not qualified to talk about it. Whom, pray, are we to call the people one knows?" "'Oh, mon Dieu!' cries the Duke. "'Your lordship surely can't ask such a question. The people one knows, my lord, are the people who are in the round of assemblies and public diversions, people who have the savoir-vivre, the ton de bonne campagne, as the French call it. In short, people who frizz their hair in the newest fashion, and have their clothes made at Paris. And are these the only people worth one's regard in life?" said his lordship. "'Absolutely, my lord,' cries the Count. "'I can readily allow that people of quality must in general live with one another. The customs of the world in good measure require it. But surely our station gives us no right to behave with insolence to people below us, because they have not their clothes from Paris, or do not frizz their hair in the newest fashion. And I am sure if people of quality have no such right, it much less becomes the fops and coxums in fashion, who are but the retainers on people of quality, who are themselves only in public by permission, and can pretend to no merit but what they derive from acquaintance with their betters. This surely is the most contemptible of all modern follies. For instance, because a man is permitted to whisper nonsense in a Lady Betty's or Lady Mary's ear in the side-box at a playhouse, Shall he therefore fancy himself privileged to behave with impertinence to people infinitely his superiors in merit, who have perhaps not thought it worth their while to wriggle themselves into a great acquaintance? What say you, madam?" added he, addressing himself to Theodosia. "'Your observation,' she replied, "'is exceedingly just, my lord. But why do you confine it to your own sex? Pray let ours come in for a share of the satire. For my part, I can name a great many trumpery, insignificant girls about town, who, having wriggled themselves, as you say, into a polite acquaintance, give themselves ten times more airs, and are fifty thousand times more conceited, than the people to whose company they owe their pride. I have one now in my thoughts, who is throughout a composition of vanity and folly, and has been for several years the public jest and ridicule of all the town for her behaviour. All this while the Count sat in some confusion. 
for though he had a wonderful talent, as indeed most people have, at warding off scandal from himself, and applying the satire he met with to his neighbours, he was here so plainly described that it was hardly possible for him to be mistaken. Aurora saw this, and resolving to complete his confusion, Count, said she, I have had it in my head this many a day to ask you a question. Will you be so obliging as to tell me how you came by your title? Oh, pardon me, I have no title, madam, cries the Count. Mere badinage and ridicule, a nickname given me by some of my friends, that's all, but another time for that. At present I am obliged to call on Lord Monkeyman, who desires my opinion of some pictures he is going to buy, after which I shall look in upon Lady Betty Vincent, whom I positively have not seen for these three days. Here he rose up, and made all the haste he could away, being exceedingly glad to escape the persecution which he saw was preparing for him. Little Pompey was witness of many of these interviews, and began to think himself happily situated for life. He was a great favourite with Aurora, who caressed him with the fondest tenderness, and permitted him to sleep every night in a chair by her bedside. When she awoke in a morning, she would embrace him with an ardour which the happiest lover might have envied. Our hero's vanity perhaps made him fancy himself the genuine object of these caresses, whereas in reality he was only the representative of a much nobler creature. In this manner he lived with his new mistresses the greater part of a winter, and might still have continued in the same happy situation, had he not ruined himself by his own imprudence. Aurora had been dancing one night at a ridotta with her beloved peer, and retired late to her lodgings, with that vivacity in her looks, and transport in her thoughts, which love and pleasure always inspire. Animated with delightful presages of future happiness, she sat herself down in a chair to recollect the conversation that had passed between them. After this she went to bed, and resigned herself to the purest slumbers. She slept longer than usual the next morning, and it seemed as if some golden dream was pictured in her fancy, for her cheek glowed with unusual beauty, and her voice spontaneously pronounced, My Lord, I am wholly yours. While her imagination was presenting her with these delicious ideas, little Pompey, who heard the sound, thought she overslept herself, leaped upon the bed, and waked her with barking. To be interrupted in so critical a moment, while she was dreaming of her beloved peer, was an offence she knew not how to pardon. She darted a most enraged look at him, and resolved never to see him any more, but disposed of him that very morning to her milliner, who attended her with a new head-dress. Thus was he again removed to new lodgings, and condemned to future adventures. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Four. Another Long Chapter of Characters. The fair princess of lace and ribbons who now took possession of our hero, carried him home in her arms, extremely well pleased with her present. She quickly grew exceeding fond of him, as all his owners had been before her, and to express her love, ornamented his neck with a cambric ruff. The sight of this happening to please some ladies of quality, who came by accident to the shop, they resolved to imitate it, and from thence arose the modern fashion of ladies wearing ruffs about their necks. Three or four days after he was settled in these apartments, as he was striking and sporting one morning about the shop, a young lady who lodged in the house came downstairs and accosted her mistress in the following terms. I want to see some ribbons, if you please, madame, to match my blue gown, for Lady Bab Frightful is to call upon Mamma this evening to carry us to the play to see Ortheller Whore of Venus which they say is one of the finest plays that ever was acted. Yes, really, mem, tis a very engaging play to be sure, replied the milliner. Indeed, I think it one of the masterpieces of the English stage. But you mistake a little, I fancy, miss, in the naming of it, 
for Shakespeare, I believe, wrote it, Othello, Moor of Venice. Venice, mem, is a famous town or city somewhere or other, where Othello runs away with a rich heiress in the night-time, and marries her privately at the fleet. By very odd luck, he was created Lord High Admiral that very night, and goes out to fight the Turks, and takes his wife along with him to the wars. And there, mem, he grows jealous of her, only because she happens to have lost a handkerchief, which he gave her when he came according to her. It was a muslin handkerchief, mem, spotted with strawberries. And because she can't find it, he beats her in the most unmerciful manner, and at last smothers her between two feather beds. Does he indeed? cries the young lady. Well, I hate a jealous man of all things in nature. A jealous man is my particular aversion. But howsoever, no matter what the play is, you know, ma'am, we do but see it, for the pleasure of a play is to show one's self in the boxes, and see the company and all that. Yes, ma'am, this here is the sort of ribbons I want, only if you please to let me see some of a paler blue. While the milliner was taking down some fresh bandboxes, the young lady turning around happened to spy Pompey in a corner of the shop. Oh, heavens, cries she, as soon as she cast her eyes upon him, what a delightful little dog is there! Pray, dear Mrs. Pincushion, do tell me how long you have been in possession of that charming little beauty. Mrs. Pincushion replied that he had been in her possession about a week, and was given her by a lady of celebrated beauty, whom she had the honor of serving. Well, if I am not amazed to think how she could part with him, cries the young lady. Sure, ma'am, she must be a woman of no taste in the world, for I never saw anything so charmingly handsome since the hour I was born. Pray, dear Mrs. Pincushion, what is his name? Being informed that he was called Pompey, she snatched him up in her arms, kissed him with great transport, and poured forth the following torrent of nonsense upon him. Oh, you sweet little Pompey, you most delightful little Pompey! You dear heavenly jewel, you most charming little paroquet, I will kiss you, you little beauty, I will, I will, I'll kiss you and hug you and kiss you to death. Then turning again to the milliner, Dear Mrs. Pincushion, added she, you must give me leave to carry him upstairs, to show him to papa and mamma, for in all my days I never beheld so divine a creature. Being now served with her blue ribbons, and having received the milliner's consent to her request, she flew upstairs in all imaginable haste, with the dog in her arms. But before we relate the reception she met with, let us prepare the reader with a short description of her parents. Sir Thomas Frippery, the father of this young lady, had formerly enjoyed a little post in Queen Anne's court, which entitled him to a knighthood in consequence of his office, though the salary of it was very inconsiderable, and by no means equal to the grandeur he affected. On the death of the queen he lost this employment, and was obliged to retire into the country, where he gave himself the airs of a minister of state, set up for an oracle of politics, and endeavoured to persuade his country neighbours that he had been very intimate with Lord Oxford, and very deep in the transactions of those times. The same ridiculous vanity pursued him through every article of his life, and though his estate is known hardly to amount to three hundred pounds a year, he laboured to make people believe that it exceeded as many thousands. For this purpose, whatever he was obliged to do out of frugality, he was sure to put off with a pretense of taste, and always disguised his economy under the mask of fashion and the mode. For instance, when he laid down his coach, he boasted everywhere how much better it was to hire job-horses as occasion required than to run the hazard of accidents by keeping them. That coachmen were such villainous rascals, it was impossible to put any confidence in them. That going into dirty stables to overlook their management, and treading up to one's knees in horse-dung, was extremely disagreeable to people of fashion, and therefore for his part, he had laid down his coach to avoid the trouble and anxiety of keeping horses. When his country neighbors dined with him, whose ignorance he thought he could impose on, 
he would give them alder wine and swear it was hermitage, call a gammon of bacon a bay on ham, and put off the commonest homemade cheese for the best parmesan that ever came into England, which he said had been sent him as a present by a young nobleman of his acquaintance then on his travels. About once in three years he brought his wife and family to town, which served for matter of conversation to them during the two intermediate years that were spent in the country, and they looked forward to the winter of pleasure with as much rapture and expectation as the Reverend Mr. Wooden and some other Christians do their millennium. During the time of his residence in London, Sir Thomas every morning attended the levies of ministers to beg the restitution of his old place, or an appointment to a new one, which he said he would receive with the most grateful acknowledgments, and discharge in any manner they should please to prescribe. Yet whether it was that his majesty's ministers were insensible of his merits, or could find no place suited to his abilities, the unhappy knight profited little by his court attendance, and might as well have saved himself the expense of a triennial journey to London. But though these expeditions did not increase his fortune, they added much to his vanity, and he returned into the country new laden with stories to amuse his ignorant neighbors. He talked of his good friend, my good Lord Blank, with the greatest familiarity, and related conversations that had passed at the Duke of Blank's table, with as much circumstance and peculiarity as if he had been present at them. The last article of vanity we shall mention were his clothes, which gives the finishing stroke to his character, for he chose rather to wear the rags of old finery, which had been made up in the reign of Queen Anne, than to submit to plain clothes of a modern make and fashion. He fancied the poor people in his neighborhood were to be awed with the sight of tarnished lace, and wherever he went, the gold fringe fell from his person so plentifully, that you might at any time trace his footsteps by the relics of finery which he left behind him. Lady Frippery, his accomplished spouse, did not fall short of her husband in any of these perfections, but rather improved them with new graces of her own. For having been something of a beauty in her youth, she still retained all the scornful airs and languishing disdain which she had formerly practiced to her dying lovers. They had one only daughter, who having been educated all her life at home under her parents, was now become a masterpiece of folly, vanity, and impertinence. She had not one gesture or motion that was natural. Her mouth never opened without some ridiculous grimace. Her voice had learned a tone and accent foreign to itself. Her eyes squinted with endeavoring to look alluring, and all her limbs were distorted with affectation. Yet she fancied herself so well-bred, genteel, and engaging, that it was impossible for any man to look on her without admiration, and was always talking about taste and the mode. It happened now to be the London winter with this amiable family, and they were crowded into scanty lodgings on a milliner's first floor, consisting only of a dining-room, a bedchamber, and a closet. The dining-room was set apart for the reception of company, Sir Thomas and his lady took possession of the chamber, and Miss slept in a little tent-bed occasionally stuffed into the closet. Such was the family to whom our hero was now to be introduced. There is nothing more droll and diverting than the morning dresses of people, who being exceedingly poor and yet exceedingly proud, affect to make a great figure with a very little fortune. The expense they were at abroad obliges them to double their frugality at home. And as their chief happiness consists in displaying themselves to the eye of the world, consequently when they are out of its eye, nothing is too dirty or too ragged for them to wear. Now as nobody ever had the vanity of appearance more than the family we have been describing, it will be easily believed that in their own apartments, behind the scenes of the world, they did not appear to the greatest advantage, and indeed there was something so singularly odd in their dress and employments, at the moment our hero was presented to them, that we cannot help endeavoring to set their image before the reader. Sir Thomas was shaving himself before a looking-glass in his bedchamber, habited in the rags of an old nightgown, which about thirty years before had been red damask. 
All his face, and more than half his head, were covered with soap suds. Only on his crown hung a flimsy green silk nightcap, made in the shape of a sugar loaf. He had on a very dirty nightshirt, richly tinctured with perspiration, for he had slept in it a fortnight, and over this a much dirtier ribbed dimity waistcoat, which had not visited the wash-tub for a whole twelve-month past. To finish his picture, he wore on his feet a pair of darned blue satin slippers, made out of the remnants of one of his wife's petticoats. So much for Sir Thomas. Close by him sat his lady, combing her hoary locks before the same looking-glass, and dressed in a short bedgown, which hardly reached down to her middle. A night-shift, which likewise had almost forgot the washing-tub, shrouded the hidden beauties of her person. She was without stays, without a hoop, without ruffles, and without any linen about her neck, to hide those redundant charms which age had a little embrowned. This was their dress and attitude when their daughter burst into the room, and earnestly called upon them to admire the beauties of a lapdog. Her sudden entrance alarming them with the expectation of some mighty matter, Sir Thomas, in turning hastily around, had the misfortune to cut himself with his razor, which, putting him in a passion, when he came to know the ridiculous occasion of all this hurry. "'Pox, take the girl!' cries he. "'Get away, child, and don't interrupt me with your lapdogs. I am in a hurry here to go to court this morning, and you take up my time with silly tittle-tattle about a lapdog. Do you see here, foolish girl? You have made me cut myself with your ridiculous nonsense. Get away, I tell you. What a figure do you think I shall make at the levees with such a scar upon my face? Bless me, Papa, cries the young lady. I protest I am vastly sorry for your misfortune, but I am sure you'll forgive if you will but look on this delightful heavenly little jewel of a dog. Dum, your little jewel of a dog, replies the knight. Prithee stand out of my way. I tell you I am in a hurry to go to court, and therefore prithee don't trouble me with your whelps and your puppy dogs. Oh, monstrous! How can you call him such cruel names? cries the daughter. I am amazed at you, papa, for your want of taste. How can any living creature be so utterly void of taste as not to admire such a beautiful little monkey? Do, dear mamma, look at him. I am sure you must admire him, though papa is so shamefully blind and so utterly void of all manner of taste. Why, sure, my dear, you are mad to-day, replied the mother. One would think you was absolutely fuddled this morning. Taste, indeed. I declare you are void of all manner of understanding, whatever your taste may be, to interrupt us thus, when you see we are both in a hurry to be dressed. Prithee, girl, learn a little decency and good manners, before you pretend to talk of taste. The young lady being reprimanded thus on both sides, began to look extremely foolish, when a servant entered to inform them that Mr. Chase was in the dining-room. Ay, ay, go, cries Sir Thomas, go and entertain him with your taste, until I am able to wait on him. Tell Mr. Chase I happen unfortunately to be dressing, but I'll be with him in a moment of time. Miss Frippery then, muttering some little scorn, hurried into the next room with the dog in her arms, to see if she could not persuade her lover, for so he was, to discover more taste than her parents. And here indeed she had better success, for this gentleman, who was a great sportsman and fox-hunter, was consequently a great connoisseur in dogs, he was likewise what is called a very pretty young fellow about town, and had a taste so exactly correspondent with that of a lady, that it is no wonder they agreed on the same objects of admiration. Here follows his character. Mr. Chase, usually called Jack Chase among his intimates, possessed an estate of fifteen hundred pounds a year, which was just sufficient to furnish him with a variety of riding frocks, jockey boots, Kevin Huller hats, and coach whips. His great ambition was to be deemed a jemmy fellow, for which purpose he appeared always in the morning in a new market frock, decorated with a great number of green, red, or blue capes. He wore a short bob wig, neat buckskin breeches, white silk stockings, 
and carried a cane switch in his hand. He kept a phaeton chaise and four bay cattle, a stable of hunters, and a pack of hounds in the country. The reputation of being a coachman and driving a set of horses with skill, or in his own phrase, doing his business clean, he esteemed the greatest character in human life, and thought himself seated on the very pinnacle of glory when he was mounted up in a high chase at a horse-race. Newmarket had not a more active spirit, where he was frequently his own jockey, and boasted always, as a singular accomplishment, that he did not ride above eight stone and a half. Though he was a little man, and not very healthy in his constitution, he desired to be thought capable of the greatest fatigue, and was always laying wagers of the vast journeys he could perform in a day. He had likewise an ambition to be esteemed a man of consummate debauch, and endeavored to persuade you that he never went to bed without first drinking three or four bottles of claret, lying with as many whores, and knocking down as many watchmen. In the mornings he attended Dr. Broughton's amphitheaters, and in the evenings, if he was drunk in time, which indeed he seldom failed to be, he came behind the scenes of the playhouse in the middle of the third act, and there heroically exposed himself to the hisses of the galleries. Whenever he met you, he began constantly with describing his last night's debauch, or related the arrival of a new whore upon the town, or entertained you with the exploits of his bay cattle. And if you declined conversing with him on these three illustrious subjects, he swore you as a fellow of no soul or genius, and ever afterwards shunned your company. Having a hunting seat in the neighborhood of Sir Thomas Frippery, he often visited in the family of that worthy knight, and at last made proposals of marriage to the young lady, which were favorable enough received, as well by her as her parents, who, it must be confessed, had a very laudable regard for Mr. Chase's estate. To this jemmy young gentleman, who was now seated in Sir Thomas's dining-room, Miss Frippery came running with the dog in her arms, and much sparkling conversation passed between them, which perhaps might not be unentertaining if we were to relate it. But as it turned wholly upon polite taste in dress, and the mode, we confess ourselves unequal to so difficult and delicate a task. End of Book 2, Chapter 4book 2 chapter 5 of the history of pompey the little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the history of pompey the little or the life and adventures of a lapdog by francis coventry book 2 chapter 5 a description of a drum we shall then pass over this conversation in the morning and another of equal brilliancy in the evening at the play of Orthellar Hor of Venus, being in haste to describe an event which engrossed the attention of this accomplished family for a fortnight, and was a matter of conversation to them for a year afterwards. Lady Frippery, in imitation of other ladies of rank and quality, was ambitious of having a drum, though the smallness of her lodgings might well have excused her from attempting that modish piece of vanity. A drum is at present the highest object of female vainglory. The end whereof is to assemble as large a mob of quality as can possibly be contained in one house, and great are the honors paid to that lady who can boast of the largest crowd. For this purpose, a woman of superior rank calculates how many people all the rooms in her house laid open can possibly hold, and then sends out two months beforehand among the people one knows, to bespeak such a number as she thinks will fill them. Hence great emulations arise among them, and the candidates for this honor sue as eagerly for visitors as candidates for Parliament do for votes at an election. For as it sometimes happens that two ladies pitch upon the same evening for raising a riot, tis necessary they should beat up in time for volunteers. Otherwise they may chance to be defrauded of their numbers, and one of them lie under the ignominy of collecting a mob of a hundred only, while the other has the honor of assembling a well-dressed rabble of three or four hundred, which of course breaks the heart of that unfortunate lady who comes off with this immoral disgrace. 
Now as the actions of people of quality are sure of being copied, hence it comes to pass that ladies of inferior rank, resolving to be in fashion, take upon them likewise to have drums in imitation of their superiors. Only there is this difference between the two orders, that the higher call nothing but a crowd a drum, whereas the lower often give that name to the commonest parties, and for the sake of honor call an ordinary visit as assembly. This was the case with Lady Frippery. Her acquaintance in town was very small, and it seemed improbable that she could assemble above a dozen people at most, without making any allowance for colds, headaches, vapors, hysteric fits, fevers upon the spirits, and other female indispositions. Yet still she resolved to have a drum, and the young lady seconded her mamma's inclination so vehemently that Sir Thomas was obliged to comply. From the moment this great event was resolved on, all their conversations turned upon it, and it was pleasant to hear the schemes and contrivances they had about it. Their first and principal care was to secure Lady Bab Frightful, the chief of Lady Frippery's acquaintance, whose name was to give a luster to the assembly. Now Lady Bab being one of the quality, it was possible she might have a previous engagement unless she was taken in time, and therefore a card was dispatched to her in the first place to bespeak her for such an evening, and it was resolved that if any cross accident prevented her coming, new measures should be taken, and the drum be deferred till another night. Lady Bab returned for answer that she would wait on Lady Frippery if her health permitted. This dubious kind of message puzzled them in the strangest manner, and was worse than a denial, for without Lady Bab it was impossible to proceed, without Lady Bab the assembly would make no figure, and yet they were obliged to run the hazard of her not coming in consequence of her answer. Every day, therefore, they sent to inquire after her health, and their hopes rose or fell according to the word that was brought them till on the day before the drum was to be held, a most calamitous piece of news arrived, that Lady Bab was disabled by her surgeon, who in cutting her toenail had made an incision in her flesh, yet still she promised to be with them, if it was possible for her to hobble abroad. No language can describe the damp, which this fatal message struck into the whole family, but they were obliged to submit with patience, and as a glimpse of hope still remained, they had nothing left but to put up their prayers for Lady Bab's recovery. At length the important evening arrived that was to decide all their expectations and fears. Many consultations had been held every day that things might be perfect and in order when the time came. Yet notwithstanding all their precautions, a dispute arose almost at the last moment whether Lady Frippery was to receive her company at the top or bottom of the stairs. This momentous question begat a warm debate. Her ladyship and miss contended resolutely for the top of the stairs, Sir Thomas for the bottom, and Mr. Chase, who was present, observed a neutrality. At length, after a long altercation, the knight was obliged to submit to a majority of voices, though not without condemning his wife and daughter for want of politeness. "'My dear,' said he, taking a pinch of snuff with great vehemence, I am amazed that you can be guilty of such a solecism in breeding. It surprises me that you are not sensible of the impropriety of it. Will it not show much greater respect and complacence to meet your company at the bottom of the stairs than to stand like an Indian queen receiving homage at the top of them? Yes, my dear, said her ladyship, but you know my territories do not commence till the top of the stairs. Our territories do not begin below stairs, and it would be very improper for me to go out of my own dominions. Don't you see that, my dear? I am surprised at your want of comprehension to-day, Sir Thomas. Well, well, I have given it up, answered he. Have your own way, child, have your own way, my lady, and then you'll be pleased, I hope. But I am sure, in my days, people would have met their company at the bottom of the stairs. When I and Lord Oxford were in the ministry together, affairs would have been very different, but the age has lost all its civility, and people are not half so well bred as they were formerly. This reflection on modern times piqued the daughter's vanity, 
who now began to play her part in the debate. "'Yes, Papa,' said she, "'but what signifies what people did formerly? That is nothing at all to us at present, you know, for, to be sure, all people were fools formerly. I always think people were fools in former days. They never did anything as we do nowadays, and therefore it stands to reason they were all fools and idiots. Tis very manifest they had no breeding, and all the world must allow that the world never was so wise and polite and sensible and clever as it is at this moment. And for my part, I would not have lived in former days for all the world. Pooh, said the knight, interrupting her. You are a little illiterate monkey. You talk without book, child. The world is nothing to what it was in my days. Everything is altered for the worse. The women are not so near as handsome. None of you are comparable to your mothers. Nay, there, said Lady Frippery, interposing. There, Sir Thomas, I entirely agree with you. There you have my consent with all my heart. To be sure, all the celebrated girls about town are mere dowdies in comparison of their mothers, and if there could be a resurrection of beauties, they would shine only like Bristol stones in the company of diamonds. Bless me, mamma, cried the young lady, with the tears standing in her eyes. How can you talk so? There never were so many fine women in the whole world as there are now in London and tis enough to make one burst out a-crying to hear you talk. Come, Mr. Chase, why don't you stand up for us modern beauties? In the midst of this conversation there was a violent rap at the street door, whereupon they all flew to the window, crying out eagerly, There, there is Lady Bab. I am sure tis Lady Bab, for I know her footman's rap. Yet in spite of this knowledge, Lady Bab did not arrive according to their hopes, and it seemed as if her ladyship had laid a scheme to keep them in suspense, for of all people who composed this illustrious assembly, Lady Bab came the last. They took care, however, to inform the company from time to time that she was expected, by making the same observation on the arrival of every fresh coach, and still persisting that they knew her footman's rap, though they had given so many proofs to the contrary. At length, however, Lady Bab Frightful came, and it is impossible to express the joy they felt in her appearance, which revived them on a sudden from the depth of despair to the highest exaltation of happiness. Her ladyship's great toe engrossed the conversation for the first hour, whose misfortune was lamented in very pathetic terms by all the company, and many wise reflections were made upon the accident which had happened, some condemning the ignorance and others the carelessness of the surgeon, who had been guilty of such a trespass on her ladyship's flesh. Some advised her to be very careful how she walked upon it. Others recommended a larger shoe to her ladyship, and Lady Frippery, in particular, continued the whole evening to protest the vast obligations she had to her, for favouring her with her company under such an affliction. But had I an hundred hands, and as many pens, it would be impossible to describe the folly of that night. Wherefore, begging the reader to supply it by the help of his own imagination, I proceed to other parts of this history. End of Book 2, Chapter 5《Book Two, Chapter Six of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Six, in which several things are touched upon. When this great affair was over, the marriage came next upon the carpet, the celebration of which was fixed for Easter week, but Mr. Chase, recollecting in time that it would interfere with Newmarket races, procured a reprieve till the week following. At his return from those Olympic games, the nuptials were celebrated before a general assembly of their relations, and the happy couple were conducted to bed in public with great demonstrations of joy. The bridegroom took possession of the bride, and Sir Thomas took possession of Mr. Chase's estate. 
when they had shown their new clothes a little in London, they set out in a body for the country, and in a few days afterwards the lodgings on the first floor were taken by a lady who passed under the fictitious name of Mrs. Carroll. The hasty manner in which she made her agreement infused a suspicion into our milliner from the very beginning, and many circumstances soon occurred to persuade her that her new lodger was a wife eloped from her husband. For besides that she came into her lodgings late in the evening, she seemed to affect a privacy in all her actions, which plainly evidenced that she was afraid of some discovery, and this increased our milliner's curiosity in proportion as the other seemed less inclined to gratify it. But an event soon happened to confirm her conjectures, for three days after the lady's arrival, a chair stopped at the door one evening near ten o'clock, from whence alighted a well-dressed man about forty years old, who, wrapping himself up in a red cloak, proceeded hastily upstairs, as if desirous to conceal himself from observation. This adventure savored so strongly of intrigue, that it was no wonder our milliner contrived to meet him in the passage, to satisfy her curiosity with a survey of his features. For people, in whom that passion predominates, often find the greatest consolation from knowing the smallest trifles. Pompey was still more inquisitive than his mistress, and took courage to follow the gentleman into the dining-room, with a desire, I suppose, of hearing what passed in so fashionable an interview. The lady rose from her chair to receive this man of fashion, who saluted her with great complacence, and hoped she was pleased with her new apartments. "'Yes, my lord,' answered she, "'the people are civilized people enough, and I believe have no suspicion about me. But did they see your lordship come upstairs?' "'Pon my honour, ma'am,' said the peer, "'I can't tell. There was a female figure glided by me in the passage, but whether the creature made remarks or not, I did not stay to observe. Well, madame, I hope now I may give you joy of your escape, and I dare say you will find yourself much happier than you was under the ill usage of a tyrant you despised. The lady then related, with great pleasantry, the manner of her escape, and the difficulties that attended the execution of it, after which she concluded with saying, I wonder, my lord, what my husband is now thinking on. Thinking on, answered the peer, that he's a fool and a blockhead, I hope, madame, and deserve to be hanged for abusing the charms of so divine a creature. Good God, was it possible for him to harbor an ill-natured thought, while he had the pleasure of looking in that angelic face? My lord, said the lady, I know I have taken a very ill step in the eye of the world, but I have too much spirit to bear ill usage with patience, and let the consequences be what they will, I am determined to submit to them, rather than be a slave of the ill humours of a man I despised, hated, and detested. Forbear, madame, said his lordship, to think of him. My fortune, my interest, my sword, are all devoted to your service, and I am ready to execute any command you please to impose on me. But let us call a more agreeable topic of conversation." Soon after this a light but elegant supper was placed upon the table, and the servants were ordered to retire, for there are certain seasons when even the great desire to banish ostentation. The absent husband furnished them with much raillery, and they pictured to themselves continually the surprise he would be in when first he discovered his wife's elopement. Nor did this man of gallantry and fashion finish his amorous visit till past two o'clock in the morning. As he was going downstairs, he found himself again encountered by the barking of little Pompey, whom he snatched up in his arms, and getting hastily into the chair that waited for him at the door, carried him off with him to his own house. This accomplished person was Lord Marmozet, husband to that lady who was so familiar and intimate with the sharper at Bath. He was a man of consummate intrigue, a most fortunate adventurer with the fairer sex, and had the reputation of uncommon success in his amours. What made this success the more extraordinary was, that in personal charms he had nothing to boast of. Nature had given him neither a face or figure to strike the eyes of women, but these deficiencies were abundantly recompensed 
by a most happy turn of wit, a very brilliant imagination, and extensive knowledge of the world. He had the most insinuating manner of address, the readiest flow of language, and a certain art of laughing women out of their virtue, which few could imitate. It was indeed scarce possible to withstand the allurements of his conversation, and what is odd enough, the number of affairs he had been concerned in, were so far from frightening ladies from his acquaintance, that on the contrary it was fashionable and modish to cultivate an intimacy with him. They knew the danger of putting themselves in his way, and yet were ambitious of giving him opportunities. The lady we have just now seen with him had been his neighbor in the country, a very handsome woman under the tyranny of an ill-natured husband. This his lordship knew, and concluding that her aversion to her husband would make her an easy prey to a lover, watched every opportunity of being alone with her. In these stolen interviews he employed all his eloquence to seduce her, and won her so much by his flattering representation of things, that at length she courageously eloped from her tyrant, and put herself into private lodgings under the protection of his lordship. The reader need not be told that this ended in the utter ruin of the lady, who finding her reputation lost and her passionate lover soon growing indifferent, took refuge in citron waters, and by the help of those cordial lenitives of sorrow, soon bade adieu to the world and all its cares. End of Book 2, Chapter 6book two chapter seven of the history of pompey the little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the history of pompey the little or the life and adventures of a lapdog by francis coventry book two chapter seven matrimonial amusements when our hero waked the next morning and found himself in new apartments, the first thing he did was to piss on a pair of velvet breeches which lay in a chair by his lordship's bedside. After which, the door being open, he traveled forth and performed a much more disreputable action on a rich turkey carpet in my lady's dining room, having thus taken possession of his new house by these two acts of season. He returned to the bedside, and reposed himself again to sleep till his lord should please to be stirring. About ten o'clock Lord Marmozet raised himself up in the bed, and rang his bell for servants to assist him in the fatigue of putting on his clothes. The valet and chief immediately attended, undrew the curtains, and respectfully inquired his master's pleasure. In answer to which his lordship signifying that he would get up, Guillaume folded his stockings, placed his slippers by the bedside, and was going to present him with his breeches, when, lo, the crime our hero had been guilty of stared him full in the face, and gave such an air of surprise to his features that his lordship could not help asking what was the matter. Guillaume then related the misdemeanor, at which his master was so far from being angry that he only laughed at the astonishment of his valet, and calling the dog upon the bed, caressed him with as much tenderness as if he had performed the most meritorious action in the world. Then turning again to his servant, What does the booby stare at, cries he, with such amazement? I wish to God the dog had pissed in thy mouth. Prithee get a fresh pair of breeches, and let me rise. Or am I to lie abed till midnight? As soon as he was dressed in his morning dishabille, he went downstairs to breakfast, in which our hero bore him company, and had the honor of eating roll and butter in great magnificence. When breakfast was over, he recollected that it might now be time to send up compliments to his lady, which he generally performed every morning, and imagining that she would not be displeased with the present of so pretty a dog. Here, Guillaume, said he, take this little dog, and carry him up the stairs to your lady. My compliments, and desire to know how her ladyship does this morning. Tell her I found him. Pox take him. I don't know where I found him but he's a pretty little fellow, and I am sure she must be pleased with him. Though the reader must from hence conclude that Lord and Lady Marmazet repose themselves in different beds at night, he will not, I imagine, be surprised at such a circumstance in this accomplished and fashionable age. Her ladyship was a woman of great wit, pleasure, and amour. 
as well as her husband, only with a little more reserve and caution, to save appearances with the world. Her familiarity with a sharper at Bath may have already given the reader some sketch of her character, and for the rest it will be only necessary to inform him that she had spent the greatest part of her life in St. James's parish. Her husband had married her without the temptation of love, because she was a rich heiress of a noble family, and she had consented to the match with an equal indifference, only because it preserved her rank and station in the world. In consequence, they soon grew totally unconcerned about each other, but then, being both of easy, cheerful tempers, their indifferences did not sour into hatred. On the contrary, they made it a topic of wit, and when they met, to rally one another in their mutual amours. These meetings indeed were not frequent, once or twice a week perhaps at dinner, at which times they behaved with the utmost politeness and complacence. Or if they railed, it was done with so much gaiety and good humor that they only parted with the greater spirits to their evening amusements. In short, his lordship pursued his pleasures without any domestic expostulations, and her ladyship in return was permitted to live in all respects, as Juvenal expresses it, tanquam vicina mariti, more like her husband's neighbor than his wife. Her ladyship was now just awake and taking her morning tea in bed when Guillaume ascended the stairs and knocked at her chamber door. The waiting gentlewoman, being ordered out to see who it was, returned immediately to the bedside with a dog in her arms, and delivered the message that accompanied him. As her ladyship had never in her life discovered any fondness for these four-footed animals, she could not conceive the meaning of such a present, and with some disdain in her countenance ordered the fellow to carry back his puppies to his master. But when the servant was gone downstairs, bethinking herself that there might be some joke in it, which she did not perceive, and resolving not to be outdone by her husband in wit, she asked her maid eagerly if there was any such thing as a cat in the house. "'A cat, my lady!' cries the waiting gentlewoman. "'Yes, my lady, I believe there is such a thing to be found.' "'Well, then,' said her ladyship, "'go and catch it directly, and carry it with my compliments to his lordship. "'Let him know I am infinitely obliged to him for his present, "'and have sent him a cat in return for his dog.' The maid simpered without offering to stir, as not indeed conceiving her mistress to be in earnest, but having the orders repeated to her, she set out immediately to fulfill them. After much laughter below stairs among the servants, a cat at length was catched, and the waiting maid went with it in her arms to his lordship's dressing room. Having rapped at the door, and being ordered to enter, with a face half blushing and half smiling, she delivered here message in the following terms. My lady desires her compliments to your lordship, and begs the favor of you to accept of this in return for your dog. After which, dropping the grave mouser on the floor, she was preparing to run away with all haste, being ready to burst with laughter. But his lordship, who was no less diverted, called back to her, and having entertained himself with many jokes on the occasion, sent her upstairs with a fresh message to her mistress. This was immediately returned on the part of her ladyship, and many little pieces of the raillery were carried backwards and forwards, which, perhaps, might not be unentertaining. But as we are sensible with what contempt these little incidents will be conceived by the reader, if he happens to be a judge, a politician, or an alderman, we shall dwell no longer on them, and here put an end to the chapter. End of Book 2, Chapter 7 Recording by L. Lambert Lawson Book 2, Chapter 8 of The History of Pompey the Little This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paige Isinger The History of Pompey the Little or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog by Francis Coventry Book 2 Chapter 8 Not long after this, as Lord Marmoset was sitting in his study, reading some papers of state with our hero under his chair, Guillaume entered the room and informed him that Mr. Rhymer the poet was below. "'Curse Mr. Rhymer the poet, and you too for an egregious blockhead!' cries his lordship. "'Why the devil did you let the fellow in?' 
Tell him his latest political pamphlet is execrable nonsense and unintelligible jargon, and I am not at leisure to see him this morning. My lord, replied the valet, he begged me to present his humble duty to your lordship, and to inform you that a small gratuity would be very acceptable at present, for it seems his wife is ready to lie in, and he says he has not sixpence to defray the expenses of her groaning. How, cries his lordship, has that fellow the impudence to beget children? The dog pretends here to be starving, and yet has the assurance to deal in procreation. Pray thee, Guillaume, what sort of a woman is his wife? Have you seen her? Yes, my lord, answered the trusty valet. I have had the honor of seeing the lady, but I am afraid she would have no great temptations for your lordship for the poor gentlewoman has the misfortune to squint a little, which does not give a very bewitching air to her countenance, besides which she has the accomplishment of red hair into the bargain. "'Well, then,' cries the peer, "'turn the hound out of doors and bid him go to the devil. Pox take him, and if he had a handsome wife, I might be tempted to encourage him a little. But how can he expect my favor without doing anything to deserve it?' then your lordship won't be pleased to send him a small acknowledgment said the valet de chambre no replied the peer i have no money to fling away on poets and hackney writers let the fellow eat his own works if he is hungry hold stay i've thought the better of it here guillaume take this little dog since my wife won't have him and carry him to the poet my service to the gentleman and desire him to keep it for my sake. Guillaume was a man of some little humor, which had prompted him to the dignity of first pimp and ordinary to his lordship, and perceiving that his master had a mind to divert himself this morning with the miseries of an unhappy poet, he resolved that the joke should not be lost in passing through his hands. Taking the dog, therefore, from his lordship, he made haste downstairs, and accosted the expecting bard in the following manner. "'Sir, his lordship is very busy this morning, and not at leisure to see you, but he speaks very kindly of you, and begs you would do him the favor to accept of this beautiful little Bologna lap-dog.' "'Accept of a lap-dog!' cries the poet with astonishment. "'Bless me! What is the matter? Surely there must be some mistake, Mr. Guillaume.' for I cannot readily conceive of what use a Bologna lapdog can be to me. Sir, replied the valet de chambre, you may depend upon it. His lordship had some reason for making you this present, which it does not become of us to guess at. No, said the bard, I would not presume to dive into his lordship's counsels, but really now, Mr. Guillaume, a few guineas in present cash would be rather more serviceable to me than a Bologna lap-dog, and more comfortable to my poor wife and children. "'Sir,' said the valet, "'you must not distrust his lordship's generosity. Great statesmen, Mr. Rymer, always do things in a different manner from the rest of the world. There is usually something a little mysterious in their conduct. But assure yourself, sir, this dog will be the forerunner of a handsome annuity, and it would be the greatest affront imaginable not to receive him. You must never refuse anything which the great esteem a favor, Mr. Rymer, on any account, even though it should involve you and your family in everlasting ruin. His lordship desired that you would keep the dog for his sake, sir, and therefore you may be sure he has a particular regard for you when he sends you such a memorial of his affection. The unhappy poet, finding he could extort nothing from the unfeeling hands of his patron, was obliged to retire with the dog under his arms, and climbed up in a disconsolate mood to his garret, where he found his wife cooking the scrag end of a neck of mutton for dinner. The mansions of this son of Apollo were very contracted, and one would have thought it impossible for one single room to have served so many domestic purposes, 
but good housewifery finds no difficulties, and penury has a thousand inventions, which are unknown to ease and wealth. In one corner of these poetical apartments stood a flock bed, and underneath it a green Jordan presented itself to the eye, which had collected the nocturnal urine of the whole family, consisting of Mr. Rymer, his wife, and two daughters. Three rotten chairs and a half seemed to stand like traps in various parts of the room, threatening downfalls to unwary strangers, and one solitary table in the middle of this aerial garret served to hold the different treasures of the whole family. There were now lying upon it the first act of a comedy, a pair of yellow stays, two political pamphlets, a plate of bread and butter, three dirty nightcaps, and a volume of miscellany poems. The lady of the house was drowning a neck of mutton, as we before observed, in meagre soup, and the two daughters sat in the window, mending their father's brown stockings with blue worsted. Such were the mansions of Mr. Rymer, the poet, which I heartily recommend to the repeated perusal of those unhappy gentlemen who feel in themselves a growing inclination to that mischievous, damnable, and destructive science. As soon as Mr. Rymer entered the chamber, his wife deserted her cookery, to inquire the success of his visit, on which the comforts of her lying in so much depended, and seeing a dog under her husband's arm, "'Bless me, my dear,' said she, "'why do you bring home that filthy creature, to eat up our victuals? Thank heaven we have got more mouths already than we can satisfy, and I'm sure we want no addition to our family.' "'Why, my dear,' answered the poet, his lordship did me the favor to present me this morning with this beautiful little bologna lap-dog. "'Present you with a lap-dog?' cried the wife, interrupting him. "'What is it you mean, Mr. Rymer? But, however, I'm glad his lordship was in so bountiful a humor, for I'm sure that he's given you a purse of guineas to maintain the dog. Well, I vow it was a very genteel way of making a present.' and I shall love the little fool for his master's sake. Great men do things with so much address always that one is transported as much with their politeness as their generosity." Here the unhappy bard shook his head, and soon undeceived his wife, by informing her of all that had passed in his morning's visit. "'How,' said she, "'no money with the dog?' Mr. Rymer, I am amazed that you will submit to such usage. Don't you see that they make a fool and an ass and a laughing-stock of you? Why did you take their filthy dog? I'll have his brains dashed out this moment, Mr. Rymer. If you had kept on your tallow chandler's shop, I and mine should have had wherewithal to live. But you must court the draggle-tail muses forsooth, and a fine provision they have made for you. Here I expect to be brought to bed every day, and you have not money to buy pap and coddle. Oh, curse your lords and your political pamphlets! I'm sure I have reason to repent the day that ever I married a poet." Madam, said Mr. Rymer, exasperated his wife at his wife's conversation, you ought rather to bless the day that married you to a gentleman whose soul despises mechanical trades and is devoted to the noblest science in the universe. Poetry, madam, like virtue, is its own reward. But you have a vulgar notion of things. You have an illiberal attachment to money, and had rather be frying grease in a tallow chandler's shop than listening to the divine rhapsodies of the Heliconian maids. Tis true, madam, his lordship has not recompensed my labors according to expectation this morning. But what of that? He bid me proceed in the execution of my design, and undoubtedly means to reward me. Lords are often destitute of cash, as well as poets, and perhaps I came upon him a little unseasonably, when his coffers were empty. But I auspicate great things from his present of a dog. A dog, madam, is the emblem of fidelity." "'The emblem of a fiddlestick!' cried the wife, interrupting him. I tell you, Mr. Rymer, you are a fool, and have ruined your family by your senseless whims and projects. A gentleman, quotha! Yes, forsooth, a very fine gentleman, truly, that is hardly a shirt to his back or a pair of shoes to his feet. 
Look at your daughters there in the window, and see whether they appear like a gentleman's daughters. And for my part, I have not an under petticoat that I can wear. You have had three plays damned, Mr. Rymer. And one would think that might have taught you a little prudence. But do fetch me, if you shall write any more, for I'll burn all this nonsense that lies upon the table. So saying, she flew like a bacchanal fury at his works and with savage hands was going to commit them to the flames had she not been interrupted by her husband's voice crying out with impatience see 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 my dear the pot boils over the broth it's running away into the fire this luckily put an end to their altercation and postponed the sacrifice that was going to be made they then sat down to dinner without a tablecloth and made a wretched meal envying one another every morsel that escaped their own mouths and tis highly probable poor pompey would soon have fallen a sacrifice to hunger and been served up at mr rymer's poetical table had not an accident luckily happened to relieve him from this scene of misery squalidness and posy end of book two chapter eight Book Two, Chapter Nine of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Paige Isinger. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lap Dog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Nine. After dinner was over, Mr. Rymer sat himself down to an epic poem, which was then on the anvil, and his head not being clouded with any fumes of indigestion, he worked at it very laboriously till eight or nine o'clock in the evening. Then he took his hat and went out to meet a club of authors, who assembled every Monday night at a little dirty dog-hole of a tavern in Shire Lane, to eat tripe, drink porter, and pass their judgments on the books of the preceding week. Pompey waited on his master, for as Mrs. Rymer had resolutely vowed his destruction, the good-natured bard did not choose to leave him at her mercy. On their arrival in the club room, they found there assembled a free-thinking writer of moral essays, a no-thinking scribbler of magazines, a Scotch translator of Greek and Latin authors, a Grub Street bookseller, and a fleet parson. These worthy gentlemen immediately surrounded Mr. Rymer with great vociferation and began to curse him for staying so long, declaring it would be entirely his fault if the tripe was spoilt which they very much feared, to prevent which, however, they now ordered it to be served up with all possible expedition, and on its appearance fell to work with the quickest dispatch. The reader will believe that little or no conversation passed among them at table, their mouths being much too busily employed to have any leisure for discourse. But when the tripe was quite consumed, and innumerable slices of toasted cheese at the end of it, then they began to exercise their tongues as readily as they had before done their teeth. By odd luck, every one of these great advancers of modern literature happened to have a dog attending him, and as the gentlemen drew round the fire after supper in a ring, the dogs likewise made an interior semicircle, sitting between the legs of their respective masters. This could not escape the observation of the company, and many trite reflections began to be made on their fidelity, their attachment to man, and above all on the felicity of their condition. For a dog sleeping before a fire is by all people esteemed an emblem of complete happiness. At length they struck into a higher conversation. Gentlemen, says the freethinker, I should be glad to hear your sentiments concerning reason and instinct. I have a curious treatise now by me, which I design very soon to astonish the world with. Tis upon a subject perfectly new, 
and those dogs there put me in the head of it. The clergy, I know, will be up in arms against me. But no matter, I'll publish my opinions in spite of all the priests in Europe. Here the fleet parson, thinking himself concerned, took his pipe from his mouth with great deliberation and said, I don't know what your opinions may be, but I hope you don't design to publish anything to the disadvantage of that sacred order to which I belong. If you do, sir, I believe you'll find pens enough ready to answer you. Yes, sir, no doubt I will, replied the free thinker, and who cares for that? Perhaps you, sir, may do me the honor to be my antagonist, but I defy you all. I defy the whole body of the priesthood. Sir, I love to advance a paradox. I love a paradox at my heart, sir, and I'll, I'll show you some sport very shortly. What do you mean by sport, sir? cries the doctor. If you write as you talk, I hope you'll be set in the pillory for your sport. You are bloody complacent, sir, returned the free thinker. But I'd have you to know we are not come to such a pass yet in this country as to persecute people for searching after truth. You priests, I know, would be glad to keep us all in ignorance, but the age won't be priest-ridden any longer. There is a noble spirit and freedom of inquiry now subsisting in the nation. People are determined to canvass things freely and go to the bottom of all subjects without regarding base prejudices of education. The shops abound with a number of fine treatises written every day against religion to the honor and glory of the nation. To its shame and damnation, rather, cries the fleet parson. But what is your paradox, sir? Why, this is my paradox, sir, replied the free thinker. I undertake to prove that brutes think and have intellectual faculties. That perhaps you'll say is no novelty, because many others have asserted the same thing before me, but I go farther, sir, and maintain that they are reasonable creatures, amoral and gents. And I will maintain that they are mere machines, cries the parson, against you and all the atheists in the world. Sir, you may be ashamed to prostitute the noble faculty of reason to the beasts of the field. Don't tell me of reason, said the free thinker. I don't care one half penny for reason. What is reason, sir? What is reason, sir? resumed the doctor. Why, reason, sir, is a most noble faculty of the soul the noblest of all the faculties. It discerns and abstracts, and compares and compounds in all that. And roasts eggs too, does it not? You forgot one of its noble faculties, cries the other. But I will maintain that brutes are capable of reason, and that they have given manifest proofs of it. Did you never hear of Mr. Locke's parrot, sir? that held a very rational conversation with Prince Maurice for half an hour? What say you to that, sir? By my faith, gentlemen, said the Scotch translator, interrupting them, upon my word, you are got here into a very deep mysterious question, which I do not very well understand what to make of. But by my faith I have always thought brutes to have something particular in their intellectual faculties of their souls, ever since I read, what do you call him there, the Roman historian? For why? You know he tells us how the geese discovered to the Romans that the Gauls were coming to plunder the capital. Now by my soul they must have been a damned sensible flock of geese, and very great lovers of their country too, which let me tell ya is the greatest virtue under heaven. 
Besides, doth not Homer teach us that Ulysses dog Argus knew his old master at his return home after he had been absent ten or twelve years at the siege of Troy? Now, by Jove, he was a plaguy cunning dog, and had a devilish good memory, otherwise he could not have remembered his old crony so long. Before the Scotchman had finished his speech, the two other disputants, whose spirits were kindled with controversy, resumed their argument, and fell upon one another again with so much impetuosity that no voices could be heard but their own. The scene which now ensued consisted chiefly of noise and scolding equal to anything that passes among the orators at Robin Hood's alehouse. In short, there was not a scurrilous term in the English language which was not vented on this occasion, till at length the fleet parson, heated with rage and beer, flung his pipe at his antagonist, and was proceeding to blows had he not been restrained by the rest of the company. The festivity of the evening being by this means destroyed, the club soon afterwards broke up, and the several members of it retired to their several garrets. As Mr. Rymer was walking home in a pensive solitary mood, wrapped up in contemplation on the stars of heaven, and perhaps forgetting for a few moments that he had but threepence halfpenny in his pocket, two young gentlemen of the town, who were upon the hunt after amorous game, followed close at his heels. They quickly smoked him for a queer fish, as the phrase is, and began to hope for some diversion at his expense. The moon now shone very bright, and Mr. Rymer, whose eyes were fixed with rapture on that glorious luminary, began to apostrophize her in some poetical strains from Milton, which he repeated with great emphasis aloud. In the midst of this, the two gentlemen broke out in a profuse fit of laughter, at which the bard turned round in surprise, but soon recovering himself, he cast a most contemptuous look at them for their ignorance and want of taste. However, as the chain of ideas in his mind was by this means disturbed, he thought it most advisable to make the best of his way home, and for that purpose called Pompey to follow him. Pompey indeed made many efforts, and seemed desirous to obey, but in vain the poet called, in vain the dog endeavored to follow, and it was a long while before Mr. Rymer, whose thoughts were a little muddled with contemplation and porter, found out that the two gentlemen had tied a handkerchief around his neck. He then stopped to demand his property, but finding himself pretty roughly handled, he began to think his own person in danger. Taking to his heels, therefore, he ran away with the utmost precipitation, and left his dog behind him, who on his part was not at all sorry to be delivered from such a master. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine Book Two, Chapter Ten of History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Walsh. The History of Pompey the Little or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Ten. Our hero goes to the University of Cambridge. From the street where this fray happened, our hero was introduced to a bagnio, where the two young gentlemen, his new masters, spent their night in the delights of love, and the next morning he set out with one of them to the University of Cambridge. The young Cantab, who now took possession of him, had come up to London upon a scheme, as it is called, to treat himself with the masquerade and other diversions of the town. For being a gentleman of a lively, enterprising temper, he could not brook the dull restraints of a colleague at life, and seldom resided there about three or four days at a time. He had received the first part of his education at Westminster School, where he had acquired what is usually called a very pretty knowledge of the town. That is to say, he had been introduced at the age of thirteen into the most noted bagnios, was acquainted with the most celebrated women of pleasure, and could drink his two bottles of claret in an evening, without being disordered in his understanding. At the age of seventeen it was judged proper for him, merely out of fashion, and to be like other young gentlemen of his acquaintance, to take lodgings at a university, whither he went with a hearty contempt of the place, and a determined resolution never to receive any profit from it. He had been admitted 
under a tutor who knew no more of the world than if he had been bred up in a forest, and whose sour, pedantic genius was ill-qualified to cope with the vivacity and spirit of a young gentleman, warm in the pursuit of pleasure, and one who required much address and very artful management, to make any kind of restraint palpable and easy to him. He had been admitted in the rank of a fellow commoner, which, according to the definition given by a member of the university in a court of justice, is one who sits at the same table and enjoys the conversation of the fellows. It differs from what is called the gentleman commoner at Oxford, not only in the name, but also in the greater privileges and licenses indulged to members of this order, who do not only enjoy the conversation of the fellows, but likewise a full liberty of following their own imaginations and everything. For as tutors and governors of colleges have usually pretty sagacious noses after preferment, they think it impolitic to cross the inclinations of young gentlemen, who are heirs to great estates, and from whom they expect benefices and dignities hereafter, as rewards for their want of care of them, while they were under their protection. From hence it comes to pass that pupils of this rank are excused from all public exercises, and allowed to absent themselves at pleasure from the private lectures in their tutor's rooms. As often as they have made a party for hunting or an engagement at the tennis court, or are not well recovered from their evening state bunch. And whilst a poor unhappy sop of no fortune is often expelled for the most trivial offenses, or merely to humor the capricious resentment of his tutor who happens to dislike his pace, Young noblemen and heirs of great estates may commit any illegalities, and if they please, overturn a college with impunity. There is nothing so wild and ungovernable as a boy just broke loose from school and taking his first flight of liberty at a university. This is the case with those who have been bred up at private schools under some restraint, but as the Pompey's master, his school education had set him very forward in the world, and he came to Cambridge much riper than other people leave it. From the first moment he distinguished himself for his intrepid spirit and was quickly chosen captain general by his comrades, in all their parties of pleasure and expeditions of jollity, many pranks are recorded of his performing, which made the plays resound with his name, but one of his exploits being attended with circumstances of very droll nature we cannot forbear retelling. There was in the same college a young master of arts, Williams by name, who had been elected into the society in preference to one of greater genius and learning, because he used to make a lower bow to the fellows whenever he passed by them, and was not likely to disgrace any of his seniors by the superiority of his parts. The gentleman concluding now, there was no further occasion of study, after he had obtained a fellowship, which he had long been the object of his ambition, gave himself over to pursuits more agreeable to his temper, and spent the chief of his time in drinking tea with barbers' daughters and other young ladies of fashion in the university, who there take themselves the name of Mrs., who receive amorous gownsmen at their rulers, for nothing more is necessary to accomplish a young lady at Cambridge than a second-hand capuchin, a white washing gown, a pair of dirty silk shoes, and a long muslin ruffles in which dress they take the air in the public walks every Sunday, to make conquests and receive their admirers all the rest of the week at their tea-tables. Now Williams, having a great deal of dangling good nature about him, was very successful in winning the affections of these academical misses, and had a large acquaintance among them. The three Miss Higginses, whose mother kept the Sun Tavern, Miss Polly Jackson, a baker's daughter, the celebrated Fanny Hill, sole heiress of a tailor, and Miss Jenny of the Coffee House, were all great admirers of our college gallant, and fame reported that he had admission to some of their bedchambers as well as their tea tables. Upon this presumption, our young fellow commoner laid his head together with other young gentlemen and his comrades to play a trick, which we now proceed to disclose. About this time, a bedmaker of the college was unfortunately brought to bed, without having any husband to father the child, and as our master of arts was suspected, among others, to have had a share in the generation of the newborn infant, being a gentleman of an amorous nature, it occurred to our fellow commoner to make the following experiment upon him. 
As Mr. Williams was coming out of his chamber one morning early to go to chapel, he found a basket standing at his door on the top of the staircase, with a direction to himself and a letter tied to the handle of the basket. He stood some little time guessing from whom such a gift should come, but as he had expected a parcel from London by the coach for a week before, he naturally concluded this to be the same and that it had been brought by a porter from the inn, and left at his door before he was awake in the morning. At this thought he opened the letter and read to the following effect. Honorable Sir, I am surprised you should use me in such a manner. I have never seen one farthing of your money since it was brought to bed, which is a shame and a wicked sin. Wherefore I have sent you your own pastor to provide for, and am your dutiful servant to come in until death. Betty Trollope. The astonishment which seized our master of arts at the perusal of his letter may easily be imagined, but not so easily described. He turned pale, staggered, and looked like Banquio's ghost in the play. But as his conscience excused him from the crime and his charge, he resolved, as soon as his confusion would suffer him to resolve, to make a public example of the wretch that had dared to lay your iniquities at his door. To this end, as soon as chapel was over, he desired the master of the college to convene all the fellows in the common room, for he said he had an affair of great consequence to lay before them. When the Reverend Divin was met according to his desire, he produced the basket, and with an audible voice read the letter, which had been annexed to it, after which he made a long oration on the unparalleled impudence of the harlot, and attempted to scandalize him in this audacious manner. He concluded with desiring the most exemplary punishment might be inflicted on her. For he said, unless they discourage such a piece of villainy with proper severity, it might hereafter be their own lots. If they were remiss in punishing the present offender, they all heard him with great astonishment, and many of them seemed to rejoice inwardly that the basket had not traveled to their doors, as thinking perhaps it would have been unfatherly and unnatural to have refused it admittance. At length it was ordered to be unpacked, which was performed by the butler of the college in presence of the whole fraternity, when, lo, instead of a child pulling and crying for its father, out leapt Pompey, the little hero of this little history, who had been enclosed in the Oisier confinement by his young master, and conveyed very early in the morning to Mr. William's chamber door. The grave assembly were astonished and enraged at the discovery, finding themselves convened only to be ridiculed and all of them gazed on our hero with the same kind of aspect as did the daughters of Cecrops on the deformed Erichthonius, when their curiosity tempted them to peep into the basket which Minerva had put into their hands with positive commands to the contrary. End of Book 2, Chapter 10 Recording by Brianna Walsh, Malden, Massachusetts Book Two, Chapter Eleven of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. Chapter Eleven: Adventures at Cambridge. Williams, though much ashamed and out of countenance, was yet in his heart very glad to be relieved from the apprehensions of maintaining a bastard, which he imagined would add no great luster to his reputation as fellow of a college. When, therefore, Pompey escaped out of his wicker prison, he was in reality pleased with the discovery, which put an end to his fears, and feigning himself diverted with the thing, took the little dog home to his own chambers. This was an adventure of the comic kind, attended with no ill consequences to our hero. But we now proceed to relate one of a very tragic nature indeed, which fortune seems to have reserved in store as the utmost stretch of her malice to complete the miseries of his unhappy life. There flourished at this college, or rather was beginning to flourish, a young physician, who now stood candidate for fame and practice. He had equipped himself with a gilt-headed cane, a black suit of clothes, a wise mysterious face, a full-bottom flowing peruke, and all other externals of his profession, so that, if according to the inimitable Swift, the various members of a commonwealth are only so many different suits of clothes, this gentleman was amply qualified for the discharge of his office. 
but not choosing to rely totally on his dress to introduce him into business he was willing to add to it a supplemental and as many think superfluous knowledge of his art about this time a member of the university died in great torments of the iliac passion and some peculiarities in his case made a noise among the faculty of cambridge the theory of this terrible disorder caused by the cessation of the peristaltic motion of the guts our young doctor very well understood but not contenting himself with theory only he resolved to go a step further and for this purpose cast his eyes about after some dog intending to dissect him alive for the satisfaction of his curiosity a dog might have been the emblematic animal of esculapius or apollo with as much propriety as he was of mercury for no creatures i believe have been of more eminent service to the healing tribe than dogs incredible is the number of these animals who have been sacrificed from time to time at the shrines of physic and surgery Lectures of anatomy subsist by their destruction. Ward, says Mr. Pope, tried his drop on puppies and the poor, and in general all new medicines and experiments of a doubtful nature are sure to be made in the first place on the bodies of these unfortunate animals. Their very ordeur is one of the chief articles of the materia medica, and I am persuaded, if the old Egyptians had any physicians among them, they certainly described him by the hieroglyphic of a dog. But not to spend too much time in these conjectures, our young doctor had no sooner resolved to satisfy himself concerning the peristaltic motion of the guts than unluckily, in an evil hour, Pompey presented himself to his eye. More unluckily for him still, neither his master Mr. Williams nor any of his other college friends happened to be present or within view at this moment. Matchion, therefore, very boldly seized him as a victim and conveyed him into a little dark place near his room, which he called his cellar and in which he kept his wine. There he shut him up for three or four days in the condemned hole, while he prepared his surgical instruments and invited some other young practitioners in physic of his acquaintance to be present at our hero's dissection. The day being soon appointed for his death, the company assembled at their friend's room in the morning at breakfast, where much sapient discourse passed among them concerning the operation in hand, not material to be now related. At length cries the hero of the party, Come, gentlemen, we seem, I think, to have finished our breakfast. Let us now proceed to business after which the tea things were removed the instruments of dissection placed on the table and the doctor went to his cellar to bring forth the unhappy victim and here good-natured reader i am sure it moves thy compassion to think that poor pompey after suffering already so many misfortunes must at last be dissected alive to satisfy a physician concerning the peristaltic motion of the guts the case would indeed be lamentable if it had happened but when the doctor came to call him forth to execution to his great surprise no dog was there to be found he found however something else not entirely to his satisfaction and that was his wine streaming in great profusion about his cellar the truth is our hero being grown desperate with hunger had in his struggles for liberty broke all the bottles and at last forcibly gnawed his way through a deal board that composed one side of the cellar the danger however which he had been in made him sick of universities and he wished earnestly for an accident which soon happened to relieve him from an academic life end of book two chapter eleven book two chapter twelve of the history of pompey the little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog by Francis Coventry. Book 2, Chapter 12. Chapter 12. The Character of a Master of the Arts at a University. About this time, three ladies and a gentleman happened to be returning out of the north, and never having seen Cambridge, were inclined to make it in their way to London. The gentleman whom they had been visiting in the country, knowing this resolution, sent a letter beforehand to Mr. Williams, who had been his fellow collegiate, in which he advertised him of the arrival of the party, and desired him to be assistant in showing them the curiosities of Cambridge. And this gives us an opportunity of explaining some further particulars in that gentleman's character, being not an uncommon one, I believe, in either of our universities. If we were in a hurry to describe him, it might be done effectually in two or three words, by calling him a most egregious trifler. But as we have leisure to be a little more circumstantial, the reader shall be troubled with a day's journal of his actions. Mr. Williams was, in the first place, a man of the most puncticulous neatness. His shoes were always blackened in the nicest manner, his wigs were powdered with the exactest delicacy, and he would scold his laundress for a whole morning together if he discovered a wry pleat in the sleeve of his shirt, or the least speck of dirt on any part of his linen. He rose constantly to chapel, and proceeded afterwards with great importance to breakfast, which, moderately speaking, took up the two hours of his morning. 
When this was over, he amused himself either in paring his nails, or watering two or three orange trees, which he kept in his chamber, or in tilling a little spot of ground about six feet square, which he called his garden, or in changing the situation of the few books in his study. The spectators were removed into the place of the tattlers, and the tattlers into the place of the spectators. But generally speaking, he drew on his boots immediately after breakfast, and rode out for the air having been told that a sedentary life is destructive of the constitution, and that too much study impairs the health. At his return home, he had barely time to wash his hands, clean his teeth, and put on a fresh powdered wig before the college bell summoned him to dinner in the public hall. His afternoons were spent in drinking tea with the young ladies above mentioned, who all esteemed him a prodigious genius, and were ready to laugh at his wit before he opened his mouth. In these agreeable visits, he remained till the time of evening chap after which supper succeeded to find him fresh employment from whence he repaired to the coffee-house and then to some engagement at a friend's room for the remaining part of the evening by this account of the day's transactions the reader will see how very impossible it was for him to find leisure for study in the midst of so many important avocations yet notwithstanding this great variety of business he made a shift sometimes to play half a tune on the german flute in the morning and once in a quarter of a year took the pains to transcribble a sermon out of various authors. Another part of his character was a great affection of politeness, which is more pretended to in universities, where less of it is practiced than in any other part of the kingdom. Thus, Mr. Williams was always talking of genteel life, to which end he was plentifully provided with stories by a female cousin who kept a milliner's shop in London, and never failed to let him know by letters what passed among the great though she frequently mistook the names of people, and attributed scandal to one lord which was their property of another. Her cousin, however, did not find out the mistakes, but retailed her blunders about the colleges with great confidence and security. But nothing pleased him more than showing the university to strangers, and especially to ladies, which he thought gave him an air of acquaintance with the genteel world, and on such occasions he would affect to make expensive entertainments which neither his private fortune or the income of his fellowship could afford. To this gentleman, the party we have spoken of was recommended, and he had lived in expectation of their coming for several days together, in consequence of his friend's letter. At length they arrived, and sent him a message from their inn, desiring the favor of his company at supper. This he no sooner received than he posted away with all imaginable dispatch, and with many academical compliments welcomed them to Cambridge. Nor did he depart to his college till he had made them promise to dine with him at his chambers the succeeding day. Early then the next morning he rose with the lark, and held a consultation with the college cook concerning the entertainment, for as he had never yet been honored with company of so high a rank, he resolved to do what was handsome, and send them away with an opinion of his politeness. Among many other devices he had to be genteel, one very well deserves mentioning, being of a very academical nature indeed, for he was at the expense of purchasing a china vase of a certain shape, which sometimes passes under a more vulgar name, to set in his bedchamber that if the lady should choose to retire after dinner for the sake of looking at the pattern of his bed, or to see the prospect out of his window, or from any other motive of curiosity, they might have the pleasure of being served in China. When these affairs were settled, he dressed himself in his best array, and went to bid the ladies good morrow. As soon as they had breakfasted, he conducted them about the university, and showed them all the rarities of Cambridge. They observed that such a thing was very grand, that another thing was very neat, and that there were a great many books in the libraries, which they thought it impossible for any man to read, though he was to live as long as Methuselah. When their curiosity was satisfied, and Williams had indulged every wish of vanity, in being seen to escort ladies about the university, and to hand them out of their coach, they all retired to his chambers for dinner. Much conversation passed, not worth recording, and when the cloth was taken away, little Pompey was produced on the table for the ladies to admire him. They were greatly struck with his beauty, and one of them took courage to ask him as a present, which the complacent master of arts and his great civility complied with, and immediately delivered him into the lady's hands. He likewise related the story how he came into his possession, which another person perhaps would have suppressed. But Williams was so transported with his company, that he was half out of his wits with joy, and his conversation was as ridiculous as his behavior. End of Book 2 Chapter 12book two chapter thirteen of the history of pompey the little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or The Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book 2, Chapter 13. Pompey Returns to London, and Occasions a Remarkable Dispute in the Mall. Once more, then, our hero set out for the metropolis of Great Britain, and after an easy journey of two days arrived at a certain square, where his mistresses kept their court. To these ladies, not improperly, might be applied the question which Archer asks in the play, Pray, which of you three is the old lady? The mother being full as youthful and airy as the daughter's, and the daughters almost as ancient as the mother. Now as fortune often disposes things in the most whimsical and surprising manner, so it happened that one of his mistresses took him with her one morning into St. James's Park, and set him down on his legs almost in the very same part of the mall from whence he had formerly made his escape from Lady Tempest near eight years before, as is recorded in the first part of his history. Her ladyship was walking this morning for the air, and happened to pass by almost at the very instant that the little adventurer was set on his legs to take his diversion. She spied him in a moment, with great quickness of discernment, and immediately recollecting her old acquaintance, caught him up in her arms, and fell to kissing him with the greatest extravagance of joy. His present owner perceiving this, and thinking only that the lady was pleased with the beauty of her dog, and had a mind to compliment him with a few kisses, passed on without interrupting her. But when she saw her ladyship preparing to carry him out of the mall in her arms, she advanced hastily towards her, and redemanded her favourite in the following terms. "'Pray, madam, what is your ladyship going to do with that dog?' Lady Tempest replied, "'Nothing in the world, madam, but take him home with me.' "'And pray, madam, what right has your ladyship to take a dog that belongs to me?' "'None, my dear,' answered Lady Tempest, "'but I take him, child, because he belongs to me.' "'Tis false,' said the other lady. "'I aver it to be false. "'He was given me by a gentleman of Cambridge, "'and I insist upon your ladyship's replacing him upon his legs "'this individual moment.' "'To this Lady Tempest replied only with a sneer,' and was walking off with our hero, which so greatly aggravated the rage of her antagonist, that she now lost all patience, and began to exert herself in a much higher key. Madame, said she, I would have you know, madame, that I am not to be treated in the superlative manner. Your ladyship may affect to sneer, if you please, madame, and show a contempt, madame, which is more due to your own actions than to me, madame, for, thank heaven, I have some regard to decency in my actions. Dear miss, don't be in a passion, replied Lady Tempest. It will spoil your complexion, child, and perhaps ruin your fortune. But will you be pleased to know, my dear, that I lost this dog eight years ago in the mall, and advertised him in all the newspapers? Though you or your friend at Cambridge, who did me the favor to steal him, were not so obliging as to restore him? And will you be pleased to know likewise, young lady, that I have a right to take my property wherever I find it? "'Tis impossible!' cried the other lady. "'Tis impossible to remember a dog after eight years' absence. I aver it to be impossible, and nothing shall persuade me to believe it." "'I protest, my dear,' answered Lady Tempest, "'I know not what sort of a memory you may be blessed with, but really I can remember things of a much longer date. And as a fresh instance of my memory, I think, my dear, I remember you representing the character of a young lady for near these twenty years about town. Madame, returned the lady of inferior rank, now inflamed with the highest indignation, you may remember yourself, madame, representing a much worse character, madame, for a greater number of years. It would be well, madame, if your memory was not altogether so good, madame, unless your actions were better. The war of tongues now began to rage with the greatest violence, and nothing was spared that wit could suggest on the one side, or malice on the other. The bows and bells and whitlings, who were walking that morning in the mall, assembled round the combatants, at first out of curiosity, and for the sake of entertainment. 
but they soon began to take sides in the dispute, till at length it became one universal scene of wrangle, and no cause in Westminster Hall was ever more puzzled by the multitude of voices all contending at once for the victory. At last, Lady Tempest, scorning this ungenerous altercation, told her adversary, "'Well, madame, if you please to scold for the public diversion, pray continue. But for my part, I shall no longer make myself the spectacle of a mob.' And so saying, she walked courageously off with little Pompey under her arm. It was impossible for her rival to prevent her, who likewise immediately after quitted the mall and flew home, ready to burst with shame, spite, and indignation. Lady Tempest had not been long at her toilette before the following little scroll was brought to her, and she was informed that a footman waited below in a great hurry for an answer. The note was to this effect. Madame, if it was possible for me to wonder at any of your actions, I should be astonished at your behavior of this morning. Restore my dog by the bearer of this letter, or by the living God, I will immediately commence a prosecution against you in chancery, and recover him by force of law. Yours, blank. Lady Tempest, without any hesitation, returned the following answer. Madame, I have laughed most heartily at your ingenious epistle, and am prodigiously diverted with your menaces of a lawsuit. Pompey shall be ready to put in his answer as soon as he hears your bill is filed against him in chancery. I am, dear Miss, yours, Tempest. End of Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. Book Two, Chapter Fourteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little or the life and adventures of a lapdog by francis coventry book two chapter fourteen a terrible misfortune happens to our hero which brings his history to a conclusion this letter inflamed the lady so much that she immediately ordered her coach and drove away to lincoln's inn to consult her solicitor she found him in his chambers surrounded with briefs and haranguing to two gentlemen who had made him arbitrator in a very important controversy concerning the dilapidations of a pigsty. On the arrival of Our Lady, the man of law started from his chair and conducted her with much civility to a settee which stood by his fireside, then turning to his two clients, whom he thought he had already treated with a proper quantity of eloquence. Well, gentlemen, said he, when your respective attorneys have drawn up your several cases, let them be sent to me, and I'll give determination upon them with all possible dispatch. This speech had the desired effect in driving them away, and as soon as they were gone, addressing himself with an affectation of much politeness to the mistress of little Pompey, he began to inquire after the good lady her mother, and the good lady her sister. But our heroine was so impatient to open her cause, that she hardly allowed herself time to answer his questions, before she began in the following manner. Sir, I was walking this morning in the mall, when a certain extraordinary lady, whose actions are always of a very extraordinary nature, was pleased, in a most peculiar manner, to steal my lap-dog from me. Steal your lap-dog from you, madame, said the man of law. I protest a very extraordinary transaction indeed. And pray, madame, what could induce her to be guilty of such a misbehavior? induce her cried the lady eagerly sir she wants no inducement to be guilty of anything that is audacious and impudent but sir i desire you would immediately commence a suit against her in chancery and push the affair on with all possible rapidity for i am resolved to recover the dog if it costs me ten thousand pounds the counsellor smiled and commended her resolutions but paused a little and seemed puzzled at the novelty of the case. Madame, said he, undoubtedly your ladyship does right to assert your property, for we should all soon be reduced to a state of nature if there were no courts of law, and therefore your ladyship is highly to be applauded. But there is something very peculiar in the nature of dogs. There is no question, madame, 
but they are to be considered under the denomination of property, and not to be deemed ferroe naturae, things of no value, as ignorant people foolishly imagine. But I say, madame, there is something very peculiar in their nature, madame. Their prodigious attachment to man inclines them to follow anybody that calls them, and that makes it so difficult to fix a theft. Now, if a man calls a sheep, or calls a cow, or calls a horse, why, he might call long enough before they would come, because they are not creatures of a following nature, and therefore our penal laws have made it felony with respect to those animals. But dogs, madame, have a strange undistinguished proneness to run after people's heels. Lord bless me, sir, said the lady, somewhat angry at the orator's declamation. What do you mean, sir, by following people's heels? I do protest and asservate that she took him up in her arms and carried him away in defiance of me, and the whole mall was witness of the theft. Very well, madame, very well, replied the counsellor. I was only stating the case fully on the defendant's side, that you might have a comprehensive view of the whole affair, before we come to unravel it all again, and show the advantages on the side of the plaintiff. Now, though a dog be of a following nature, as I observed, and may be sometimes tempted, and seduced, and inveigled away in such a manner, as makes it difficult, do you observe me, makes it difficult, I say, madame, to fix a theft on the person seducing. Yet, wherever property is discovered and claimed, if the possessor refuses to restore it on demand, on demand, I say, because demand must be made, refuses to restore it on demand, to the proper lawful owner, there an action lies, and under this predicament we shall recover our lapdog. The lady seeming pleased with this harangue, the orator continued in the following manner. If therefore, madame, this lady, whoever she is, A or B, or any name serves our purpose, if, I say, this extraordinary lady, as your ladyship just now described her, took your dog before witnesses, and refused to restore it on demand, why then we have a lawful action, and shall recover damages. Pray, madame, do you think you can swear to the identity of the dog, if he should be produced in a court of justice? The lady answered, yes, she could swear to him amongst a million, for there never was so remarkable a creature. And you first became possessed of him, you say, madame, at the University of Cambridge. Pray, madame, will the gentleman who invested you with him be ready to testify the donation? She answered affirmatively. And pray, madame, what is the color of your dog? Black and white, sir. A male or female, madame? To this the lady replied, she positively could not tell. Whereupon the counsellor, with a most sapient aspect, declared he would search his books for a precedent, and wait on her in a few days, to receive her final determinations, but advised her, in the meanwhile, to try the effect of another letter upon her ladyship, and once more threaten her with a prosecution. He then waited upon her to her chariot, observed that it was a very fine day, and promised to use his utmost endeavors to reinstate her in the possession of her lapdog. This was the state of a quarrel between two ladies for a dog, and it seemed as if all the mouths of the law would have opened on this important affair, for Lady Tempest continued obstinate in keeping him, had not a most unlucky accident happened to balk those honourable gentlemen of their fees, and disappoint them of so hopeful a topic for showing their abilities. This unfortunate stroke was nothing less than the death of our hero, who was seized with a violent physic, and after a week's illness departed this life on the 2nd of June, 1749, and was gathered to the lapdogs of antiquity. From the moment that he fell sick, his mistress spared no expense for his recovery, and had him attended by the most eminent physicians of London, who, I am afraid, rather hastened than delayed his exit, according to the immemorial custom of that right venerable fraternity. The chambermaids took it by turns, to sit up with him every night during his illness, and her ladyship was scarce ever away from him in the daytime. But alas, his time was come, his hourglass was run out, and nothing could save him from paying a visit to the Plutonian regions. It is difficult to say whether her ladyship's sorrow now, or when she formerly lost him at the mall, most exceeded the bounds of reason. 
he lay in state three days after his death, and her ladyship, at first, took a resolution of having him embalmed, but as her physicians informed her the art was lost, she was obliged to give over that chimerical project. Otherwise, our posterity might have seen him, some centuries hence, erected in a public library at a university, and who knows but some antiquary of profound erudition might have undertaken to prove, with quotations from a thousand authors, that he was formerly the Egyptian Anubis. However, though her ladyship could not be gratified in her desires of embalming him, she had him buried, with great funeral solemnity, in her garden, and erected over him an elegant marble monument, which was inscribed with the following epitaph, by one of the greatest elegiac poets of the present age. King of the garden, blooming rose, which sprangst from Venus's heavenly woes, when weeping for Adonis slain, her pearly tears bedewed the plain, here now thy precious dews distill, now mourn a greater beauty's ill. Ye lilies, hang your drooping head, ye myrtles weep, for Pompey dead. Light lie the turf upon his breast, peace to his shade and gentle rest. End of Book Two, Chapter Fourteen Book Two, Chapter Fifteen of the History of Pompey the Little. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Pompey the Little, or the Life and Adventures of a Lapdog, by Francis Coventry. Book Two, Chapter Fifteen The Conclusion. Having thus traced our hero to the fourteenth year of his age, which may be reckoned the threescore and ten of a lapdog, nothing now remains but to draw his character for the benefit and information of posterity. In so doing, we imitate the greatest and most celebrated historians, Lord Clarendon, Dr. Middleton, and others, who, when they have put a period to the life of an eminent person, and such undoubtedly was our hero, finish all with a description of his morals, his religion, and private character. Nay, many biographers go so far as to record the color of their hero's complexion, the shade of his hair, the height of his stature, the manner of his diet, when he went to bed at night, at what hour he rose in the morning, and other equally important particulars, which cannot fail to convey the greatest satisfaction and improvement to their readers. Thus a certain painter, who obliged the world with a life of Milton, informs us with an air of great importance, quote, that he was a short, thick man, end quote, and then recollecting himself, informs us a second time, upon maturer deliberation, quote, that he was not a short, thick man, but if he had been a little shorter and a little thicker, he would have been a short, thick man, end quote, which prodigious exactness, in an affair of such consequence, can never be sufficiently applauded. Now as to the description of our hero's person, for that we shall refer the reader to the frontispiece prefixed to this work, and proceed to his religion, his morals, his amours, etc., in conformity to the practice of other historians. Let it be remembered, in the first place, to his credit, that he was a dog of the most courtly manners, ready to fetch and carry, at the command of all his masters, without ever considering the service he was employed in, or the person from whom he received his directions. He would fawn likewise with the greatest humility on people who treated him with contempt, and was always particularly officious in his zeal whenever he expected a new collar, or stood candidate for a ribbon with other dogs who made up the retinue of the family. Far be it from us to deny that in the first part of his life he gave himself an unlimited freedom in his amours, and was extravagantly licentious, not to say debauched, in his morals. But whoever considers that he was born in the house of an Italian courtesan, that he made the grand tour with a young gentleman of fortune, and afterwards lived near two years with a lady of quality, will have more reason to wonder that his morals were not entirely corrupted, than that they were a little tainted by the ill effect of such dangerous examples. As to religion, we must ingenuously confess that he had none. 
in which respect he had the honor to bear an exact resemblance to all the well-bred people of the present age who have long since discarded religion as a needless and troublesome invention calculated only to make people wise virtuous and unfashionable and whoever will be at the pains of perusing the lives and actions of the great world will find them in all points conformable to such prodigious principles in politics it is difficult to say whether he was a whig or a tory for so great was his caution that he never was heard on any occasion to open his mouth on these subjects and therefore each of these illustrious clans of men may be allowed to lay claim to him unless perhaps they should both concur as is sometimes the case to despise him for observing a neutrality for the latter part of his life his chief amusement was to sleep before the fire and indolence grew upon him so much as he advanced in age that he seldom cared to be disturbed in his slumbers even to eat his meals his eyes grew dim his limbs failed him his teeth dropped out of his head and at length a physic came very seasonably to relieve him from the pains and calamities of long life thus perished little pompey or pompey the little leaving his descendants